everybody, welcome to the 10 a.m. public portion of the closed litigation session of the April 23rd, 2019 meeting of the City Council. In this part of the meeting, the Council will receive public testimony. Thereafter, Council members will move to the Courtyard Conference Room for our closed session. I would like to ask our clerk to please call the roll. Thank you, Mayor. Council Member is Crone. Here. Glover. Here. Myers. Here. Brown. Here. Matthews. Here. Vice Mayor Cummings. Here. And Mayor Watkins. Here. At this time, are there any members of the community who would like to speak on any of the items listed on closed session? <laughs> Seeing one, we have up two. Okay, we have up to two minutes. Go ahead. And I would request the council give me three minutes because this is I'm the only person speaking and it's about a, the Quintero lawsuit. Uh, could I ask for a council vote on that? Would one council member like to do that? Motion to extend the comment to three minutes. There's a motion by uh, council member Glover. Second. Second by council member Crone. Any further discussion? Call a question. Okay. Uh, all those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? No. No. Okay, that passes with council member Crone, Glover, Brown, Vice Mayor Cummings voting in support. Myers, Matthews, and myself voting against. You have three minutes. Thanks. Okay, uh, today you're going to be reviewing action on the DeZero Quintero lawsuit. This is the Ross Camp lawsuit. I'm also a plaintiff in this lawsuit since I have associational rights to be able to deal with folks at the camp and try to assist them in matters and which will be made much more difficult once this camp is dispersed as I believe is the intention at least of two council members this afternoon. The aim of this lawsuit is to prevent the harm that would come from closing the Ross camp without adequate indoor shelter alternatives. You'll be considering this shortly. Shelter alternatives which you do not have, not even the pretense of outdoor shelter alternatives. Your city attorney's standard operating procedures don't meet constitutional muster and abusively require evictions without adequate shelter. This is actually acknowledged if you read over these operating procedures. People are protected from citations, but they're not protected in terms of having any shelter. So they can just be dumped on the street. Yesterday's back scratching decision at the court declaring the Ross Camp a public nuisance by Judge Burdick authorizes police force against the homeless tomorrow at 4 p.m. It was done without evidence other than assertions by partisan city officials beholden to the city manager for their positions. It will be challenged this morning in federal court over in San Jose. You have a chance to backtrack on this bad situation, both in closed session now and in open session on item 13 later today. Instead of wasting city money on going to court, begin negotiations with the plaintiffs. Work out reasonable arrangements for a cleanup involving the camp residents in place instead of forcing a relocation. It hasn't been authorized. Uh, abandon the charade of the San Lorenzo benchlands as a campground. That has not been authorized here by either your body, nor has it been gone to the public for public notice or input. And in fact, it violates your own prior city council resolutions. Acknowledge honestly you don't have alternate outdoor alternatives now with the depot park gone. Don't use the homeless as an experiment to see how efficient or accountable the staff is. Re-examine the fanciful shelter alternatives by O'Hara and Shul before they are deconstructed publicly in court. Even if their thrice told tales were true, sheltering Ross would displace the large homeless population outside, beyond Ross. As tickets for trespass being in a closed area and public nuisance rise, as the chief has admitted they have, as slippery alternatives to camping ban tickets, you will be held to account in court. Forestall injuries and health and safety to the elderly, sick, and children in these groups. These are now more likely than ever to be documented and made a part of the lawsuit, which will proceed for damages even if the camp is leveled. And there's another paragraph to this, which I'm not sure, do I have another minute or not? You've had your three minutes? Have I had your my three minutes? So please look over the last okay. paragraph. Thank you. All right. Please. We'll go ahead and have three minutes for you as well. Good morning, Mayor Watkins and council members. Uh, I'm Bernie Escalani, uh, president of the Santa Cruz Police Management Association. 
All of you should have received the uh, letter that we're, uh, I'm passing around already electronically yesterday, but I wanted to provide you with a hard copy. The Police Management Association would like to draw your attention to the upcoming labor negotiations we are preparing to enter with the city. Today, we would like to highlight some of the significant issues that are in the letter that we are facing as an association and as an organization as a whole that need to be seriously considered during your conversations. These issues include recruitment, staffing, retention, and incentive to move up through the organization through compensation. All of these issues negatively affect employee morale. Without competitive compensation, recruiting qualified candidates has proven to be a significant challenge. In 2018, the average number of applicants during each hiring cycle was 74. So far today in 2019, the average number of applicants during each hiring cycle is down to 45 applicants. Today we are fielding 64 officers on the street out of a budgeted amount of 94 officers. We are on an emergency schedule. We are working 11 to 12 hours, days and nights at a minimum. We used to train in excess of 80 hours every year, one of the most highly trained organizations in the entire state, which included valuable skills like de-escalation, crisis intervention, and cultural diversity. Now we are able to meet the minimum of 24 hours a year. We've had to suspend intervention and prevention youth programs, Spanish and English, <clears throat> citizen police academies, and our summer teen academy, because we don't have the staff to make these programs run. Retaining the employees we have has proven to be even more difficult. Our staff is leaving at a place at a pace that surpasses our ability to hire. Our compensation does not encourage anyone to stay. There is more incentive to go to a different police organization, retire before maxing out of their years of service time, or go to the private sector. Okay, thank you. And you're welcome to, do you wanna submit the, the comments and we'll take them into closed session with us? Sure. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. We have it's, oh, is this, it's all in the letter? Yeah, that's okay. fine. It was just a summary. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much. Morning, City Council. Uh, Mayor, Vice Mayor, good to see you again. Uh, my name's Carter Jones. You've probably seen me standing back here in most of your council meetings. Um, I have been here for 17 years as I'm now a police supervisor, um, born and raised in Santa Cruz County. Unfortunately, over the last 17 years, we've lost a significant amount of, of officers um, that no longer live in the county. No longer, we have a handful left that live within the city itself, but only about 29% of our officers actually live within the county of Santa Cruz. Most of them commute from over the hill, um, from, from uh, Monterey County. Um, we can't sustain having officers live in the county. You all know it's too expensive. So I sent you each an individualized email earlier this week. Uh, there's a lot of statistics in that, in a lot of the letters that have been coming your way. I'm here to invite you out on a ride along. Not with another officer, with me to come out and show you what progressive, compassionate policing is about in Santa Cruz, because we're different. We're different here than we are anywhere else. Um, so I'm extending that invitation. Um, a few years ago, Drew Glover took me up on that. Um, so I invite you to come out, see what it's like, um, and take that time to really, truly understand what we do here in the city of Santa Cruz and as a police department, because we're losing people. We can't retain the people we have. It's, uh, we're at a critical, really, really, really critical spot. So when we talk about emergencies and crisis within the city, this is an emergency. This is a crisis. Uh, 
I see people stand up here all the time during public comments saying, hey, my bike got stolen, my house got burglarized, my car got broken into. Uh, we don't have the staff to respond and to take the criminals into custody um, that are doing these things. So uh, we need to protect the people that we were hired and sworn to protect. So open invitation, you have my email, you have my phone number. Um, I'd love to hear from each and every one of you. Andrew, I'd love to take you out again. I was about to say, I want to come again, yeah. Right on. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Seeing no uh, further uh, interest in oral communications or public comment, excuse me, we'll go ahead and adjourn the meeting to our courtyard conference room where the council will go into its closed session. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to our 11.30 a.m. session of the April 23rd, 2019 meeting of the City Council. I would like to ask our clerk to please call the roll. Thank you, Mayor. Councilmember Crone? Here. Glover? Here. Myers? Here. Brown? Here. Matthews? Here. Vice Mayor Cummings is currently absent. And Mayor Watkins? Here. At this time, could if the clerk please lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. So now we have the introduction of new employees, and I believe we'll start with our regional manager of libraries, uh, Heather Nordqu Nordquist. Nordquist. I'm sorry if I mispronounced your last name. Please come up and introduce your new employee. It's my pleasure to introduce Julia Bernal. She's a new library assistant too at the Live Oak branch. She started at the end of March. And she has worked for the library for two and a half years as a library aide. 
She was born and raised in Watsonville. She has a degree in sociology from UCLA. And she often gets asked if she's related to Martine Bernal, and she is not. <laughs> We're very Thanks happy to have her. <laughs> Welcome. Thank you very Welcome. much. <laughs> All right. And if we could um, invite up our Public Works Director, uh, Mr. Mark Zettel, to introduce his new employees. Good afternoon. Good morning. Good afternoon, or good morning, Mayor and, and Council. Uh, Mark Dettel, Director of Public Works. On my far right uh, is Chris Jimenez. He's a new solid waste worker. Um, and he was born and raised in Watsonville. Uh, he also grew up in Newark and Fremont, and currently lives back in Watsonville. He has his wife and four kids and seven dogs. Um, has experience uh, in construction with soils engineering. He does also worked with First Alarm as well as in the sales uh, with Macy's and Home Depot and retail. And then also a driver for uh, JW Farms and speed, speed of Light Towing. So he's got a lot of experience. Um, has attended Cabrillo and when he's not working, what he likes to do for fun, anything outdoors, kayaking, biking, fishing, frisbee golf. So uh, please join me in welcoming Chris. Welcome. And, thank you. and next to Chris is uh, our new parking program manager, Brian Borgono. Borgono. Um, Brian um, comes to us from Alaska, actually. Um, he was born in, in New York City and grew up in Metro Detroit. He currently is relocating to Santa Cruz. He currently is temporary, temporary living in Aptos. Um, his, his partner, Kimberly, and his 14-month daughter, Dylan, and they're expecting his son uh, to arrive in August. And they also have a dog named Munchkin, so pretty <laughs> active family going on there. Um, past work experience, Brian's, he most recently worked as the parking director for the Anchorage Community Development Authority in Anchorage, Alaska. And as the parking director, he oversaw both on-street and off-street parking operations similar to what we have in Santa Cruz. He was responsible for over 5,800 parking spaces at 16 locations. Uh, this included all the parking departments consisting of facilities, maintenance, enforcement, customer service, security, administration, IT, and equipment maintenance. So very similar, very relevant, relevant experience. And previously, um, he's worked in parking operations in the city of Ann Arbor, Michigan, Cedar Rapids, Iowa, and also parking consulting services for many communities across the U.S., including Boulder, Colorado, and Portland, Oregon. So we're really happy to have that experience. He has a bachelor's degree in communications and economics from the University of Michigan. And when he's not working, he enjoys spending time outdoors hiking with his family, going to the park with his daughter, and also practicing Brazilian jiu-jitsu and recently received his blue, bet, blue belt uh, promotion uh, prior to departing Alaska. So, and his favorite food is Thai food. So with that, please uh, welcome Brian and welcome Brian to our team, so. Thank you. Welcome to the city. Thank you for the presentations. So at this time, we'll move on to uh, a presentation from our Metro uh, CEO General Manager, uh, Mr. Alex Clifford, please. Thank you, Mayor, Council Members. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for allowing me to make my annual journey to you to present the State of Metro. Thank you also for sending two of your members, Donna Myers and Cynthia Matthews, to our, our board. They do great work. And Cynthia, thank you for dedicating all the time recently to our orientation. I hope we didn't <laughs> overload you with bus stuff. <laughs> we tend to be bus geeks and we like to throw all that information out there. Um, but it's good information. Uh, I'd like to start off uh, with just a couple of st uh, metro stats, if you will, just to bring you up to speed on, on our basic structure. Our operating budget in the current year is about $49 million. We employ about 319 people. Uh, we have 100 fixed route and commuter buses on, <coughs> that operate on 26 routes and 41 paratransit vehicles. Um, we operate under the uh, uh, paracruise uh, logo. And our service population is the entire county, about 264,000. We provide about 5 million fixed route trips. That's a lot of cars taken off the road 
and about 72,000 paratransit trips per year. Um, interesting nugget to always point out is about 50% of our ridership uh, is composed of UCSC students, faculty, and Cabrillo College students. So that's really exciting for us. Um, in the way of how do we fund it all? Well, we fund it through a combination of sources. Uh, our passenger fares uh, cover uh, just under about 20% of the total cost to operate the system. About 46% of the costs are covered by two sales tax measures. One is the 1978 half cent sales tax measure, which the voters approved in perpetuity for Metro to run its operations. And then we get about 16, 16% of the measure D funds uh, to help fund the service. And as you may recall, that assisted us in pulling ourselves out of a major structural deficit back in 2014 and 2015 in which we had about a $6.3 million structural deficit to resolve. So thank you to the voters for Measure D and helping us to get through that. About another 13% is operating funding from the state, including SB1. I'll talk about SB1 in a minute because I know that's something important to you and important to us. And about 8.5% is federal assistance that comes to us from the federal government. About 11% is what we call capital eligible money. It's state and federal money that is sort of fungible, if you will. We could use it for operating, we can use it for capital because of our financial stresses, we use it all in the operating fund. And then just under 2% of the total cost of operating the service is covered by advertising revenues and some leases that we have on property that we own, particularly at Pacific Station. Um, it is also interesting to note that now for the second consecutive year, um, because we have fixed that structural deficit, our board has been able to dedicate $3 million a year towards capital, primarily towards replacing buses. I'll talk about that in a minute. I do want to take this opportunity while I'm before you and before the public to thank the public for, for not passing Proposition 6 in November. Um, as you know, that would have reversed SB1, and SB1 is important to you, it's important to us. Imagine if that had been reversed, how difficult it would be how much more difficult it would be for you to keep up on local streets and roads, uh, likewise for us in operating the bus service. So thank you to the voters for having such confidence in all of us that they, they did not allow Prop 6 to pass. So I want to talk about some things that I call really great things that are happening at Metro here in 2019 and uh, 2020. Um, first, we started today, as we speak, we started today our customer service survey. Um, we haven't had a survey in a very long time, so we started the onboard surveys today. That, we hope, will produce valuable information that will help us to make service changes that the public would like to see, uh, but also valuable information to help us understand how to attract and retain customers. Also, later this year, we'll start a one-year pilot project on Highway 17 in which we'll launch a smartphone application that will allow Highway 17 uh, commuters to, pay, to purchase and pay for their fare uh, using their smartphone. Uh, if that is a success and proves out through a pilot project, we could be back to our board to talk about how to expand that across our system. Of course, as you're probably aware, um, doing things on a smartphone is, is ever-growing and transit too has found new and innovative ways to incorporate smartphones. Um, also, in sort of that vein, if you will, um, thank you to uh, SB1 again, but Metro received a Caltrans State Transportation Improvement Grant last year to fund our first automatic vehicle location system. Now that's exciting for us twofold because one, uh, on, on the Metro business side of the equation, it'll produce just mounds and mounds of data for us to understand how our service functions in real time and how we can tweak that system and make it better. On the customer facing side of the business, that will allow the customer to use a smartphone application and to be able to look up when their bus is coming to that stop. So they can time their arrival at the stop um, based against what the real-time smartphone application is telling them is the arrival of that bus. And if that bus happens to be late, as sometimes happens in this county with all of our congestion, um, they will also see that and they'll be able to stay, uh, stay uh, studying their books uh, for class or stay at work a little bit longer because their bus might be running late and again time their, their arrival at the bus stop so that it arrives so they get there when the bus gets there. 
Um, we're also working to replace buses. Uh, we have about 50% of our fleet, our fleet of 98 buses. 50% of those have exceeded their useful life. As you may or may not be aware, we're still running 1998 diesel buses. We'd like to retire those diesel buses, um, but it's all about funding. And so uh, as a result of the board committing $3 million a year for us to leverage against state and federal grants, uh, we are presenting to the board this Friday a plan that would have us out of that hole, if you will, by 2024. So we would have a fleet that is in state of good repair and we would not have buses that we're operating beyond their useful life. So that is our goal. We present that to the board this Friday. Included in that are four Proterra 100% zero emission buses that we received grant, various grants for. Those are on order, they will be here early next year and, and we, Metro, we, the community, will have our first zero emission buses in operation next year. That is really exciting. We're spending a lot of time designing something that heretofore we've known nothing about, which is how to charge those buses. We're designing our electric infrastructure for our yard. And then we got a chance to put our toe in the water uh, late last year when VTA, uh, Santa Clara VTA over the hill, whom we have a great partnership on Highway 17 with, gave us 10 diesel electric buses for $1 a piece. So that was exciting for us. Uh, allowed us to bring the bus count, replacement bus count down a little bit, but also more importantly, allows our maintenance folks to begin to learn how to maintain electric buses <laughs> because the zero emissions are soon to <coughs> arrive here next year. So thank you to Santa Clara VTA for that. That really helps us out in a big way. And then previously we received a federal grant for three zero emission over the road coaches that we would operate on Highway 17. That's an exciting adventure for us to be able to put over the road coaches on Highway 17 commuter service. That's on hold right now. While we wait for a couple of manufacturers to jump into the market, we hope that they will be producing their first zero emission over the road coaches sometime uh, in the next year to two. And then the, the federal government will allow us to use that grant to buy those. And as you may or may not be aware, California Air Resources Board, what we call CARB, late last year um, adopted a regulation that will make it mandatory that all transit properties across the state of California operate zero emission buses by 2040. For us, under that mandate, that means by 2026, we have to start buying whatever we buy, 25% of those must be zero emission buses. And then for everybody in the state from 2029 forward, 100% of everything we buy must be zero emission buses. So the state of California is serious about zero emission buses and we are doing our part. As a matter of fact, as I told you earlier, we already got a jump on it. Before they even adopted that regulation, we had already received grants in order to buy our first electric buses. Um, and then in sort of closing, I'd like to cover two really wonderful partnerships that uh, we have with the city. One is, as you're, you're well aware, the, the city has approved an EcoPass partnership with Santa Cruz Metro. Uh, our staff's working together. We hope uh, soon, not too far down the line, to be able to launch that. That will be excellent for you because it'll reduce car trips into the downtown. It'll be excellent for us because it'll grow ridership. So we're looking forward to that and putting an effort into joint, joint marketing that and making it a success so that at the end of the pilot project, hopefully we can report to you what a wonderful success it was and maybe we'll be able to continue that partnership. And then finally, uh, just this last week, the Metro Board Capital <coughs> Projects Committee uh, approved a request to the full board this Friday that we begin discussions and negotiations with the city about the potential and possibility of our current uh, Pacific Station Transit Center being uh, redeveloped into a new tarmac and a, and a transit-oriented development project along Pacific Avenue. And so if that's approved by our board this coming Friday, uh, we'll be able to begin neg negotiations and discussions to see if that can become a reality. Um, that concludes my presentation. I'm happy to answer any questions. And thank you again for the annual opportunity. Thank you for being here. I'll go ahead and turn it over to the council to see if there's any questions. Councilmember Crone and then Councilmember Hey, Mr. Clifford, thank you for joining us. Um, just wondering, if, um, UCSC 50%, you said of, of, the, of the Metro budget is dependent <laughs> on the, what UCSC students uh, pay in, in their, their fees at, on campus? Uh, they're 50% of our ridership. 
um, they do not compose 50% of the budget because um, similar to the entire operation, we're roughly 20% subsidized. So they, they come in at sort of what we call our bulk rate, just under 20% uh, uh, of the total cost of operating that, and the rest of it is subsidized by state, federal, and Measure D. Um, so and, if you took the 20% tw uh, of, of fares, of rider fares, um, what, where would UCSC be in that, uh, making up that 20% of the rider fare box capture? Yeah, they're, they're at about, I want to say, somewhere in the range of about $3.5 I think, a year that, that, that those fees cover. And that's a great partnership. Um, we, we are the envy of a number of transit properties across the state. You may be aware that just last year we hosted in Santa Cruz County the APTA Universities Conference in which we shared those partnerships that we have with UCSC and Cabrillo and others are looking at ways to emulate that across the nation. Any chance to ever get a voting member from UCSC on the transit board? We do have, uh, we, we did make a move in a positive direction, that positive direction recently in which we added ex officio member from UCSC. Yeah, I know, I know, but they, they can't Cabrillo. vote though. They can't vote, they're ex officio. Yeah, I'm yeah. saying, do you ever think that, of a, of stu is there a reason why a student couldn't vote on the, we couldn't have that? Yeah, you know, I, I'm not real heavily involved in that. I, I think it would be up to the board to see if they wanted to do that. I think doing so might also require legislative change because of the way that we're created in legislation. Um, the legislation actually reflects uh, the composition of the board and it doesn't include ex officios, but the board is allowed to add ex officios. Thanks, and um, did you ever read City on Hill Press? I do. Did yes. you read the last City on Hill Press where the students spoke out about bus service? I have not seen that. No. You should take when, a look at it. Come out? They're, they're not too happy. Um, they, a lot of them avoid the bus, they said, because um, it's either too crowded or they can't, um, doesn't, it doesn't follow a schedule that they can um, understand. Uh, it's last week's City on a Hill. Okay, I'll go back and I think it comes out on that. Thursday. The last question is, um, when do you have a date for the Eco Pass? Um, when that's gonna be rolled out and wh what's yep. taking time to do that? It's just taking time to figure out a lot of little nuances associated with that. What kind of fair media will be used? How will it be distributed? How do you prevent fraud associated with that? So the, the staffs are trying to work that out before we launch it. We really jointly want it to be 100% success, so we want to get it right on the By launch. summer or? I, I think that's a target that they're shooting for uh, next, next uh, couple of months or so, yeah. Okay. Thanks a lot, I really yeah. appreciate it. And, and if I might, I just want, I don't in any way mean to be argumentative, but I do want to, no, I do okay. want to acknowledge that we appreciate uh, the students' feedback. And as a result of the students providing us feedback about overcrowded buses, uh, we, we entered into a pilot project a couple of years ago with the university to fund uh, this agency's first articulated buses. So with the same bus driver, we achieved double the capacity. That pilot pro project proved out so well that we bought again from Santa Clara VTA, four articulated buses to permanently have on our property. So we're trying to address those issues. We do have some crush loads, particularly in the morning when they're, when they're all coming from the downtown areas and trying to get to campus. Um, we're, we're not turning our back to that issue. We're gonna keep addressing it. We do want the students to be happy and we want them to feel like they're getting value from that fee that they're paying that goes towards the pass. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, Councilmember Glover and then Councilmember Brown. Thank you. Um, so yeah, just to kind of go along with uh, something that Councilman McCrone was just mentioning, the issue of bus availability and bus access. I know that's a big concern with community residents that choose not to take the bus. Even our transportation department says that people choose not to take the bus because of its ineffectiveness and the time that it takes to take the actual bus. Plus we've seen <clears throat> the reduction of bus routes um, for the last couple of years. And then like you mentioned, there was that massive $6 million deficit. So what is, what is the likelihood that we'll see an expansion of bus services? What are the things that are hindering or stopping buses from being able to expand so we actually have an effective bus system here in Santa Cruz? Uh, and do you think that it has to do with, I mean, money is always an issue, but uh, do you feel like the money and the budget is being used as effectively as possible to maximize the availability of bus frequency? 
A lot of good questions there. If I miss any of them, let me know. I think the board has done a fantastic job of working their way through a very difficult situation. Uh, remember, when I came aboard in 2014, we were faced with just one year left of reserves. The previous boards had relied on reserves to bridge the gap and, and deliver the service. And then we were going to be bankrupt. And the board made some tough decisions. And they worked their way through a $6.3 million structural deficit. Now, what that meant is that we had to contract a little bit. So we had to come in. And we had to cut some service on evenings and weekends and whatnot. Um, so we're in a good, stable place. We have a five-year projected stable budget. The board made some hard decisions. And other things happened, like Measure D and SB1. And our, even our bus operators made some concessions. All those things came together to, to work that out. Now, will we, if money finds its way to us, money's always the thing, right? That's, that helps us get there, or it creates difficulty for us. Mm -hmm. So if money finds our, its way to, to us, will we grow the system? We may not. What we, what we know we need to do is take the existing structure and make it more appealing to the customers and potential customers by increasing frequency of service. You know, somebody uh, who's thinking about writing our service is not necessarily attracted to it if the bus only comes every 45 minutes to an hour. I agree, yeah. That's not a good system. Mm -hmm. So we, any resources we get in the coming years, likely we'll propose to the board that we add frequency of service to the existing model. We keep that model the way it is. Now, there are other new and novel things happening. As, as you're probably aware and you've read about, um, transit ridership across the nation is, is being reduced. We're, we're losing riders across the nation. And we need to figure out what that is. And some people say it's Uber. I don't think it's really Uber. Um, some people say it's jump bike kind of things. I don't believe that at all. I think those are complementary to us and they help with that last mile problem. Um, I think we really can attract more riders if we become more valuable to people. Mm -hmm. Frequency of service is one. The other is what you're seeing across the nation is a trend towards on-demand types of services. <laughs> New and novel services that go beyond just the major thoroughfares and fixed routes that we operate on. Uh, and we're, we're today studying that type of a concept, and we might within the next six months propose something to the board. If we can flesh it out a little bit and, and figure out how financially it can be viable, we might have a pilot project on, on, on demand. Again, with the target of trying to ex address exactly what you're saying, how do we attract and retain people in a very difficult environment in which needs and desires are shifting for mm -hmm. transit? Thank you for that. That's a lot of great information. And then if you, I mean, I know you don't have a budget in front of you right now, but if you had to say an amount of money that would allow you to reach that level of increased frequency so that it could become more attractive for riders, if you had to ballpark it, how much would the Metro need? Ooh, tough question. Wish I had a day or two to study that one. <laughs> Just ballpark. Uh, it's okay. You know, it would be easy for me to say to double our budget. That would be a phenomenal amount. Of, and you have of a current operating budget of how much now? Forty-nine million. Forty-nine million. Okay. Um, you know, if if we could strategically um, even take a quarter of what we spend a day, an additional quarter of that, we could do some really good things. There, there's routes again that operate on hundred uh, or on one-hour frequency. You know, that's borderline. Why are you even running the route when it's on one-hour right. frequency? Thank those, you. Those need to be changed. Councilmember Brown, did you have a question? Mm -hmm. um, thank you for the, the overview, and um, it's good to hear that uh, the snapshot was, uh, represents or reflects a, a stabilized picture for Metro. Um, I absolutely understand that, you know, kind of any expansion of services and kind of at getting at some of these questions related to ridership um, re will require expansion of resources. And so I'm not going to ask you about that right now. But since we have you here, I have two questions. One is kind of a bigger picture question. What's your outlook um, with respect to ex potential expansion of paratransit services? I know those are really critical to <coughs> some of the most marginalized people in our community. Um, and um, so I'd be, I'd be interested in hearing a little bit more about that. And then two, which is kind of very different question. Um, can you tell us why bus benches have been disappearing at bus stops? Absolutely. You can handle both of those. So uh, in the area of the, uh, the paratransit service, we're not likely to put a lot of effort into figuring out how to expand that. Under federal law, we have to provide what's called complementary service. Now, that's not free service. That means complementary in the sense that wherever the fixed route bus runs, 
we have to provide complementary service. We have to provide service to paratransit qualified individuals within three quarter mile either side of that fixed route. So for now and into the indefinite future, we'll continue to work under that federally mandated model. Um, the other thing that we really want to continue to put effort into is to attract people who have a choice. They qualify for paratransit, but they can also ride fixed route to track them off of the paratransit onto the fixed route. Um, here's why we want to do that. <coughs> paratransit is a very expensive operation. It's $60 per trip for us to run. In contrast, somebody riding on a bus is about $10 per trip. So we really want to attract them. Now, here's the other reason why they probably want to do that is today your trip on paratransit could be about $6 if it's the equivalent of two or more bus buses. Um, if you ride fixed route, you get it for half of the base fare. You get it for a dollar. So a dollar versus six dollars, we'd rather get them onto the fixed route. And that's an area of weakness for us. We have to, we have to figure out how to dedicate some of our personnel resources to helping people understand where maybe they don't understand how to ride a fixed route bus and attract them off of a door-to-door -door service onto that fixed route. So moving on to the bus benches. So I know there was a, uh, an article and a series of uh, media coverages on that. Uh, I wanna assure you that we're not going through wholesale removal of bunch bus benches across this county. That's just not happening. We're very surgical and very strategic about what we've done. And in fact, over the last two years, as a result of that, we've re re removed only six bus benches across the county. Uh, we hope that if the problem, the, re the reason why we had to remove those is resolved, that we'll be able to go back and put those in, but we may not necessarily put in a bus we, bench, we may put in what we call a semi-seat. And a semi-seat is a pole with two seats that somebody can sit on, you've seen those around the community. We may put in lean bars, that you'll see those up in San Francisco in some of the bus shelters where people can lean and take a little bit of load off as opposed to sit down. It's just another strategy to look at. Um, here's what the problem is. We, we've had some folks that, that moved into some of these bus shelters and have established residency there. That is not good for our customers and our customers complain. It's not good for my employees, the facilities maintenance folks who have to clean those bus stops and they have to go out on a regular basis and deal with urine and feces and hypodermic needles. That's just not acceptable. And for our customers having to deal with the same thing that is also not acceptable. We're in the business of providing quality, safe transit um, to our customers who choose to ride our system. And I need to deliver them a good, safe bus stop. And some folks have said, well, your customers suffer because you took that bench away. Guess what? Our customers couldn't sit on that bench because we had somebody living there uh, the entire time. I'll tell you a short story. One of my employees boarding a stop at Dominican um, couldn't sit at the bus bench because there was a person laying there sleeping there. Um, as she waited for the bus, the individual rolled over, unzipped himself, and urinated, and then rolled back over. Right in front of her, right in front of the public, just took over the stop, soiled the stop. That's just not acceptable. Doesn't matter if it's my employee or not. It's not acceptable. People deserve a clean stop, and that's what I plan to deliver to them. Um, this whole issue of, of why people are living in a, in a bus shelter or a bus stop on a bus bench, um, that's not the business that I'm in. I realize there is a bigger social issue here, and I'm empathetic to that. I, I, I truly am. And you're dealing with it, and I think you're dealing with it today. Uh, and God bless you. You have some challenges ahead of you. Uh, but that's not the business I'm in. I'm in the business of delivering quality service to individuals who oftentimes are the poorest of the poor, and we are their only way to get to work and to get to their doctor's appointments. And it's not acceptable when somebody calls me and says, you know, that stop nearest my home, I can't use, and I'm not gonna stand 10 feet away from that stop waiting for a bus on a rainy day or a really hot day, so I'll find another way to get to work. That's not the way we want to do our business. Well, thank you for being thank here you for the and opportunity. for the presentation. A last comment here, uh, Councilman. I'm gonna throw you a softball. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Is Metro hiring? Metro is hiring, thank you for that softball. Um, I had to send out an apology letter to, uh, yesterday to our riders because over the last two weeks, we didn't have enough bus drivers to deliver all the service we promised. And the one thing that we're in the business of is delivering quality on-time service. We produce a timetable that says what time your bus is gonna be there. 
it hurts us all to not have enough bus drivers and have to cancel service. And a, and a bus that runs on one hour headway now has a two hour headway. <laughs> That's just not acceptable. And so we're, we're, we're gonna work hard to hire more people. We just launched a recruitment for bus operators. If you're watching, if you wanna be a bus operator, please go to our website. Thank you for the softball. Mm -hmm. Thank you, and I'm sure if you uh, have any council members here that wanna reach out, we can have uh, that line of communication open as well for additional questions at a future time. I would time. encourage it. We, we have a great relationship, and, and I know there's some newer council members here. Love to meet with you if you'd like to. Great, thank you very much. Thank you for being here. Thank you again. Okay. So now we'll go ahead and move on to our master recycling program. And uh, we will have Leslie O'Malley come up. So I'll just briefly introduce the program. In February of 2018, the city of Santa Cruz launched its inaugural annual master Recycle, recycler volunteer training program. The new free of charge program is a response to the record number of attendees at recycling center tours who've expressed interest in helping to mitigate the largest Santa Cruz and nationwide recycling problem of contamination. The Master Recycler Volunteer Training Program follows successful templates created by the City of Burbank and municipalities in Oregon, Colorado, and Ohio. Throughout six Tuesday evening sessions, participants receive hands-on training from City of Santa Cruz resource recovery staff and other local waste professionals and experts. Class topics include waste prevention, recycling processes in markets, zero waste concepts, extender, extended producer responsibility, household hazardous waste, repairing and repurposing items, and green consumer tips. And two Saturday morning field trips provide a behind the scenes look at sorted and balled recycl recyclable material, large and small scale composting systems and electronic waste management. We welcome the new City of Santa Cruz Master Recycler Volunteer Class of 2019, which I believe is 26 members in the community who've received and completed this seven week uh, training and now embark on their 20 hours of volunteer service to achieve the level of certi certified master recycler. Finally, we would like to recognize 10 communi community members from the inaugural class of 2018 who have fulfilled their volunteer commitment and now have become recognized as certified master recyclers. So community champions who have proven their ability to educate and empower friends, neighbors, schools, businesses, local groups, and special events to waste less and recycle right. So thank you for being here, Leslie, and congratulations to all of our volunteers. Did you wanna say a few words? Um, Thank you for the support that the city and the council has provided over the last two years. It's proven to be a really successful model and um, I think we're seeing a difference out there. So we have some certificates here. Mm -hmm. yeah. Great, there's some people, <clears throat> there are a few people who were not able to attend today and we'd like to recognize their contributions. Alyssa Barnes, John Boast, Rachel McKay, and Jonah Pace. And now, will the following people please step forward to be recognized and accept your certificate? John Benito. Is John here? No. Henry Carter. <laughs> Kaylee Connolly Soon. Terry Grove. <laughs> Michelle Replogel. <laughs> and Glenn Smith. She's gonna take a quick picture. Thank you. 
Our Dean, quick comment, please. I'd just like to say I have a couple of friends that recently went through this. They were devoted recyclers before and they are positively evangelical. <laughs> Good work. <laughs> it's a great program. So yeah, Thank thanks you. to Leslie and to Public Works. Absolutely. You're here. Thank you. Okay. So at this time, I just have one um, other mention I'd like to add, which is that we won't be presenting um, today a mayor's procl proclamation in support of the May 4th Wildfire Community Preparedness Day. Um, but I wanted to mention that uh, it will be taking place on May 4th. And Wildfire Community Preparedness Day is a national campaign that encourages people to come together on a single day to take action to reduce their risk, risk of wildfire. And I think we know now more than ever that is incredibly important and a proclamation will be forthcoming. We haven't, we haven't been able to get that together for this meeting today. Um, so we'll go ahead and move along to our uh, few announcements. So a few announcements before we head on to our regular meeting. I wanna let you know that today's meeting is being broadcast live on community television channel 25 and is streaming on the city's website at cityofsantacruz.com. Mike Oliphant is our technician for both this afternoon and evening sessions, and morning, actually, <laughs> and I would like to thank him for his work. All city council members can be emailed at citycouncil at cityofsantacruz.com. If you would like to communicate with us before it or about any agenda item, we'd like to receive your email by Monday at 5 p.m. before our council meeting. This provides us an opportunity to review your email and include it with the rest of our agenda packet. Please do bear in mind that all items of correspondence with the city and city council constitute a public record and are generally subject to disclosure upon request by any member of the public. Accordingly, if you have sensitive or private information that you do not wish to be made public, you should not include that information in your correspondence. Our rules of decorum are on the window ledge to my left. It is my job to keep our meeting running without disruption, and I ask that you respect your fellow citizens when you are inside and outside of the chambers. And I'll just remind those in attendance and uh, watching, we have a framework that we use, which is uh, to treat each other and, um, and engage in interactions that are to be respectful and open and honest communication, honest and truthful, to address difficult issues, to find areas of common ground, to be open to different perspectives, to give the benefit of the doubt, role model good leadership, and be considerate of each other's time. And it's the job of the mayor to ensure that takes place on this side of the dais as well there, so everyone can participate in our local government uh, and, uh, and, and engage in a meeting that is without disruption. So at this point, I'll go ahead and move on to see if we have any statements of disqualification. So I'd like to ask if any council members have any statements of disqualification today. Seeing none with Vice Mayor Cummings. Um, Here. Any statements of disqualification <laughs> today? No. Okay. I will go ahead and ask our city clerk to announce if there are any additions or deletions to today's agenda. There are not. I'll make a brief announcement about oral communications. Oral communications is an opportunity for members of the community to speak to us on items that are not on the agenda. Oral communications will occur at or around 7 p.m. I'll go ahead and turn it over to our city attorney to report on our closed session. Thank you, Mayor Watkins, members of the city council. Uh, items discussed this morning in closed session are as follows. Um, liability claims, item A, the claims of Joyce Fenn, Sander Midor, Sunset Farms, Inc., and Robert and M. Redonian Company, and the claim of Moss Caleb Caballero. Those uh, claims are also item seven on your consent calendar this afternoon. There was a conference with labor negotiators involving uh, mid managers OE3, supervisors OE3, fire management, Fire IAFF, Police Management, Police Officers Association, and Executives. The city met with its negotiator and gave instructions 
um, no uh, reportable action was taken. It was a conference with legal counsel in, <clears throat> on existing litigation. Item C was a case of Desiree Quintero et al. versus the city of Santa Cruz, a case pending in the U.S. District Court. Um, and lastly, there was one item of anticipated litigation. There was no reportable action on those two items. Thank you, City Attorney Condotti. Okay, we'll go ahead and now move um, over onto our opportunity for council members to report on any actions um, or any updates from membership on external boards, committees, and joint powers authorities. I'll go ahead and start to um, my right, Councilmember Crone, and then we'll make our way this way. And then we'll move from uh, Councilmember Brown into myself. So Councilmember Crone. Thank you, Mayor. I have a report back on the uh, uh, community advisory group that um, is made up of, I think, about 22 elected and community members and working with UCSC, uh, advising UCSC uh, on its um, long range development plan process for 2020. Um, and I would like to offer this update. Uh, as the process moves forward in the, in the, in the current um, LRDP, uh, that the position of 20 plus members of the community advisory group is virtually unanimous. The group strongly opposes any plan for for the UCSC growth at this time until the community of Santa Cruz has acceptably absorbed UCSC's last round of growth. Uh, and this sentiment has been expressed on more than one occasion by the, the community advisory group members to both Chancellor Blumenthal and his staff at these numerous meetings. Uh, opposing university growth also carries the message expressed by the electorate when uh, Measure U was passed by an almost 80% of voters in 2016. I'm gonna pass out this um, really unprecedented uh, action on the part of this group yesterday vis-a-vis -vis the university. Uh, there was a vote taken, it was unanimous, and I just wanna point out a couple of, uh, of, of issues here, and I, I hope that uh, Councilmember Matthews, who, who um, uh, shares that committee also with, uh, for the re council representation with me, um, it was, uh, you know, a pretty cordial conversation. And if you look at number three, the last uh, sentence, um, ideally prior to that growth occurring, and the local campus will not support additional enrollment growth when the needed infrastructure is not provided. Uh, the other one I wanna point out is um, number six on the back. Our planning director was part of this group as well. And the the trip level 10% or more, I think Lee was responsible for that or more, and I, I was uh, fully supportive of that. I thought it should have been higher than 10% as well, and I'm glad that he got that language put in there. And number seven, um, which was a, a quite a, a discussion amongst members of this uh, group, and you can see at the bottom who, who makes up this group where the asterisk is, um, fully mitigating adverse off-campus impacts of university growth authorized by the LRDP and recognizing the profound effects of this growth on the almost fully built out Santa Cruz community is a critical outcome of the LRDP process. So in principle right now, they're gonna take this statement up the, uh, up, up the ranks, uh, but there was a unanimous support of the, of the members of the committee that were there yesterday. Uh, I believe there was about, I don't know, 15 or so of us present. And um, it was a good conversation. And, it, and I think that uh, we're gonna see a change at the top at the university. George Blumenthal is moving on. Uh, they kept referring to the new chancellor that which will not be unveiled until May, uh, in the middle of May, I guess, at the Regents meeting. We'll know who the new chancellor of the University of California at Santa Cruz is. So uh, the, the, the group feels good about moving forward in this with this, um, this draft of principles. And it was, um, originated by the university. So there were some changes made by the group and um, uh, hopefully we will move forward harmoniously and that development will not take place in Santa Cruz without resources appearing. And in fact, we would like to see backfill some resources that haven't been here for a while and they keep sending students. So um, thank you, Mayor. I don't know if um, Ms. Matthews, uh, Councilmember Matthews wants to add something. Thank you, Councilmember Cohen. Did you want to add it this Very time? briefly. Um, uh, this uh, statement was a massaging of uh, a draft that was uh, previously pre presented to the group and it's intended to be a statement that reflects shared principles by both the Santa Cruz campus and 
the community advisory groups. And uh, we're, we came remarkably close, and they did uh, emphasize that with the announcement of uh, a new chancellor in the near future, there will be some onboarding time and some ramp up, and that will uh, necessarily slow down the LRDP process. Um, but uh, there was a very uh, close agreement on the principles that you see here. And from the university's point of view, it was just as much driven by the student experience as from the community's point of view, it's driven by impact. So um, remarkable progress. Great job. Thank you for that. Dan. Sorry for that long report, but it was, a, it was, no, was a kind of a remarkable meeting. Thank you for sharing. Yeah. Is there any other um, updates you'd like to share at this end, Council Member? Okay, Council Member Glover. Uh, no updates from the Community Safety Committees, the Integrated Waste Management Committee, or the Youth Violence Prevention Task Force Steering Committee. Councilmember Myers. Just a brief, uh, the Cal Working Group is scheduled to meet next week, uh, so I don't have any other reports. I did attend, um, as mentioned by uh, Mr. Uh, Clifford, that uh, the, um, the onboarding for, as a board, new board member for the Metro and got a, a half day orientation, so that was very helpful to uh, understand, uh, especially our Pacific Station goals. Um, in, in cooperation with Metro. That's my report. Thank you, Councilmember Myers. Councilmember Brown. So of the various interagency commissions and boards I'm on, I only have one report um, from the Area Agency on Aging, and I'll be brief. Uh, May is Older Americans Month, so um, look forward to uh, a proclamation or declaration from the city. I'll be working with the mayor to make just FYI to um, bring that back in at a May meeting. And we also uh, looked at so some of the other things that the um, the agent area agency on aging is working on right now, which I think are going to actually be very beneficial to the seniors in our community and the broader community. Um, uh, revisions to uh, some surveys that go out into the community to kind of get a better handle on what services are needed. Again, I've mentioned before age-friendly um, cities, and so some of those things are, are in the works, and I want to um, invite others to be involved in the process, so I'll, I'll bring more information back when we declare it Older Americans Month in May. Look forward to seeing that. Councilmember Matthews. Yes, we just heard from um, the Metro Director, Alex Clifford. He mentioned Pacific Station, but um, I do serve on the Metro's Capital Committee, and we had a really um, productive uh, committee meeting this week. Our Economic Development Director, um, Bonnie Lipscomb, was there, Claire Fleisler from Transportation Planning, and we are, uh, as uh, you may remember the city has co-funded with Metro a couple of studies that help inform our discussion about whether it is possible to do um, a combined collaborative um, Pacific Station project. It's an idea that's been in the works for easily a decade, if not more, uh, ran into uh, delays due to the uh, uh, very severe economic crisis the Metro was in, but um, that has uh, definitely stabilized, as you heard, and there's particularly the opportunity to do some e exciting projects that bring um, at that site with a realignment, affordable housing uh, location for two of our well-respected community cl clinics uh, with state uh, money uh, available for affordable housing connected to transit and services. Um, it seems as though the stars are genuinely aligning on this. It's encouraging. And so we will be bringing our recommendation to uh, actively pursue that possibility at our meeting on Friday. It's um, a realization of a long held goal. <laughs> so I just want you all to know that's uh, I'm, I'm feeling progress on that. Um, just very briefly, at Vision Santa Cruz, every, sig every single meeting we get examples of the uh, coverage that's been given to Santa Cruz County in media, um, print, uh, uh, online media, of uh, all different sorts, and um, that gets passed around to board members. And it's it's really impressive. Part of what Vision Santa Cruz does is not just to provide visitor services for those who are here, but a promotion of Santa Cruz County to a wide variety of interests and constituencies. And so I just brought one magazine uh, out of, we probably get a half a dozen examples at every meeting, but just to show you. <laughs> I saw it. It's, it yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> um, just one example among many. Thank you, Councilmember Matthews. Okay, Vice Mayor Cummings. 
uh, <coughs> the um, Association of Monterey Bay Area Governments, neither myself nor uh, alternate Chris Cron can make that meeting, uh, the last meeting, so there's nothing to report back on that. Um, the LAFCO meeting was postponed until the first week of May, so there's nothing to report back on that. Um, from the homeless two by two committee meeting, um, we met and at the last meeting, uh, there was concern from the county with the timing of when the gateway encampment was gonna close, given the fact that there's been um, varied opinions on the closure date and we've pushed that um, due to concerns around being able to have alternatives open in time. And um, the one concern that came out was that if we weren't gonna open it uh, within a timely manner that um, it wouldn't be effective to open it given the fact that the the site at 1220 is gonna to have to close at the end of June. And so that was mainly what was discussed at that meeting. And the only other um, sort of report back I have is on behalf, I think, of Councilmember Brown and Vice Mayor Cummings and myself, we had a city schools city committee Cummings. meeting yesterday and um, topics covered the Cannabis Children's Fund, um, work with their uh, efforts around uh, workforce housing, some efforts for uh, potential moving forward in terms of really looking at how we can um, have an opportunity to sort of pause and reflect and plan as a committee uh, moving forward in terms of our policy alignment and support for one another, as well as some potential um, ideas and innovations that we could look at from other jurisdictions in terms of shared agreements around use in space. So lots of uh, things uh, happening there and a great meeting, I would say, and uh, it was nice to finally make that happen. Um, so I think that about covers all of the external report backs. Council Member Crone. Just a, um, I wanted to mention what a great promo it was. I was, um, I usually read my New Yorker magazine on Fridays um, when I get home at the end of the week. And, uh, Santa Cruz appeared twice in a movie review uh, for the Us movie, and I just thought, you know, you can't you can't pay for that kind of, uh, you know, advertising or, or, or promotion. So I just thought it was a wonderful. And they didn't say Santa Cruz, California. They said Santa Cruz, like everybody knows where that is. <laughs> it was really interesting. Thanks for bringing that up. Thank you, Marty. Okay. I'd like to make a brief comment. Um, it came up at Visit Santa Cruz when the movie first came out. There was this um, buzz online for about one day. You know, it's scaring people away from Santa Cruz. And the word we got was that attendance went up. So, FYI, <laughs> it's actually drawing more people than that. Okay. Thank you. Okay, thank you for your work um, out in the community on behalf of our city council. <laughs> so we'll go ahead and move on uh, to our city manager report, which I understand is um, not necessarily happening today. Yes, I don't have a report. Okay. Thank you. So that takes us to our consent agenda. And uh, so first up is the consent agenda, and these are items four through 12 on our agenda. All items will be acted upon in one motion unless an item is pulled by a council member for further discussion. Are there any council members who wish to pull a item? Council Member Glover. Item 10, please. Any other council members wishing to pull an item? Okay, seeing none. Um, if there are any members of the public that would like to uh, acknowledge or request an item be pulled, you're welcome to do so. Or, or speak on an item. Or speak on an item. We, oh, I'm sorry, yes. Or speak to any item on our consent agenda with the exception of items by council members already polled, which is item number 10. So now would be the time to do so and you would have up to two minutes. So this is in every item on our consent agenda other than item 10. And that's items four through 12. Thank you. Okay. I just want to reiterate that I am willing to pull items upon request from uh, members of the, um, the public. Doesn't seem like that's an issue today, so. So we'll go ahead and return back to council. Um, if there is a motion to move the consent agenda. So moved. Make the, oh, second. <laughs> okay, motion by council member Glover, seconded by council member Matthews. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? That passes unanimously. Councilmember Matthews. And I would like to just speak to item six, uh, which is the city of Santa Cruz weighing in on what Thank seems you. like arcane mm -hmm. inside baseball regarding federal regulations on offshore oil drilling, but this is uh, taking a stand that the city opposes any weakening of the state's ability to comment um, on proposed federal changes. Uh, it represents part of a 30 plus 40 year 
uh, record of activism protecting our coast. So. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you all. And thank you, Council Members, for bringing that item forward. Council Member Crown. Yeah, I, I just wanted to reiterate that and I really appreciate um, Vice Mayor Cummings and uh, Council Member Myers and Council Member Matthews. This is super important. It's, it's, a, it's a beautiful thing when we, I think we have like 110% unanimity up here uh, on, on this issue and protecting our uh, offshore um, resources. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Agreed. Okay, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? that passes unanimously. So we'll go ahead and move on to our polled item, which is item number 10 on our consent agenda. And Council Member Glover. Yes, uh, so just so people know what consent agenda item 10 is, it is the Landfill East Perimeter Road Extension Project. And I was just curious, because I noticed in the, hello, um, I noticed in the report it says that we can wait for up to three to four years before the need, the need to use that additional cell 3B, because um, there's a uh, ticket value there, about $600,000, which uh, would come from the capital investment program. But during our budget hearings with the Public Works Department, there was a concern about uh, <coughs> facilities or capital projects that have been deferred or were in need of focus. So with the possibility of uh, this pro project taking place next year or even the year after that based off of the estimations. Just wondering uh, from the Public Works Department why it's being prioritized right now and uh, if it is in fact possible for us to delay that. Oh, hey. uh, good afternoon, Mayor Watkins and members of the council. Um, I'm Hoi Yu, I'm the engineer for this project. Um, so the reason why we wanted to do this project is because um, for, for a long time for cell development, uh, we do a lot in-house excavation and that has helped us reduce the cost of um, having a contractor come in to excavate because we need these um, the soil for our daily cover and just you know normal use. And that's the reason why we wanted to jumpstart on this project. And because we also wanted to um, because there's so much soil that we have to move about 420,000 cubic yards. If um, we can um, get rid of 75,000 cubic yards, which this project will excavate, then we can figure out where to stockpile it and have it um, put in a place where we can either, you know, um, expand a deck for some other operations or, um, you know, we can also use it for, again, our daily cover. So that is the reason why, because we want to make sure that we have a boundary for in-house excavation and we can um, expand some of the deck area that we sorely need at the landfill. Uh, just addressing your question, this is an enterprise fund, so it really can't be used for the general fund uh, capital improvement. It's really only limited to enterprise, so. Um, and to, with that enterprise, though, that can also do be anything within like waste management and refuse disposal. It right? is a refuse, that's correct. Yeah. Right, uh, but my, my, my question was, because um, I noticed that in the presentation that there were other capital needs to be done, um, potentially in uh, waste management or other kinds of facility improvements, maybe the recycling systems, maybe other kinds of stuff like that that could be invested in as opposed to. Yeah, I think those are all fully funded by the rate study, so there really isn't an issue with um, unfunded capital at that point. Those are all funded by rate. So it's all planned out. Um, this is the appropriate use of the funds at this time. Yeah, the deferred maintenance uh, is around the general fund capital needs, not the, the solid waste program. Okay. Okay, okay Council Member Crown. Another question for um, uh, Director Dettel. Um, we heard from Bob Nelson last, last week about the, the crisis really in recycling. And I'm just wondering, uh, if push, putting forward this particular project at this particular time, are we feeling pressure that we have to landfill more garbage because uh, the recycling system is breaking down so so badly? Um, I wouldn't say the that. The markets for it, the people aren't, but the markets where oh, is Oh, I wouldn't say that. I think this is a planned um, expansion as we, we originally are into cell three, we divided that cell into two, two phases. This is the second phase. It's just scheduled, um, preparation so that when we're ready to fill that cell, the cell will be ready. Um, there, There is obviously pressure on getting rid of the, the uh, recycling and we're working on making sure everyone understands how to clean their recycling when they, when they place it in their bin. Um, so there's added attention on what can we do to make sure we have a clean product that when, it, when there's competition for that market, 
um, that we have a product that people want to buy. So yes, um, that is a, a global competition that we're there, but it doesn't really affect this project. This project is scheduled in so that we're ready for the amount of revenue. So, Are we under any legal requirement to, to do this right now? Um, I wouldn't say it's a legal requirement. It just makes smart uh, planning so that we're ready to go when we have the, the place to put the refuse when we need it. And the, the first discards will be entering that landfill cell three or four years from now? Uh, is, this, is the most, schedule? Yeah, most likely, but I think it's the, there's so much excavation and material that we need to prepare for that. We, we can do it with in-house and um, save the contracting costs. Thank you. Councilmember Matthews. There are no further questions. Um, I appreciate the explanation there. It um, both stages the work appropriately. We can use the fill for cover um, and, and save us money in operations long term. So I'm going to go ahead and move the uh, item number 10. I'll second it. So we have a motion by Councilmember Matthews, seconded by Councilmember Myers. Um, is there any member of the public who would like to address the council on this item? Seeing them, we'll go ahead and return back to uh, council for any um, action and deliberation. So, um, any further discussion? All right. Council Member Governor, and then Vice, did you have? I'm sorry. No, okay, sure. Council. Yeah, I was just wondering what the downside would be if we waited until May during the budget conversations to identify exactly what other projects because one of the things that we're dealing with especially in California in general we heard from the metro is the tra intentional transition over into more electric based service materials uh, vehicles so I don't know if there's been any research by the Public Works Department into electric refuse vehicles or things like that to cut down on carbon emissions but if that's a potential purchase outside of a uh, additional road which we can not have for a couple of years and start replacing our fleet as a potentiality, I'd love to explore that option instead of making a decision now uh, so far ahead of the game. So that's the reason why I brought it up and uh, why I think that it would be valuable for us to take that time to do the research. But uh, Director Dedel, have there, has there been any research in uh, fleet transitioning from diesel uh, fuels? We are, we are watching that closely. Um, I would say they're probably a couple years away till production. Mm, okay. Um, but we are watching that and that, that will be our next move is towards electric refuse trucks. Okay, thanks. No, it's not a substitute. Okay. That's a question. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? That passes unanimously. Okay, so that concludes all items on our consent agenda. Go ahead and move forward to uh, general business item number 13 on our agenda. Mayor, point of order, if just for the record, I would like to state that um, you know, given the interest in this item in this community and the, um, you know, we, this is an, a reasonable number of people here, there would probably be double or triple if this was an evening agenda item. Tonight we're speaking, we're talking about, you know, our budget, which is, is a great thing to be talking about, but there would be less uh, interest in the general public when we're talking about the economic development and planning budgets. And I just want to state for the record that I think that we should be agendizing items such as number 13, the gateway encampment closure, at a time when uh, the most number of people who would be interested in that item could come to the meeting. Thank you. Move to postpone. Oh, uh, you can, we, okay. Okay. So, um, uh, okay. Uh, okay, I'm going to go ahead and make a brief statement and we'll go ahead and move on to the item. This is an item that's brought forward by Vice Mayor Cummings and myself. Um, in terms of response to having the ag agenda set the way it is, I just want to briefly um, kind of bring the community and the council um, in context of the amount of time our council has heard this item. Um, so on February 12th, we had a item related to homelessness and we had a four hour uh, time slot allotted to that item at that time. On February 26th, we also heard the item return to us with five hours spent on that item. On March 12th, again, hearing an item on homelessness and another five hours were heard at that time. March 26th, we had an hour of oral communications. Majority of the community was there to speak about the uh, topic of homelessness. 
And then just last meeting on April 9th, we spent six hours and 40 minutes on this topic. Uh, the city uh, council meets twice a month and we have a number of responsibilities to oversee and uh, administer uh, governance in our city. And so at a certain uh, point, we have to uh, also balance that when considering the agenda. And, um, and I though, although I do just mention the hours we've had um, spent at uh, discussing this item, uh, this has also really consumed our city manager's office and other divisions as well for the past several months. Um, this is a very specific action being proposed by the vice mayor and myself. Um, and in the interest of uh, being able to conduct uh, city business and uh, a number of items on our agenda, I uh, decided to agendize it at this time and, um, and uh, feel that was the right decision. So um, at this point, I will go ahead and let uh, Vice Mayor or say a few words. I had a hand from uh, uh, First Council Member uh, Myers indicated that she wanted to speak and then I'll turn it over to Vice Mayor as the co-signer of the item. And then if there's a comment by uh, Council Member Glover. Council Member Myers. Yeah, I just, uh, I, I'm ready to move uh, on this item and uh, would like to put a motion out uh, following uh, when we're when we're ready. Okay, after the Vice, uh, vice Mayor. Okay, public comment. Okay, thank you. Okay, Vice Mayor Cummings. This has been, <clears throat> an item that's received a lot of attention and I've been receiving a lot of feedback from members of the community. Um, additionally, as we've been working with uh, the county supervisors, we've been trying to figure out a way that we can move forward um, to best um, accommodate people within our homeless community and um, also uh, provide added support to the people within our community. Um, Given the fact that we've been presented with the Boise decision this year, which is something different from what we've had in the past, uh, it's been a bit difficult for members of the uh, city council to understand how to best move forward with um, trying to mitigate some of the impacts that we've been seeing at the camp and also provide shelter to the people in our community who are facing homelessness. Um, I brought this forward um, with the intention of hoping that we can find alternative solutions to all of the people who are sleeping at the camp. Um, and I've received, I've been in many conversations with people on staff and members of the community. And I think I share a bit of skepticism moving into today's meeting around whether or not we're gonna have enough shelter, um, but really wanna have this as an opportunity for us to ask questions of the staff and hear from the community because I think that um, there's a lot of concern with how the city is moving forward, especially given the fact that we were not supposed to be opening up camps and parks, and now there's been a proposal to open up a, train, a temporary camp in the Benchland. So I think this is a good time to hear from the community and to ask questions as we move forward. And then just for um, clarification for the point of order, um, the point of order uh, is uh, to uh, provide an opportunity if there is a violation, and I don't rule that there was a violation, that the mayor has the, uh, the responsibility to design the agenda, and the point of order was that it was not in um, compliance with that process, so I wouldn't rule that that was compliant. Is that correct, City Attorney Kandati? A point of order is to point out a mistake uh, procedurally or in the application of the rules um, <clears throat> or in an action that the council has taken. So um, that is correct. Great. Okay, thank you. Uh, council Member Glover. Thank you. So just because it came up with the issue of the meeting time today, I appreciate the uh, what I heard, which I appreciate what I heard, was the 30 hours that we've spent approximately since February discussing the issue of homelessness. Uh, and that the reason that it was agendized in the afternoon was to be able to talk about other issues. But what was concerning about that statement was that it sounded to me, or it seemed like it was being inferred, that it was scheduled earlier in the day intentionally to make it so that people can participate, which would then shorten the time of the meeting. So that really concerns me if we're scheduling things intentionally during the middle of the day so that we have a shorter meeting uh, and have less people have the opportunity to participate. I think that's dangerously undemocratic. And then at the same time, it was wonderful to hear uh, Vice Mayor Cummings right now say that this is a great opportunity to 
discuss and hear from the community, but unfortunately, the community isn't able to be here because of work or school. And something else that I noticed um, is that this, if you look at the flyers that were distributed by our staff, it says that the removal or the vacating of the Ross Camp as per the notices posted over Easter weekend would start today as of 10 a.m. So you have people that are making the decision now cognitively, are they going to stay and protect their things, especially during an ex parte action that we took yesterday, which sent ripples of fear through the camp already, and then making them choose between whether they're gonna protect their things or come here to speak in defense of their ability to stay where they're at and the protection of their constitutional rights. There's so much that is wrong with the scheduling of this, especially because it was scheduled with budget presentations in the evening, as Councilmember Crone mentioned, which are completely possible for us to do right now, even if we scheduled them before this hearing of this item into the afternoon, then we could have uh, at least provided the opportunity for more people to come and participate. So this is a really troubling pattern that I've seen with regards to the scheduling and the building of the agendas, and I am just going to go on the record and say that I feel like it's inappropriate to be scheduling such an important issue uh, so far uh, down in the agenda, uh, just in general. Uh, I don't know. I, I understand it's legal, I understand it's against, uh, around, around the protocols, but uh, it, it's just wrong. Okay. So I'll go ahead and um, just briefly, I'll briefly respond and then um, we'll go ahead and open it up to public comment. Um, I'm, so, I'm sorry, and then we'll have Councilmember Brown. I'm not gonna reiterate the comments that have already been made. I'm, I'm in agreement that about it being troubling that the timing of this, and in particular on this day when there are folks who are actually right now needing to make that decision about moving and how they're gonna protect their stuff, what choices they're gonna to make to stabilize their already very unstable um, living, their environment, um, they, they can't be here. I mean, I talked, I was at the camp yesterday and I talked with people who said they wanted to come down and um, while there may be other reasons that they're not here, they're not here. And so the coincidence of you know the timing there is particularly troubling. So I just really wanted to um, underscore that. Okay, I'll just go ahead and respond that the there uh, it is a coincidence that that was not uh, taken into consideration. I will Excuse say, me, could you yeah, this is an opportunity for the council to uh, have discussion. We'll have an opportunity for public comment. Please keep your voices down while uh, we have our uh, discussion up here. If I notice uh, one person specifically speaking out, I will give you a verbal warning. If it happens again, I will ask you to leave. It is the job to ensure that we are able to ensure. Uh, decorum and uh, an ability for us to govern. I'll just say that I believe that it's been undemocratic to hear this item well into the late hours of the evening, and the uh, study sessions have been changed on very uh, numerous, numerous occasions, and they were scheduled at time certain for this evening. So I followed through with that in this regard. Uh, Vice Mayor Cummings and I discussed bringing this item forward, uh, given the information that uh, what he felt was, I believe, necessary to uh, present this as a direction, and uh, that was taken into consider consideration when adjusting the, adjusting the agenda um, at the very uh, kind of end of the process right before agenda review. Um, there's, a, as I mentioned, there's a lot that we have to get to as a city, and I think the um, uh, description on the amount of hours spent on this item uh, covers how uh, we have to also try to balance that with other city business. So at this point, I'm gonna go ahead and move over to public comment. We'll allow uh, anybody who's interested in addressing the council on this topic um, for one minute to speak first. They can self-select. And then at that time, we'll go ahead and open it up for two minutes. So anybody interested in, in addressing the council for one minute briefly, excuse me, we, I, we have no group presentations this afternoon. We have one minute if you're interested. Go ahead. Uh, you, this is an opportunity for anybody to self-select for one minute, and if you're interested in staying for two minutes, then you can have two minutes, and that's how we'll go with public comment today. One so if you'd like to address the council for one minute, you could do so now. I have a motion. It's one council or the other. other. Council Member Matthews. It'll be one or the other. That's right. Uh, uh, council Member Glover. Motion to extend the public comment from two minutes to three minutes. Okay, we have a motion by Council Member Glover to extend public comment from two minutes to three minutes. Is there a Second. Second. And a second by Councilmember Crone. Uh, all those, or do you have further discussion? Yeah, I just want to say that um, I do respect everybody's ask for longer periods of time. Last week, we extended public comment for three minutes, 
and that resulted in six and a half hours or six hours and 40 minutes in addition to all the other five minute uh, or five hour meetings that we had. And so I'm not gonna support this because I know we have a lot to get through. Uh, I would encourage though that if um, if you'd like more time, this is, since this is the one minute, I would suggest waiting for the two minute um, comment portion. Thank you, Vice Mayor. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? No. No. So that fails with Councilmember Crone, Glover, and Brown voting in support, uh, voting against. Um, okay, so that fails with Councilmember Brown, I'm sorry, with Councilmember Crone and Glover voting in support, Councilmember Brown, Matthews, Vice Mayor Cummings, Myers, and myself voting against. Okay, so you'll be given one minute or you can wait for two minutes. <laughs> All right, uh, my name is Raphael. I'm with Friends of Depot Park, and uh, I'm just here today because the city has a credibility problem. Uh, there's a lot of distrust in the community, both from the housed and the unhoused, about uh, the direction that the, that the city is moving forward in, and uh, we feel like the city has a responsibility to ensure that there is adequate shelter, uh, not just for the next week, but for the foreseeable future. Um, uh, there are people who are moving from the Ross camp to a, a, a temporary site and then uh, and then we don't really know what the plan is after that. So um, we're asking you to clarify what the plan is today uh, about uh, where people are going to go and also to ensure that there is some sort of community engagement process to ensure that uh, uh, the community's needs are heard when whenever there is a sighting of a shelter uh, location. Um, the uh, uh, the way that uh, uh, the fact that uh, uh, I'll, I'll finish there. Okay, Thanks. thank you. Yeah. Is there anybody else who's interested in addressing the uh, council for one minute? Please uh, come forward, and uh, you can line up on my left if you'd like. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, this is Carol Walker from Felker Street. I present to you 140 signatures in support of a permanent closure of the Gateway Encampment. At last night's River Neighbors meeting, we initiated an online survey that was intended to include only Felker, Price, and Tannery campuses. I learned this morning that the survey has been shared with a few surrounding neighborhoods, neighboring businesses, and their employees. So I'm not here to speak on behalf of River Neighbors, but to present to you the voices of those who shared their wishes to disband the Gateway Campus. The thefts, vandalism, break-ins, and drugs that have accompanied this camp have pretty much destroyed our neighborhoods. This activity that accompanies camps such as this should never be allowed in a residential neighborhood. We therefore support City Council's efforts to seek appropriate and suitable housing for our city's homeless population as well as giving the neighborhoods back to us by asking for a yes vote on item 13. Thank you. Thank you. And this is for folks who are interested in the one minute time frame. I'm, I live at the Tannery. My name is Joan Staff and I've been there for 10 years. This camp is destroying the Tannery. The, we are no longer, our children and myself no longer walk to downtown. It is frightening. We have crazy people late at night screaming in our neighborhoods. We know that there's been deaths. We know that this is more of a drug problem than a homeless problem. I would urge the city to deal with the drug problem. I would, would love to have the camp closed and for everyone in Santa Cruz to have housing. I'm not against people having housing, but this is an illegal camp. It's destroying the tannery, the neighborhood, and businesses. Thank you. Okay. For one minute. Good afternoon, uh, Mike Paul Hamas. I'm a teacher at Santa Cruz High School. I actually have to go back and teach a class in a minute here. Um, I just wanna voice my support uh, both for item 13 and also Martine and uh, Justin for putting it on the agenda. I think uh, the community deserves that. And just, I wanna address the idea that we somehow have not had exhaustive public comment on this issue. We have gone over this and over this and over this. And I think that we need to get behind this. And you know, now that we have a court order, there needs to be some action. 
and we need to stop crying about how the agenda is made and why the agenda is made this way or that way and put forth some decisions so that we can move forward for these people and for the city who have both vo voiced a lot of support in both directions and let's just do it. Let's get it over with and move forward. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, is there any other member of the community who is interested in speaking to us on one, uh, for one minute? I wanna remind those that are in the community, Mr. Norris, that if you could please keep your voices down. Everybody has a right to come here and to speak to us and to address us without antagonizing or fear. And I want to let you know that that is a warning. And if I see that again, I will ask you to please leave. Okay, so now you'll be given two minutes. Hello. Um, Drew Glover is my friend, but I do not support him on this. And Martine Watkins, I just wanna honor you as a woman of color being up there and taking the heat that you are taking. I just wanna honor all of you who are working on this. I'm here really to speak for the children, um, all the children, not just at the tannery, but that are affected by the, the Ross camp. Nobody should be living in that squalor. My friend Michael Sweat lives in that camp. Nobody should be living in that squalor. People have, have lowered their standards because they've been treated like crap for a long time. They shouldn't be there, it is disgusting. It is despicable and disgusting and they deserve to have housing, those who want it. And I'm gonna say it even if people attack me, many people in the camp, they don't actually want housing. They want freedom, they don't wanna follow rules and they just wanna be able to be somewhere where they don't have to follow rules and they've told me that specifically. But people who want housing and people who want rehab, the county and the city needs to work to provide them housing and to provide them with rehab and mental health services that humans all deserve, but not everybody wants that and you can't force them to. So we need to close the camp. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker and you'll have two minutes. Good afternoon. I'm not a public speaker, I'm gonna keep it very short. Um, I feel that uh, I have to be uh, here to uh, say that myself and my partner as well as my neighbors are very concerned about protecting our things as homeowners and that we feel moving the, the encampment to the center of the park where they were moved away from before would endanger us once again and that uh, we've even entertained having to pay pr for private security just for our neighborhood that is like $7,000 a month extremely concerning. Of course, I've got empathy for the homeless in terrible conditions, and I would like to see that they have what they need, uh, but uh, not in the center of our parks, please, and thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Okay. Next speaker, and you'll have up to two minutes. Yeah, so uh, the first thing I'd like to note is that uh, it's important to suspend the enforcement since we have a um, uh, hearing in federal court on Friday at uh, 9 a.m. in uh, San Jose that is an, uh, will be a TRO against the um, eviction of people in, in, in uh, Ross. I find that it's, uh, you know, when, when it was raining, I was able to secure, if we don't want to be able to secure hundreds of raincoats and rain boots and socks. And then all of a sudden the city in a cynical move is able to come up with tents and, and gear for, and give out vouchers to pr make sure that only people at Ross Camp moved to the benchlands for five days. And that the, the this, in. You're being completely dishonest. You obviously scheduled this meeting today at noon and scheduled the clearing of the camp at 10 so that none of the people that the camp could come here and speak out on their behalf. This, you, the entire thing, is, and if you follow, um, as I do, other cities who are attacking the homeless, they're using the same vicious, inhumane, ugly, attempts to drive the homeless out of sight. They're not going to evaporate. We've been here for 30 years. I've spent hundreds of hours before this city council, uh, Martin Watkins, talking about homeless issues, hundreds of hours, hundreds of hours. We've been here since, I've been here since 1988 talking about how we could solve the homeless problem, but the city never does it. This is just another cynical, 
cruel, ugly attack against the disenfranchised in this city. These people are my friends. I enjoyed playing with children from the tannery at Ross Camp. Okay. This is a is bunch up. of bumps. Your time is so I, I, I actually have getting 10 minutes, apparently. No, so um, now I wrote go to get 10 minutes. To if you can't so stop. I'm asking you to leave. You've been more I'm asking okay. you to leave. Why don't you leave? We'll go ahead and what have the heck's wrong with you? Go ahead and remove uh, well, this, uh, this member of the public who is not adhering to it. Thank you very much. Yeah. Go ahead and, you can go ahead and go. Yep, you're out. All right. Okay, we have our next speaker, and I'm gonna go ahead and remind the community one more time that yeah, when, bring okay. Everybody outside, everybody can come out and eat. Thank you. Woo Woo yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. Okay. Okay. Hi. You have your two minutes. Thank you. Uh, my name is Kate Garrett, um, and before I read what I wrote down, um, I would just like to say that I appreciate Councilmember Crone and other council members for bringing up the timing issue. Um, I'm here on my lunch break. I'm now over time and have had to contact my employer so that I can stand here and speak about this, and I've been here for an hour like listening about the metro and all that stuff, and maybe you can say it's coincidental and that's the official position, but um, I think it's pretty realistic that you guys know that there would be way more people here turning out if it were an evening issue, and not just people who live at the camp, but also community members who care about our community and would like to be here in support of other community members. Um, and I would just like to say that you're trying to vacate people by 4 p.m. tomorrow under threat of forcible removal, but as I understand it, the bench lands won't even be open until Tuesday morning. Um, and also you're talking about closing the camp, the 1220 River Street camp by the end of June. So like, where are you gonna put people? And there are a lot of people who can't be in traditional housing, but does that mean that they should have no support, that they should have to fend for themselves and maybe die on the streets? Like you're talking about, oh, well, the drug addicts, they shouldn't have any help. Where's the drug treatment in Santa Cruz? It's very, very, very under available. And people are then not able to be housed after going to treatment, which is the most successful way to stay sober. You can't just put someone in drug treatment and then turn them back to the streets and expect them to be sober long enough for the months and months and months that it takes to secure housing in Santa Cruz. Um, it's just really not a workable system. So please have compassion for people who are drug users. They're people too, and they deserve to have services provided to them and not just say, oh, well, you can't stay in a traditional shelter, so go die on the streets and find your own place to live. Um, people are protected in the camp and they have a community, Thank so. You. Okay, so next speaker you'll have. Hi, um, my name is Albert Gann, and um, I've been involved with Secondary Needle Exchange um, since January. We regularly go into the Ross camp on Thursdays and Sundays to collect dirty needles and distribute clean needles, naloxone, condoms, toiletries, um, among other things, and information about the county needle exchange. I have some serious, serious concerns regarding a permanent closure of the Ross Camp's effect on the health and safety of its residents. The Ross Camp provides a centralized location for the distribution of clean needles and life-saving naloxone. If folks experiencing homelessness who also use drugs are released into dispersed camps throughout the city of Santa Cruz, this reduces their access to clean needles and naloxone and subsequently increases the likelihood of death by overdose and the transmission of injection-related diseases including hepatitis C and HIV. So I urge you to vote no on the closure of the Ross camp. Thanks. Good afternoon, Santa Cruz. I'm currently homeless in your city. Me. Um, it's not by my choice. I was just driving through on vacation. I stole my car. My wife and I are currently homeless on your streets. I'm not a drug user. I don't need to do any of that. I'm not around any of that. I won't allow myself to be around that. Got a job. I work for what I have. But I am still homeless because they took my car. 
By now, I've drove through other cities on my way out here. They do not have a consolidated hub or anything like that, like the camp. You go into McDonald's parking lot, there's six needles in every parking lot. I could not believe it. You have to watch where you, how, what kind of shoes you wear, what you're gonna step on on the sidewalk of your city streets. No, the camp is not a good idea. It's not the best. I don't like it myself. I don't want it myself. But to turn this out onto your streets, onto the other homeless here, it's kind of, you can avoid that element. You're gonna put that element on everybody in this entire city. I don't know, but I'm gonna get to work now. Thank you. My name is John Hall. Uh, I'm a citizen of Santa Cruz. Um, I must say that uh, item 13 is very complicated to understand, even for someone uh, with an advanced collegiate degree. Uh, but I, and I also recognize that uh, the homeless problem is extremely complex. It's connected to housing issues, drug addiction, uh, people who uh, lack uh, adequate psychological support, a number of issues, and it's a national, regional, state, local problem. Uh, in that, it seems to me that Santa Cruz has to stand up for decency and has to face a humanitarian crisis and it has to do it uh, with its own dignity as a city and in a way that offers the homeless uh, a certain amount of dignity as much as we can provide. Uh, I am not clear that the motion as stated provides that. It seems to me, as far as I can tell, that it uh, ejects people from the camp without necessarily having adequate alternative solutions for them to be housed in some transitional way uh, and without social services. That to me is itself a humanitarian disaster in the making. And it is also a disaster for the city's business uh, community. It's a disaster for people who own homes, people who like to visit the downtown area, uh, who will find a number of distressed people who have no place else to go wandering around in the evening hours. So it's not uh, a whack-a-mole situation. You can't just wish it away. You have to find uh, solutions that work uh, before you simply end a solution that is not an optimal solution. So I urge you to arrange for transitional housing for all who need it before you close this camp. It's simple human decency. Thank, Thank you. you. Hi, I'm Michael Gasser. I, I don't want to repeat what the previous speaker said. I agree with everything he said. I'm one of the relatively uh, extremely privileged Santa Cruzans. I'm a homeowner. That means my privilege allows me to come here whenever the issues are being discussed to, for public comment, unlike the residents of the camp. It also gives me the time on Sunday mornings to go and visit the camp where I've been along with other DSA members on uh, eight Sundays. And so I've gotten to know some of the people there. It's a very complex community. All sorts of people are there. People with the drug issues and people without drug issues. No one likes the camp, right? The residents see it as the best of possibly a huge number of other evils. The camp obviously is not something permanent, but to close the camp now when there aren't, aren't other alternatives is simply not the compassionate way to go. Yes, there's the threat of, of uh, going against Boise versus Martin, but let's think about the people there first, and then maybe about the legal issues, right? So um, uh, there are lots of ways to solve this problem that other cities have tried. They are not being tried here. There are transitional camps that are being proposed by Councilman Glover and others in the community. You need long-term issues and simply moving people around as, as is happening again, is obviously just a way to make life miserable for people in the hopes that they will leave and move somewhere else. That is no solution yeah. to the problem of homelessness. Please vo vote against this move to empty the camp in a week. Thank you. And I again want to remind those that are in the audience that when the person who is speaking, they have their two minutes, you can stand in line and also have two minutes to address this, but to not make any interruptions.
please, you'll have thank two you. minutes. Uh, Mayor Watkins and members of the City Council, thank you for the opportunity to speak. My name is Jim Brown and I'm the Arts Council's Tannery Director. I've been asked to speak on behalf of the Tannery community as most of those hard hardworking people are at their jobs and unable to be here at this time of day. My mandate at the Arts Council is to work towards the success of the Tannery Arts Center as a vibrant and safe home for the arts in Santa Cruz. And there's no question that the establishment of the Ross Camp sits as an obstacle to that mission. I know that you have received many communications from Tannery residents and businesses outlining the ways that the camp has impacted our campus, and I will not reiterate them today. I'd prefer to focus on the way in which every community in Santa Cruz has been given an opportunity to prevent a homeless camp in their neighborhood but ours. Each time a camp location has been proposed, the council has listened to the neighbors and chosen not to create it. Tannery tenants were given no choice in the establishment of this camp. The tannery and the surrounding neighborhoods are predominantly low income, working class with many families of color. Essentially those with some of the least power in our community have once again not been given a voice. I urge the council to vote in favor of closing the camp and continuing to move forward in a deliberate and thoughtful way to address our homeless challenges with compassion for all Santa Cruz citizens. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker. I wish Martine was here to hear this. Um, I'm so angry at the multi-leveled injustices that are about to be perpetrated that I can hardly speak. My heart is beating. I am shocked that this proposal even came to you and I can't imagine what you're doing. I'm holding a copy of the United Nations Universal Declaration of Human Rights. I want to remind people what that is about. Human rights means the recognition of the inherent dignity and of the equal and inalienable rights of all members of the human family as the foundation of freedom, justice, and peace in the world. It says nothing about drug addicts not being members of the human community, of ex-felons being members of the community, of the unemployed not being members of the community. They're all members of the community and we have to come up with a solution that recognizes the inherent dignity. And that is what the people of the Ross Camp are asking for. And many of the alternatives that you're about to provide in place of the Ross Camp do not provide them dignity. And no wonder they're willing to put up with rats and mud in order to have some level of security. The Universal Declaration of Human Rights also says everyone has the right to liberty, life, liberty, and security. One woman said, oh, they just want freedom. <laughs> that's what our, that's what the American Revolution was fought about. And those people at Ross Camp, they want that for themselves and they're not willing to sell out their freedom for being put behind chain fences or kicked out during the whole day. It also says in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, um, they have a right to privacy and family. That's their family. That's the only family that they've gotten. And actually, I am Thank going you. to scream. Yeah. Hi, I'm Tony Boardman. I'm a grad student at UCSC. I'm, I'm very nervous, um, but I wanted to add my voice to the people who are opposing the closure of the, the Ross camp um, and to ask if a belief in something that is any better is really the thing that is overriding the problems with the camp, because that's not what I've heard. It seems that the, um, the 1220 River Street will not have, um, have sufficient beds um, and what will happen is that this is a community who will be dispersed uh, throughout the, the, the city. Um, I wanted to respond to a few things that were said. That, um, the second and third speakers, um, the second speaker said this will this is destroying our neighborhoods um, without any uh, recognition that this is a neighborhood that is being destroyed. Um, same for the third person who said this is destroying the tannery. Someone after said uh, nobody should be living in that squalor. Um, this uh, is, is uh, yeah. Th th there's, there's no consideration that that, that um, you know the, the thing that will, that they will be passed on to will be any any better than that. They, they just don't imagine any sort of like 
alternative at all. Um, and I also want to fight this kind of um, this kind of language. As someone was saying about like not everybody wants housing, not everybody wants to be a community member, um, and I think this is a logic we have to resist at every uh, at every step because we, um, you know, we're providing the minimum levels of existence for these people, um, and kind of a moralistic outlook on whether they deserve this stuff is I, I think is, is is really unethical and, and bad. Um, yeah. So that's all. Thanks. Thank you. I want to talk about freedom and the cabal, the cabal that's been uh, running Santa Cruz for a long time. I could name names, but I'm going to hold short for now. This cabal are homeless haters. They hate the homeless. That is, people who are experiencing homelessness, who have to hide behind bushes to go to the bathroom because they do not have any bathrooms. People who are often have mobility issues. I helped serve lunch to a man who could barely walk. He had to negotiate on level ground, get over a cement curb, and sit down on it and eat his lunch with his walker next to him. This is ridiculous, as Elliot said a few meetings ago, worthy of ridicule. Our council members are being hamstrung. They can't get stuff on the agenda. When they put their things on their lists and submit them, legally and lawfully according to a legal procedure. Things are mysteriously disappeared off lists by city staff we don't know who. This is ridiculous. We have a fascist government here and a pretense of a city council procedure. So this thing, this injunction that we filed, that is the people who are advocating for the rights and freedoms of the homeless, advocated to stop the destruction of Ross Camp until we could at least have dignified viable housing that will actually provide for these people that they can access. Uh, what happened is uh, this this item came before the council and now um, we are struggling because the timing of this item is directly to intervene with the injunction that we filed. We are dealing with fascism, Americans need to wake up and if people don't understand that they need to look up the definition because we up. got it here. Time is up, okay. Next speaker, you'll have two minutes. <clears throat> Hi, thank you so much for listening to everyone. My name is Rachel O'Malley. Um, I just want to remind us that it's not only Santa Cruz. I work in San Jose. I grew up in the Bay Area. Our problem is national. We have a national opioid problem. We have a national economic problem. We have a national homeless problem. As a city, I see a lot of, a lot of people looking at the things happening behind me, so let's wait a second. Okay, um, as a city, we can act. We are not dependent on our county. We are the wealthiest part of the county. We can act. Go ahead and pause the time. So curious what's going I'm on. I'm just gonna remind folks if you could keep your voices down and allow the speaker their time to address the council without disruption, please. Okay, um, I wanted to point out the New York Times Sunday Magazine was mostly about rats in New York City and in the whole country and in my house, I'm sorry to say. I wanna remind us that the people who live in our streets are people. I walked the whole camp yesterday and um, I sent you a photograph of one of the women there. She gave me permission to send it to you. She's reading her paper on her front step just like I do. They're people. They're human beings who aren't gonna go away when we close the camp and they're gonna still be on the street. And they're gonna be in much more ecologically sensitive areas. We have the opportunity right now to bring services and bring order and structure and stability to the weakest people's lives in the spot that they're in right now, as soon as we disperse them, it will be that much harder, that much harder to find them and help them. What the woman who I sent you the photo said is, I'd be really easy to help, she said. I had my bank account 
cleaned out by someone I know and so I lost my HUD housing. I'd be really easy to help. I wish that someone were helping. The county outreach person who we saw, when I walked up to the camp, she said, I'm afraid, I don't, I don't know what to do. I have nothing to, to offer people. I can't offer them housing. Thank you. Your so I just want to remind Thank us, you. you're their people. Set. Thank you. Okay. Good afternoon, Mayor and City Council persons. Yesterday, I visited the uh, Camp Ross uh, for the first time, not knowing what to expect. I counted 130 tents at nine o'clock in the morning and did not see, I know it's point in time, any needles, feces, human or otherwise, or rats. Um, yet the living conditions were very dense. I talked to Taylor um, and his fellow officer from the Santa Cruz uh, police department and asked how many people reside in the tents and he said usually two per tent but sometimes three if it's a larger tent. Um, so I'm estimating around 300 people given that information. If we are providing what, you know, I don't know, 100 to 160 spots, I don't think we have enough space. We have work to do. Underestimating the numbers will be a disaster to ne neighborhoods, parks, open space, and beaches. When the city cleared the homeless before, it was a disaster for the east side. I'm asking for your moral courage to do the right thing and provide a plan for all the campers. Um, and let's start saying yes. Let's say yes to the camp cleanup, yes to an accurate population count, yes, a place for them to go and a plan for all of them. Let's pledge to mitigate the impacts, if any, to neighborhoods, parks, et cetera, and let's track our success. And always remember how blessed we housed are. May you and your loved ones never experience the pain of addiction, the burden of mental illness, the despair of poverty, the isolation of not having a family. May we count our blessings and bring this gratitude to the council. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. And you'll have two minutes and money. Thank you. Buenas tardes, miembros del concilio. My name is Ernestina Saldaña, and I'm here one more time to uh, <coughs> speak to you about uh, what is. Sorry, just excuse me for one second. Okay, go ahead. What is the life of uh, homeless people? Because I can see very clearly that none of you have ever been homeless. And uh, um, this is very difficult to be homeless. It's not easy for the people who is on the street. And as you can hear, it's not easy for the people who live in houses where the people who doesn't have house has to hang. But um, if I had to say something to the gentleman who spoke on behalf of the tannery, the only thing I can say is that they were there before them. I would live in the camp that was around the early 90s, by what is now known as the tannery. It was not the apartment complex that is now. It was the building of the tannery. So if we had to say that they were there before the people who have houses now. So when you have to be on the streets, you have no place to put your belongings and you have to have them with you. That's why you walk in the camp right now, you're gonna find that there's a lot of the stuff in there. But it's not really trash. It's the belongings of that people. When you are on the street, you need to have water so you collect the jugs to be able to carry water with you. And you will find jugs around the tents. I was speaking this morning with uh, the people from the city who is there, Megan and um, Kerry, I believe. And they were telling me that they are ready to start giving vouchers to the people who live in the camp. And when I asked what's gonna happen to the property, and she said, whatever can fit in the, the bags that we are gonna provide it, they can take it with them. And whatever don't, they had to leave it behind, 
or they can put it on the storage from for uh, Brent. She also told me that everyone will be getting a new tent, and I wonder why. Thank you. Your time just is up. To, Thank uh, you very much. Your time is up. Just to excuse you. the amount of money Your waste on up. that. Your time is up. Thank you very much. Okay, you all have two minutes. Thank you. that my American right is to be able to speak to the people and the council, uh, my, that's my right. This is dividing everyone and every one of these communities. This is not good. We have to get the business owners, everyone together on the same page with this. This camp has to stay. The, if you've been there, I've been there every day for the last week, night and day, all different times. Drew and I did, a, and other people put an Easter party together with kids. We had a great time. What about Maddie, who she was killed by the people at the, that place, the art cannery, and who looked for her? Homeless people. Who saved the guy in the car that was burning along the road? Rock camp people. No, the people, the guy even caused it, didn't even step in and help. I met the guy who had his hair burned off. They, you know, they were trying to cut the seatbelts. They only had an exacto blade. This is wrong. What we got to do with Ross Camp is let those people de be there. They developed their own community. They have self-government. We need to make it cleaner. We need to have restrooms, real restrooms, running water. We need to have clock boxes where they can have their stuff in safety. They can go out for the day, find jobs. They'll be clean. They'll have dignity. They're tired of being rejected from this community and wherever other community they're coming from. I don't care where they're coming from. They're people who have a right to be on this planet, to be with us. We need to love them and take care of them. It's just not fair. We got a lot of solutions to help them. And you're just ramrodding it down these people's throats. They didn't, and you're not even giving them time. What would happen to you if somebody told you you got two days to move? They got a lot of stuff. Stuff to them is important. When you're in that situation, it becomes a spiritual thing to have stuff. You don't have other people sometimes, or maybe they do, but if they don't, those things help fulfill their heart in a way that's spiritual, like if they had a friend, okay? It becomes super important. And all that stuff is important to them. Let them organize it. Make it safe, yeah, for fire safety. Make the lanes. Your time is up. Thank you. Hello, my name is Dreamcatcher. I think the plan is good. I've, seen, I've never seen such a city so friendly to homeless people. I know a lot of your city workers and I'm very polite to them and I like doing that. I think your plan is good. A place to go before you close down another one. It's appropriate. The boards, I have one myself. I'm gonna make good use of it. I had a lot of experience with the, I had a lot of experience with the Occupy we had in the same location last year. Mm. And uh, carry on. I think uh, nobody should have anything more than they can carry in one trip. Everything should go inside the tents. And the self-governing thing, that'll happen. Thank you for being our city government. Hello, my name is Shantanu Pukan, and I'm a, um, I walk along the river two or three times a week. I'm a birder, and I want to bring the perspective of a birder and someone who's interested in nature to this discussion. Um, what alarms me most is the opening, or the, the allegedly temporary opening of the Benchlands encampment. Um, and especially at this time of year, uh, because that particular stretch of the river uh, at the Benchlands is probably the richest stretch of river in terms of birds and bird breeding, and that has to do with the, the row of 10 or 12 cottonwoods that grow along that stretch and only there um, in, uh, along the river. And also the island that is just north of the footbridge. Um, this right now is the height of the breeding season uh, from early April till about the end of June. Um, so this, uh, this would be a major disruption to the breeding birds. Um, along that stretch of the river. So that is one concern that I have. I'm aware that there are probably many people here who would think that it's extremely frivolous to even pit the needs of people against those of birds. But nonetheless, as a birder, I want to make sure that at least as we contemplate this issue, uh, 
the environment and nature and wildlife are in the mix. The second issue that I have is that when the Benchlands Camp was open before, uh, it was really unpleasant and sometimes downright unsafe to walk along the footbridge. About three or four times I was confronted by people standing. This man actually had a stout stick in his hand, daring me to cross the bridge. Um, I thought about whether I should or should not cross, and I went around him anyway, and as I did so, he made some racial comments. This used to happen pretty, pretty Your time regularly is up. Your time when is the up. Benchlands camp was Thank open. You. Your time Thank you. Is up. Okay, next speaker, and you'll have up to two minutes. Mayor, Council, um, I'm, I'm impressed at where we're at. Uh, 2012 uh, and 13, we brought a transitional encampment proposal to the city. We uh, met with uh, Susie O'Hara at that time and sat down. We were trying to bring this uh, to many of you. Uh, there's a lot of these homeless activists has been, have been at this game for a long time, so it just feels like we've been at, uh, uh, busy. But at some point, what is our forward vision? Uh, now there is millions at play. We're gonna build a large uh, 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 shelter, but to what end? Who are the people in control of these money? Who They've been the same people in control of this money all along. We are not actually ending homelessness through the dignity of work with the downtown streets team. We're not actually ending homelessness with 20, uh, 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 Project uh, 180, 180. It's all just hype, feel good, pat ourselves on the back. Where are we now? We have an opportunity. Uh, years uh, I've been trans uh, investigating transitional encampments. I went from San Diego. I tried to meet a couple of years ago every single homeless person in the state of California, and I think I was successful. It took me seven months, and I went from to 40 cities, and I finally got to Eugene and Seattle and Portland, and it was like a mecca, an amazing thing. I went to uh, Marysville. I went to Fresno. I went to uh, uh, also Ventura. These are where transitional encampments have taken a foothold. They're not self-governed, they're operated by a nonprofit, certified by a city, that we empower the people with inside. They have volunteer, they, they voluntarily keep this safe space. Here we are now, I, my program, the storage program, across the river, we were there predating this large encampment. I watched it grow, I'm there every day. We can talk about anecdotal stories about the nature of homelessness, but what really has occurred is the city has allowed this to happen. The city has allowed this to become, and I'll say the word, a festering drug mud heap, because we have no intentionality and even with its transitional encampments, you couldn't even get together the four council people to really st put a stake in the ground and make this happen. So where are we always playing lowest common denominator, taking the lowest path? But I actually have been to this thing in the bench lands and I, it up. doesn't look so okay. terrible. Okay, next speaker, and you'll have two minutes. This is a really sad day for the Santa Cruz community. Once again, for the 30, over 30 years that I've lived here, I've watched city and county government fail to come up with really holistic solutions to provide affordable housing, proper medical care, proper mental health treatment, um, drug treatment options locally. And I just want to encourage you all to, the data is already there. We don't need to form another homeless council to study the issue. There are many of us working in the trenches every day with these populations. And we have a firm grasp on why these issues exist. And you need to separate the different groups of people. You cannot lump everybody under the category of homeless and and then think that you're gonna solve this issue. So some of the solutions I suggest is that you look into how many mental health treatment beds we have locally, 16. None for juveniles, okay? Where does homelessness begin? It starts with foster care youth who are let out at age 18 with no opportunity and no guidance where to go. Your local jail, there's a for-profit corporation running the medical care. That's a problem. That's cruel and unusual punishment, and we need to switch that back to the county. The county can provide wraparound services, and the city should hold them accountable, as most of the homeless people are criminally dumped from other local counties, local cities, into the city of Santa Cruz. So it's a very complex issue, and it's gonna take a lot of partnerships, and I haven't seen anyone on this council necessarily reach out and build that coalition of actual people who do this work day in and day out. You don't need to study this, you just need to get us all in the same room and we will help you. We're here. Um, hello, my name is Satya. 
And I wanna say something I haven't heard yet. I just wanna really honor the members of the Ross camp for their courage and taking matters into their own hands to create safety and privacy and something that basic needs for themselves that most of us just take for granted. I, I agree that it's, it's not an ideal situation, but I really like the ideas I've heard many different places. I like what Bryn Adams is doing. I like what other cities are doing. That there's no way a lot of these people are ever gonna get into regular housing. I know how hard it is to get into regular housing and I have money. I've almost been, not a lot, I've almost been homeless myself and I know how scary that is. And I know what it would feel like just to have nowhere to go during the day. Just that simple thing that you have to take everything you have with you or put it in a box somewhere and have nowhere just to be. You have to go to the library, you can sit on the side of the, you know, on the sidewalk and then you're not welcome there either. And where do you go? So I, I would like to see the city, see us work with them. They've started something, they've said what they need, they've tried. Uh, it, they need our help. They need us to set up some kind of a temporary encampment for them. I like the idea of moving them out to the bench lands and then bringing them back there where it's already set up, where they're there, where they have their community. Work with them. They need our help, really need our help. So please help them. Don't just send them out to wander aimlessly looking, hoping for somewhere to be where there isn't anywhere to be, waiting for some neighborhood to welcome them. They're not going to. You know, we need to ask with our hearts, what can we do to help them? We need to help them. Thank you for everyone who spoke. I've been crying a lot today. It's beautiful, thank you. Thank you. Hello, I'm John Gundersgaard. Uh, just a quick comment. Uh, I know a girl, a friend of friend of mine who goes to Cabrillo. When she's done at classes, she takes the bus downtown. She only lives about a 10 minute walk from downtown. She lives at the tannery, but she doesn't walk there. She sits there and waits for somebody to come and take her because she's terrified to walk past that camp. Uh, there are a number of other kids who are asking their parents to move because they're afraid of that camp. Now, I think you've gotta do something with it and, f and fix it, but it can't stay there because there is really, really dangerous. And I hope you're looking at other alternatives. Thank you. Hi, uh, Pat Malo. I was born and raised in Santa Cruz, lived here my whole life. Um, I want to say that uh, first, thank you guys for dealing with this again and again. I think that there's as long as it takes to figure this out, it's worth the time. Um, again, and I want to thank everyone for participating in this conversation. I've been at a lot of these meetings and I've watched the rest over my phone, thanks to technology, whatnot. Um, and I want to say that I agree with most everything that's said on all sides of this issue. Um, I also think that there's something that's been missing here um, for the most part, except for a motion that I believe was voted on by a majority um, by Councilperson Glover to look at uh, local ordinances and how they're being enforced that uh, disproportionately affect people without houses. And I think that's really, really essential to this process because in order to get everyone affected by this at the same table, we need to start with the trust issue on all sides. But I think that you guys have the particular power to stop the cycle of criminal criminalization that's overcomplicating and ruining from the start any sort of trust on both sides that's gonna come to this table. Um, I'm here also for the next issue, which is about cannabis, and it's always ironic to me that we've take, had the strength to stop criminalizing cannabis, but a lot of the time we find it hard to have the same strength when it comes to people in our community, particularly people that when we look at the numbers, there is, you know, 
cycles of trauma, cycles of addiction, mental health issues, et cetera, et cetera, not to mention the economic circumstances that I think everyone in this room, no matter where you're at, are having a hard time with in this community. So I think it stops with, or it starts with stopping to criminalize people who are experiencing homelessness. And I believe a motion was made, and I just want staff to come back with those, you know, uh, <clears throat> those things so that we can take Thank further you. action. Thank you. Is there any other members of the community that are interested in speaking to this item? Okay, you'll go ahead and line up to my left. Please do have up to two minutes. Hi, my name is Sonny, and I've been a member of this community for at least 10 plus years. Okay, now I've been already over to the bench lands before, checked in that. I've been over there into the River Street 1220 encampment, went into there, and each one out of six months been getting kicked out, carrying our stuff, moving on to another location, trying to set up for another location and carrying all of our stuff. Now we've actually created a community right over there behind Ross encampment. And for several years, you guys haven't done anything within that property for 15 or 20 plus years since it's been built until homeless folks actually put a tent there. You mean? And now we have actually our community who actually does care, thank you very much, and for the one individuals who actually do care about human lives, children's lives, family lives. I mean, I've seen a lot of deaths either at the Benchlands or the River Street encampment at 1220. And same thing, why are we gonna be opening that one up again and kicking them out? They shouldn't have moved in the first place. And after all, they're in that uh, encampment behind Ross. With $10 million that you guys actually have heard about already, couldn't we build a condo for homeless folks other than building a condo in town already? How many condos can it fit for families? Now we've actually housed not just 1,750 men, but we've actually housed 3,740 people and families and kids, if we could buy some property and build a condo and do the structure just like that, because look at our community right now and look at AHSC. I've only had the permission to actually get called for Janice or Paige Smith today, you mean? And that's an interview today for me to get in. That's something exceptional. If it's something to actually get my kids back, Thank you. but the bench lands is not. Your time is up. Thank you very much. Okay, next speaker. Hi, my name's Serge, uh, Stepping Up Santa Cruz. Um, I think a lot of people on both sides of, well, there's probably a lot of sides of this whole discussion. Um, a lot of people are scared. A lot of people don't really understand the details of the thing. I think it's a communication issue. Um, I really like the idea of the Community Advisory Committee on Homelessness. Um, I would, uh, I have four suggestions for that. Uh, to be able to, in the future, to have uh, input on this kind of discussion so that there's more transparency. Um, have weekly, for four recommendations for that, uh, have weekly committee meetings with the city manager staff available for transparent conversations to make sure the committee understands what's being done presently, what's planned for the future, to inform final recommendations that the committee may make, but also to give input on stuff like this on present decision making. Number two, include law enforcement and fire department representation on the committee, because as we've seen from this discussion, it, it's valid and it's necessary to understand. Three, modify objectives and timelines to have the committee have time to create some expert draft recommendations, which would be offered at the, um, the community meetings, the five community meetings you suggest. It doesn't really help to have the community meetings without the experts really having something set up to offer. And then the fourth recommendation, move the time of the final recommendations for this October so that those recommendations can be part of winter shelter planning. Um, to have them be February doesn't really help what we're gonna do for this winter. That's it, thank you. Hi there, sorry I'm a little sweaty. We're doing bark chips across the street at my property. Um, first of all, hats off to Drew who had a invite for uh, Easter at the pink camp, which I took advantage of. Um, and my apologies, Drew, in advance. I don't wanna look like I'm narking on 
what I saw, but let me just explain. My friend and I went there, uh, we talked to six random folks. Five of those six were not from Santa Cruz. One was from Seattle, uh, via Mil Mil Seattle via Milwaukee, where he's originally from, and has a degree in IT. And then he, but he had a needle in one hand and a foil in the other, and explained how he shoots his ass with, hair, with meth. Um, then another one was from San Francisco. She'd been there several months. Another one, a young couple that did not appear to be on drugs or using drugs, was, uh, they had their car impounded after parking in front of the boardwalk for five days with a broken alternator, and they're from Sacramento. And there was one, and next to them was a guy openly lighting a glass, you know, a meth pipe, <clears throat> right there. Um, at best, I would describe the place as organized clutter. At worst, it really is. I'm surprised with the open pit f barbecues, Lighters that that place has not caught on fire with the tents just crammed together and so forth. I mean, it, it has to move. It needs cleaned up. There's no doubt. But here's the good news. You have a very unique opportunity with moving to the benchlands with an organized tents, all of the same kind, to uh, to actually be a model even for the West Coast on how to run an encampment. And you let the folks that want to, that are okay with rules come to the camp and stay. But the key is you need rules. There has to be a moderate barrier of entry. And we'll find out, we'll, we'll smoke out who doesn't really want to, who just wants to exist on the streets doing whatever they want to do. And I'm, I'd be very interested to see how many actually migrate to the camp. And I don't think it's a hardship. By virtue of the word homeless, they are, they, they, they can pick up and leave. They are very mobile. Thank you. <clears throat> Hi, um, I live and I work right next to the Ross encampment and, you know, I feel safe walking by. I actually feel like um, people are, um, like there's a community and people are, uh, you know, c helping solve needs together. There's really uh, not the uh, mental health crisis resources in Santa Cruz, same with uh, drug abuse problems. There's, we just don't have the resources and we need to have them for people. Like, like what the woman said before, that that's only 16 beds. That's just really unacceptable um, and really sad. And I, I mean, I just agree with what most people have said in my favor, so. <laughs> I'm here with Ohona to talk to you about freedom, empathy, and compassion. This dog can, in this city, go to two or three parks that are reserved for her. She has the freedom to run free and enjoy life and not suffer. Now, those of you who know me know that I love my dog. But I want to tell you something. I love human beings more. And it concerns me that you're possibly going to vote on 13, which will affect the suffering of fellow human beings. I'm not here to accuse you. My emp I feel empathy for the difficulty of the decision you have to make. But empathy suggests that you feel the suffering of human beings and act in a way to make their lives as best as possible. And that means making sure that if you close that camp, that you have securely, conscientiously provided alternatives so that just as my dog can run free, fellow human beings can run free without suffering because of your empathy and your goodness to make the right decision. Lastly, I do appeal to the community to show empathy for each other. I feel empathy for the business people. I feel empathy for the homeless. I feel empathy for you. We can make a difference if we consult with each other and allow Alicia and her core group to work inside the Ross Camp or the Benchlands or whatever to work with the people to help solve the problems that exist in our community. Thank you. And I believe you'll be our last speaker. Go ahead. Oh, you're speaking? 
Okay, you'll be our last speaker, will you please? Okay. Members of the community and city council, um, <clears throat> this is a lawsuit that was given half an hour ago to the city attorney. There's gonna be a hearing on Friday at 9 a.m. in federal court on the issue of the Ross camp. So really what this means to be fair, and I'm appealing to the majority that can make this fair, is to at least wait until after that date before suggesting there's any uh, final closing of this camp. It also would be protect you from legal liability. That's to be considered too. Now we heard that uh, Vice Mayor Cummins say that it was not economical to open 1220 because that was the main discussion at the two by two committee, which I understand is what pressured him and Watkins into demanding a closing on August 30th, which again is the third date and a change in, clo in the whole procedure. Plus we have this city manager edict off to the side, which is to move people to uh, a, a park where the council has previously decided people should not go without any kind of council vote, without any kind of council discussion, without any kind of public output. So this is all being done sub rosa. It needs to be suspended. Enforcement needs to be suspended on these issues until at least 9 a.m. Friday in the court hearing in, in San Francisco, I'm in San Francisco, in San Jose, thank you. But more important than that, what we have here is, is, a, is a problem with as I've said many times, and as other speakers have also said, there is no adequate shelter, particularly with the closing of the Depot Park, and no, and no one's pretending there is. Instead, it's just a bald resolution ignoring that issue. Now, those of you who are concerned about it, and I see the swing vote isn't here in the room when this is being mentioned, but I hope he hears it, need to address this issue, and they are going to be held accountable if they don't. Okay. And I ask your the community to up. show up at okay, 4 p.m. tomorrow to make Next sure that speaker, they are not your, your driven time is away. Up. Your time is Thank up. you. Go ahead. Good afternoon. I'm Scott Graham. Um, given that you got this court order yesterday to clean out the camp, this issue before you may be a moot issue. Um, I think it's, you have to be honest with the community here. If this, if the camp gets cleaned out tomorrow by four o'clock, <clears throat> are you going to let the people back in afterwards? I would say, no, that's never going to happen. You're never going to allow them to go back. So you, you folks need to be honest with the community and with the people in the camp and let them know. Once you take them out of there to clean the camp, they're not coming back. And then you also have to tell the people that have been clamoring to close the camp that after the five or seven days on the bench lands, the homeless people are going to be scattered throughout the community and into the neighborhoods where the people don't want them. So you need to do something. This, this whole process right now lacks any kind of real planning. It's just like, okay, we've got the county supervisors pushing this matter, saying, oh, well, you've got, well we've got this $10 million. If you, want, if you want any of it, you have to bend to our will. And that's exactly what's going on here. So in the future, please, vote out Ryan Coonerty and Bruce McPherson because they don't work for the people, they work for the corporate interest who, who they have uh, always taken money from. So without, with lacking a plan, I don't think you can move forward with this. And like I said, be honest with people. What's really going on here? Time is up. Okay. So that concludes um, the public comment for this item, item number 13. We're going to go ahead and return back to the council for action and deliberation. I will um, just briefly say that I want to acknowledge that all the hours that I mentioned that we've spent on this item has not been for a lack of interest in wanting to seek solutions by everyone in this room, by everybody in the community, and I'm sure with my coll colleagues here up on the dais. We've had a lot of discussions in regards to moving forward in this way. Um, there's 
clearly this is an incredibly complex issue that I think no matter the amount of time would take hours and hours and hours, years and months, et cetera, to, to try to actually make movement on. And so we are dealing with really tight, we're dealing with a really tight constrained um, option. We've heard multiple times from our public health department as well as our fire department that the conditions there at the gateway encampment are truly um, not humane for those that are residing there and have impacts not only for them but for the surrounding area. And it's also our responsibility to ensure that their safety is kept in mind as well as the others. So Vice Mayor Cummings and I uh, co-authored the item before us, which is essentially saying we acknowledge these constraints. What we're proposing is as opposed to uh, the previous direction to have folks move back into that area, to have our uh, existing shelter services as well as the coming online 1220 River Street option uh, become available to provide more humane conditions for those that are experiencing homelessness in our community. Um, so that is the item before us. It was uh, an item that was discussed at uh, length in terms of options when we met last time, which was April 9th. Um, and in the interest of clarity in terms of some of the questions I think that were brought up by the community members and for those to kind of understand where we're at today, I'll go ahead and ask our uh, city staff at this time to come up and share a little bit, little bit about where we're at in regards to our uh, current situation today. Thank Good you. afternoon, Mayor and Council. Oh, sorry, hold on. Alrighty, alrighty. A bit of a tripping hazard here. So I did want to provide the council, I'm sorry, I'm Susie O'Hara, Assistant to the City Manager. I did want to provide a real-time update as to the operations that are in place out at the bench lands and at the, at the gateway encampment as well. So as of about 15 minutes ago, uh, 88 people have signed up for the bench lands. Um, the bench lands is currently open. About 15% of those people have requested to be in a tent with somebody else. Um, we have Salvation Army staff poised to open the bench lands um, currently. Right now, I think we're taking in the first person right now. Um, in addition to that, <clears throat> we have multiple people out at the gateway encampment um, providing totes, this is across city departments, transporting people over to the bench lands. I, I do wanna give some context to what we've learned. So we've been out there for about four hours for the last two days. Um, we have had incredible interest on behalf of the campers to move out of the gateway encampment. The first two people that signed up for the vouchers were the two men who pulled um, the people out of the car that was on fire on, um, on the highway. Um, what we heard from them was um, a significant interest in leaving the gateway encampment. Not interest in staying, fear, um, quite frankly, around the conditions at the camp. Um, a, you know, a lack of um, interest in continuing on with that type of um, conditions in terms of their housing. Uh, in addition to that, to that, I was out there for two hours yesterday taking um, information from people. We now have a list of 88 people. We have their names. We have their date of births. We have whether they have pets, partners, possessions. We understand their needs. We understand if they are interested in going to 1220 or other programs. Um, we have emergency contact information for those people. Uh, we have gathered more information in the last four hours than we've been able to gather for the last four months. So I, I just really wanted to provide that context um, Captain Harold will be here. Hopefully he'll, he'll be here any second to answer any questions that you have about the Salvation Army programs. You know, we do believe that we have adequate capacity. We have an amazing partner in the Salvation Army. They remain flexible and ready to serve the city um, with our needs. So he will be here hopefully any minute as you guys um, deliberate and have an opportunity to ask questions between River Street, Laurel Street, VFW, and all the other shelter options we have in this community, I am confident that we have enough resources to place people. Thank you, Susie. Councilmember Myers? Maybe just Susie before you go. I do have a question uh, regarding a number of um, speakers today who mentioned they are um, here in Santa Cruz because they've 
their vehicle has been taken or they're not able to get home uh, is sort of what I'm learning for a few people. Along with all of these, the shelter beds that are, are available as well as the bench lens, uh, are we also able to provide people who need uh, the resource, whether that's a bus ticket or other financial assistance to help people um, move, you know, out of Santa Cruz if they're if they're not able to do that on their own. Is there, is there yeah. a way that we can do that right now as well? If people so need we that? have resources with Homeward Bound. You know, we have our Homeward Bound staff out there today um, okay. that are working um, to provide Homeward Bound tickets to anybody who's interested in taking us up on that. Um, in addition to just the sheer number of people that have signed up for vouchers for the bench lands, what we also um, really have learned is it's across the spectrum from folks that are in their 20s to uh, older women in their 60s and 70s. You know, I think for the most part, the people that we have engaged with are just simply ready to move on, are happy to have a different set of resources available to them. Um, what we intend to do once people get to the gateway, I'm sorry, to the bench lands, is to immediately engage with them on other sheltering options, other resource options, other service options. So it really is a unique period of time where we can um, provide wraparound services for individuals um, as they move in, as they move in um, really get a better feeling as to what resources they need in, in order to make a transition to housing or whatever benefits they may be eligible for. Thank you. I'm ready to uh, make a motion now to direct the city manager to implement the city council approved standard operating procedures for a permanent closure of the gateway encampment with a target close, closure date of April 30th, 2019 and coinciding with the opening of the 1220 River Street Camp and to convert the temporary relocation of the gateway encampment at the bench lands <coughs> under existing council directed uh, site management plan to a permanent closure and direct bench land occupants to alternate shelter sites at 1220 River Street, F VFW, Laurel Street, and any other available shelter beds in the county at the earliest possible time to ensure full access of the bench lands for upcoming uh, community events. And I just wanna, uh, just make one very short comment. Uh, to me, this is about restoring dignity to a group of people who have um, been struggling right in front of our community's eyes for four months. And uh, the city is this, is, this is the right step. We need, we need to provide opportunity for these people to, to find uh, a better place. And uh, so that's why I'm making the motion. Thank you. I'll second the motion. Okay, is there any further discussion at this time? Councilmember Glover, Crone, and Brown, and Vice Mayor Covey. Thank you, so question for Susie. Thank you for that update. Um, what's planned to happen after the five to seven days? Let's just say that the council votes tonight to close the camp. What's gonna happen after five to seven days when the bench lands closes? So that really, so if you vote to close the gateway encampment, we will be working with every individual in the bench lands on alternative shelter options, homeward bound, other resources that they may have um, at their disposal. So the intention is to ensure that everybody at the bench lands has another shelter bed that they can transition to when the bench lands closes. Thank you. And then at this current time, knowing our current resources available for shelter beds, and assuming that there is, let's just say 150 to 200 people, highball it and say 200 people just in case uh, at the bench lands that does get established, will we have enough shelter space should the bench lands close in five to seven days to transition those 150, but let's say 200 people into alternative shelter structures, say, assuming that none of them take, or even a 10% of them take the homeward bound program? Yes, I do believe that we have enough resources to ensure that everybody has an alternative place to go. Uh, okay, thank you. Um, and then for the police chief. Wonderful. Good afternoon. Uh, if you could, would you please update us on the enforcement plan once the bench lands is established? We have uh, um, certainly in the process of planning to make sure that the court order is uh, enforced and to uh, move everybody along uh, to a better location where there is not the systemic problems that are currently there. 
So um, between fire and police personnel, we will go out and, uh, and help people uh, to transition to the next uh, location. Thank you. Um, uh, I was, uh, I must apologize for not being more clear. I was more the enforcement of say camping, sleeping, trespassing, all that kind of stuff. Will that still be in effect in the city or will there be certain codes and ordinances that won't be enforced? Well, we have not written a camping ticket uh, and things associated with that in some time because uh, that has been invalidated. Right, and then, um, but have you seen an increase in trespassing citations? We are writing trespassing citations on private property, yes. And so uh, I know that there was council direction or the rather somewhere there we're not going to be uh, enforcing the camping ban or camping and sleeping ordinances, but that means that you will still be enforcing trespassing ordinances or trespassing citations. Yes, people have the right to do, uh, to have control of their own personal properties. And because um, there have been reports of people getting citations on properties that don't have no trespassing uh, in public spaces or even in private spaces. So can you speak to that? Are your officers citing people that are um, inhabiting or occupying places that are not posted with no trespassing? Uh, I sure can. Um, if someone is camping on somebody else's property, our normal practice is to warn them to leave. Mm -hmm. If they don't leave or if they come back, then we can issue a citation as long as there's a letter of authority on file. That letter of authority is on file. That gives us the right on behalf of that property owner to cite that person. And does that um, also pertain to public property? Do you cite trespassing, uh, do you give cita uh, trespassing citations on public property? Uh, other than the railroad tracks, which can be pretty hazardous, as you might guess, with Absolutely. trains going through, no. Park. No, um, so no no citations in parks for trespassing? Not that I'm aware of, I could research that for you, but. Okay, I would, I would really appreciate it if you could uh, find that information and bring it back to me, but um, thank you, I appreciate that. Um, there were some, you know, I just have some notes here from the mentions or the public comment, um, I, it is concerning. I appreciate uh, the community member, Shantanu, coming to talk about the impact on birds. I do think it's interesting uh, to have it set up at the benchlands without there being council uh, green light on that and without public input. So, and I also want to emphasize, it was interesting. Uh, I appreciate the mention or the suggestion from uh, the Rafa uh, with regards to doing as much community outreach as possible. I also find it interesting that there was another community member who said, Said that we need to stop because enough people have put their input in already. I think I'd rather err on the side of too much public comment than not enough public comment, which would explain my motion earlier to extend it. Um, also, I was a little dismayed and concerned with a statement about it's time to stop crying about the agenda. Uh, this is about protecting democracy, and I want to make sure that we're putting that out there. Um, and I can't talk too much about it, but I just want to clarify with the city manager, you were present at the agenda review when this was being made. Yeah, and but and your staff is the one that went and handed out the flyers that stipulated that at 10 a.m. today was when the uh, was when the beginning of the relocation of the people at the camp would start. Well, there was a variety of staff from the city manager's office, police and others. Uh, Susie can tell you specifically who was out there. Thank you. I want to be really careful about how we talk about this because we re reposted every single tent yesterday with a 4 p.m. on Wednesday vacation, not um, today at 10 a.m. So, you know, I think we have been really clear with the folks that we have engaged with out there. Every single tent has been posted, but with regard to um, the intersection of today's council meeting with the 10 a.m. posting from last week. Um, that was um, staff from fire, uh, the parks department, SCPD, and the city manager's office. Um, at that time, when we had moved forward with um, posting both the order to vacate um, per our SOPs and the ex parte hearing, that was on request of the judge um, to move forward in that direction. So that was not direction on behalf of the city manager's office. Absolutely. Um, my question was the 10 a.m. Tuesday poster that was put up over Easter weekend. And were you aware that it was a 10 a.m. Tuesday timeline that was posted on that document? I'm not sure if I understand your question, but with, respect to, the, with like. respect to the posting, 
uh, it was not at all related to the agenda, the timing of the agenda. I'm just, that's asking, what you're I'm just asking you a question. Were you aware that the removal of people was going to begin or was posted to begin over the weekend on Tuesday at 10 a.m.? Were you aware of it? Yeah, yeah, like and it did. It said on or after, so right. it didn't. It didn't give that as a deadline. It actually said on or after right. Tuesday at 10 a.m. So right. that's the, where my. The, con that's what the, my, my, my understanding was that we were posting to meet our SOP requirements, and that would be. But it would be an ongoing process. I understand the logic. I'm not asking the logic or why you did it. I asked if you were aware of it because that gets back into our conversation about the scheduling and where I really find it hard to believe this was a coincidence. Um, and I want to address this because it was. I brought it up. It was responded to by a, a community member, and I want to provide clarity because this is a really important issue. If you're in the agenda review and you're building the agenda and you know that your staff has put out documents that say 10 a.m. on or after 10 a.m., then I do feel that it is less of a coincidence for this change to happen and it becomes really hard for me to see this as like, oh, it just happened to be on there. Now, this is not what we're talking about today, so I'll move past it, but I want to make sure that I emphasize that we have responsibilities as people that are building these meetings, and we don't have, as council members, access to the agenda review because of policy. So if we are putting our faith in you both to schedule meetings so that we A, have enough time, and B, the maximum amount of people can participate in the democratic process, I think we need to be able to hold each other accountable to maximizing public engagement in this really important issue. So, <laughs> Mayor, Mayor, if I may. No. Nobody in agenda review, um, council members that were there, nor staff, w was aware of the 10 a.m. time during the agenda re review. That came after. So, so then you built the agenda before you put the documents out? So the implementation of the SOPs, that process happened in terms of when we would move forward with the postings after agenda review. So you had the agenda built and then put out the flyers saying 10 a.m. or 2. So it doesn't matter, either one, whichever one came first, I you just knew. wanna make sure we're really careful about what, what we're suggesting. Which, okay. Whichever way you wanna frame it. it, right. it, it so, okay, so back to the, the, Do you have any the, the point at hand. It's, it's a comment uh, to put on the record and share with my colleagues to try and help them to understand the issue that we face right now. Uh, so I want to preface these next comments, which I need to make sure are on the record, uh, with a statement that anybody in this room right now and anybody watching can be home, come homeless at any moment. Uh, that's because a recent study was put out by prosperitynow.org citing that 40% of people in the United States are one pay paycheck away from poverty. I'm dismayed by the way that certain members of the public and even some in these chambers treat and refer to the people experiencing homelessness, and in my opinion, it's downright uncivil. I say this for two reasons. The first is because as soon as we stop treating people like people, the next step is to lose all compassion and sympathy for them. That recognition, that validation, as simple as it may seem, is something that every one of us needs. Second, due to the observations made by myself and those experiencing homelessness about the violent ways in which the city interacts with the camp, there is no real physical violence with regards to what's going on, but there is psychological violence, both in the consistent back and forth of the decisions, the movement with the court decision at such a quick pace, uh, but also in the way that we're uh, engaging with the camp in general, we're treating them like they're dangerous criminals. And this is a reality that makes it almost impossible to build relationships of trust between people experiencing homelessness and the city. Now, it's great to hear that there are 88 people that have signed up to move into vouchers. That's fantastic. But if I was someone who was experiencing homelessness and was th faced with the threat of a court order and potential arrest if I don't move my stuff, I'm going to move my things and be much more amenable to be doing it. So I just want to say that. Uh, the other issue is during the ex parte application, the timings associated with it, and all of this that comes together makes it really difficult for people to engage, especially this idea of criminality, because there are people in there that I personally believe uh, do not and have not uh, broken the law. Would you mind uh, putting those images up on the screen for me, Bonnie? So I wanna share a couple images as well. The first one, is uh, the first two, I should say, I think. I should put them up. Oh, wonderful, thank you. Uh, the first two are, are um, images that pertain to the posting of the original documents, uh, letting people know about what's going on. Uh, will you go to the next slide? It's a little bit better. Oh, thank you. 
So uh, this is an issue of the relationship and the optics that go along with the great work that the staff has done with trying to engage and participate with people, but the message that we're sending while we're doing it. If I could just for clarification, is this something you're, you're using as an in, as a visual to have a point be made, or is this a proposal? I'm not. I wasn't aware that there was going to be a presentation of. This isn't. This is just sharing. So instead of me printing out documents because I really don't like printing out and wasting paper, I figured I would just share. A few images. images for your observations. Yeah, okay. and then also to share my perspective with my colleagues. Okay, and then Councilmember Crone, and then Councilmember Brown, you'll go next. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next. Next. Can, can you just press next for me? Because this isn't working. It fell earlier. There we go, excellent. Okay, so here's a better picture of just the sheer volume of police and uh, ranger representatives to deliver and put together uh, the postings of the notices, I think it was for the ex parte actions as well as the planned um, removal of people starting on Tuesday at 10. Just there in that image, if you're someone experiencing homelessness and already have an aversion to police and or fire for whatever reasons, whether it be trauma-based or whether it be from previous experiences, that in itself is gonna send a message. Go to the next slide, please. On the contrary, this last Sunday, I coordinated a gathering with people in the community to be able to meet and engage with people in the camp. This is a picture of egg dying. Next slide, please. With people from all different ages. Next slide, please. Uh, we served food, we had intergenerational people, it was a great opportunity, people that came to differing political views but left appreciative of the opportunity. Next slide, please. And we were able to die over 100 and some odd eggs, sharing and engaging and talking and having fun. It was a great opportunity. And I bet you that if we were taking these kinds of approaches towards addressing the issue of homelessness and city engagement, we would have a lot more of a possibility of engaging positively with people instead of cr criminalizing them and make them feel bad. <laughs> Two more slides, I believe. Oh, so here's a shot from the behind. And then next, please. And then next, please. And then next, please, that's my favorite shot right there. Next, please. Okay, so, and every time I go to the camp, and this is where I'm, I'm always really confused about this whole process and cleanup and the statements that things aren't happening and they're planning on happening, is that every time I go to the camp, or most times I go to the camp, people are there to greet me with these kinds of suggestions. Their acknowledgments about the issues that are going on in the camp and their clear ideas of how they can make it so it's better. Next slide, please. They even draw me schematics of how the camp can be structured and how it can be set up. So I find it really, really hard to believe that it's been impossible for us to be working with the people of the camp to do a, uh, a joint solution to figure out what's going on when I have these kinds of interactions with them whenever I'm down there. So uh, I wanna emphasize that when we're talking about the relocation of the people in the camp and the potential closure, because if we close it, the people that have thought about this, that have lived there, that are experiencing it, they are going to be, as has been mentioned before, displaced or forced to go into other locations. Um, I. Th what's being proposed today, the permanent closure of the camp has been done over and over again over the last decade in Santa Cruz. And I think we found that it doesn't work. We need to be innovative instead of being stuck in past models of criminalization and shooing people away from one place to another. So I was just doing, because we're all required to as council members, uh, participate in an ethics training, which is great. I did it for- Okay, this is the chance for uh, council to, to deliberate. We've heard from the community. Thank you. Okay, that's okay. Go ahead. Uh, the, issue of uh, it not working, ethics training, right. So uh, I recently went through an ethics training, which I also had to do for the Commission for the Prevention of Violence Against Women. And uh, I mean, in reality, all of us have gone through this training supposedly, or we're all have supposed to have gone through this training. And something that is consistent among all ethics trainings and literary scholars that study ethics is that just because something is legal does not make it morally or ethically defensible with regards to what you're doing. What we're, com what we're talking about right now is not only morally wrong, it's legally ambitious or uh, ambiguous. Yes, we have our uh, judge order thing, but the 
uh, plaintiffs have submitted the, uh, P, uh, the TRO in federal court for Friday. So why are we not going to at least wait until the federal courts have an opportunity to make their decision before we move ahead with forceful removal of people from the, from the facility, especially if we minus 88 people and their belongings and their tents from that area, that should loosen up the density and allow us to start looking at fire code safeties and other kinds of things. I'll remind my colleagues that the Holocaust was legal, slavery was legal, Jim Crow was legal, segregation was legal, and concentration camps for the Japanese Americans were legal. Apartheid was legal in South Africa. So not even referring, and this, this gets back to my first point about dehumanization, not even referring to the gateway participants as people. People have, we've adopted this term campers, which is, in my opinion, rather derogatory. They are people that are living in the Ross camp. And the more that we start to come up with these nicknames and these terms drives us farther and farther away from acknowledging their people. We need to be focusing on their dignity. We need to be focusing on their human rights. And there are other people like Jordana, I can't even pronounce her last name, Jordana G. She's the founder of the Nylon Project. And it started as a college project of figuring out how you can have a coat that turns into a sleeping bag to provide shelter. Why are we not working with the university filled with new innovative minds and energy up there to partner with the city to come up with solutions instead of trying to push people around and criminalize those experiencing homelessness? We need to spend time designing with the people of the camp, of the people experiencing homelessness because they know what they need. And what I really think we need to understand is the importance of understanding their thoughts and feelings, not just where they're from, their birth dates, and whether they have pets or animals or partners, but who are they? Why are they here? What are they doing? How are they needing support? And what can we do to support them, as was mentioned by the other person whose uh, bank account was emptied from HUD and lost their housing, and we, it was a really easy person to help. So I encourage us to partner with local businesses. I encourage us to think outside the box. I'm gonna be voting against this motion today, and I'm actually going to be putting together a substitute motion which would delay the closure of the Ross camp until the federal hearing this Friday at 9 a.m. Okay. Yeah. 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 So, with, so with that, uh, and knowing that I'm not going to do it, I'm just going to pause for a moment and then officially uh, put that forward as a motion to delay the closure of the Ross camp until after the federal hearing this Friday uh, at 9 a.m. So we have a motion by Councilmember Glover to delay the closure of the Ross camp until f after Friday's hearing. Is there a second? Second. Mr. Condotti? No, okay, so we have a substitute motion made by Councilmember Glover, a seconded by Councilmember Crone. Uh, further discussion? Question for clarification. Council Councilmember Brown. Multiple motions on the floor? Or do we just? We can have up to three motions on the floor at okay. one time, Thank I believe, you. and we can vote on the substitute motion prior to returning back to the original motion, is my understanding. We'll go ahead and pause and let our city attorney clarify for us if that's appropriate. And my Councilor understanding Matthews. is that this is a motion, what we are voting on is whether or not to consider the motion, not on the substance of the motion itself. That's correct. Okay. You're voting on whether to accept the substitute motion. Okay, so there's a motion and a second. And if I might reword that motion, Mayor. Councilmember Glover, you can restate your motion. Thank you, I'd like to just clarify for the record. The motion uh, is to delay the decision on whether or not to close the Ross camp until after the federal hearing this Friday at 9 a.m. Okay, there's a motion by Councilmember Glover, seconded by Councilmember Crone. Um, the vote on the, set of, on the substitute motion, all those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? No. No. So that fails with Councilmember Brown, Councilmember Crone, Councilmember Glover voting in support, Councilmember Matthews, Vice Mayor Cummings, Myers, and myself voting against. So we'll go now back to the original motion on the floor made by Councilmember Matthew, I'm sorry, Councilmember Myers and myself as the question for debate at this time. And I'll remind uh, council members that the, uh, to, uh, the issue before us is regarding the closure of the camp and to confine if, uh, you know, as appropriate the consideration of that at this time. Councilmember Crone and then Councilmember Brown. Thank you, a couple of questions for um, Ms. O'Hara. Uh, I'm just wondering, I'm, I'm kudos for 88 people signing up. Uh, I think that's wonderful because I, I don't think, you know, just in response to some people who said, you know, the, what's going on in the camp as far as you know, cleaning it, I think there's a lot of a recognition that, that yes, the camp needs to be clean, but 
uh, you know, some people wanted the camp, the folks who lived there to, you know, join in that effort uh, versus the city just coming in wholesale. Um, I wanted to go over the numbers when you said um, the resources like VFW, how many people can stay there, Laurel Street and 1220 River Street. Yeah, so our forecast for River Street Camp is 80 sites, sorry, 60 sites. Um, we are in the process of determining how many double occupancy tents we will have at that site. Um, we are finding a large portion of the folks that are moving to the bench lands are interested in doubling up. That actually may increase our numbers over there um, up to say 20 double occupancy sites. So now we're looking at 80, even maybe more than that. 80 to 90 people at 1220. Um, in terms of the capacity at the VFW and Laurel, that does change daily, but I know that we do have additional capacity even from a week ago. Um, if you're interested, Captain Harold did make his way over here, so he can talk a little bit more about those resources and the um, really the the commitment that Salvation Army has to um, being flexible and really meeting the needs of those individuals that are at the camp um, through across these programs. Both of those, the VFW and Laurel, VFW has a capacity of 60. Um, that is not the, the open capacity at this time. I'll have Captain Harold talk about that. And Laurel has a capacity of 40 to 50. Um, that is, again, not the open. Um, my understanding from our conversation with Captain Harold last week that there are about 40 to 50 beds that are available between those two programs. So if you count 1220, uh, VFW and Laurel, you know, we're anywhere from between 120 and 130 people that we can accommodate. We've had previous discussions at council as to the potential of using hotel vouchers. We have a, a hotel um, here in Santa Cruz who is equally committed to helping the city out, very flexible in um, really delivering what we need. So really when it comes down to ensuring that we have those individual, individualized conversations with the people at the bench lands, we'll have a better understanding of what the appropriate kind of next steps are for each of them. So a woman came to the podium and did a count yesterday. She got up to 280 to 300 people she thinks could be in that camp. Is that no, that, no way? That's inaccurate. Okay. How, how yeah. many would, would you say? Uh, I'm still say 150 um, at the max. Okay. So just what is what would be plan B if there's an excess number of persons um, and that don't fit into VFW Laurel Street and 1220? Also knowing that VFW and Laurel Street are, are not really day centers either. They're just like you sleep there overnight, right? And then you have to leave. You have to be there by a certain hour. Whereas I'm assuming 1220 would be more of a, a place where people could... could a day center. Yeah, so uh, the resources that we have that we talk about all the time are not the only resources that are available for, for our residents of the Gateway Encampment. Um, you know, Sonny, who was up here, has been searching for housing for months. He just, you know, is has an interview for Paige Smith today or tomorrow. Those are resources that are coming along online for individuals at any given minute. Um, so what we really are committed to doing, as I mentioned a couple minutes ago, is ensuring that we um, have a full, you know, uh, case kind of wraparound services for folks at the bench lands. The county has committed to bringing in HPHP um, to help us with this. People will be eligible for things that we are not talking about today. Um, you know, there is mental health beds. There are SUD um, sober living environment beds. You know, really the intention is to meet everybody's individual needs as we understand them. So the, the, the bed count that we're talking about with regard to the Salvation Army programs, quite frankly, is really just the tip of the iceberg. Um, and so the plan B is really looking across that spectrum of resources and then also um, deploying those ho hotel vouchers if those Salvation Army beds and every other bed that we have available in our county is fully exhausted. I, I uh, was at the camp with six other people yesterday um, and we interviewed folks and did various counts, three different counts. Um, we got anywhere bef between 147 to 179 tent structures. And as somebody said, uh, our officer mentioned there was probably two in, in, a, in a, the tents that are occupied and maybe three in the larger, the larger tents. Um, it's um, it, it kind of, I, I, I don't, uh, people told us that they were told that they would move to the bench lands and then be allowed to move back. And that was the word that was going out amongst folks from the city. I'm sorry, move to the bench lines and then move back to Camp Ross, Gateway Camp. Is that information that our staff is giving out or where where did, did people get this information from? 
Absolutely, that is information that we have been giving out because we were not in a position to talk about what this council would be deliberating on today. Okay, so if you thought reasonably how many people would be able to fit at the Gateway Camp um, if, if it was cleaned up and um, fire protected and in, within the parameters that we've been thinking about. So the fire chief has also laid out the gateway encampment and the intentionality is to create as many spaces there as we currently have um, and really, you know, ensuring that we have a, that 12 foot separation and, and plotting it out in the way that creates those health and safety st standards that we um, How need. many spaces was that? I don't have the piece of paper in front of me, but you know, I think we have counted as of uh, yesterday about 140 tents out there. Um, so that would be the intention. And um, I just want to say that with, with the folks doing, you know, everybody with advanced college degrees, <laughs> um, counting and, and nobody came up with a number that they thought, uh, they thought conservatively 200 people were out there. And that, that's just what, what we came up with. And I just want to put that out there because I think that we're not, I share um, the, council, uh, the vice mayor's uh, skepticism, he said at, at the beginning um, of whether we will be able to uh, house um, the uh, every, everybody. Um, I uh, was extremely touched by folks who came to uh, the microphone today as I um, also noticed, and that's why I supported Councilmember Glover on a three minutes, that the, the quality of remarks um, last time we did that was uh, Unbelievable! I, I was I was really um, surprised at how much how thoughtful folks were, and the people who wanted to speak in one minute spoke. Um, the woman who spoke from the tannery today, I, I, I don't think there's anyone up here that does not share um, uh, wanting to clean the the Ross camp. And um, I thought it was telling the, the guy from Five Guys Burger who um, lives in his car. Uh, who also has been through a lot and is, is, shares our skepticism of having a camp, but said that uh, you are going to put that element on everybody. And, and that's, that's what I've been hearing from a lot of neighbors on the west side and the east side. Um, Mr. Hall said you face a humanitarian crisis and that you wanna eject people from a camp without having adequate transitional housing. I, that, that, that's my, my greatest fear here, although I do support moving folks to the, um, uh, the bench lands. Uh, Mr. Gasser wanted us to make sure we keep it the eye on the prize, the people, and not the Martin versus Boise. That maybe should be second. Um, and I think Mr. Brown summed it up about the time here, about many hardworking people from the tannery not being able to be here because they're at their jobs. Uh, and I think the, the whole thing about inherent dignity and inalienable rights from the um, UN Declaration of Human Rights. Um, and uh, what, that we, we're not willing to be kicked out during the day. Uh, that's, that's the problem, is day center. That's what I hear missing from a lot of our conversations, that we have enough bed spaces, but where will people be during the day? They won't necessarily be where they want to be, but they will be um, on Pacific Avenue, they'll be um, in various neighborhoods uh, that they don't necessarily want to be. Um, I thought, uh, what we need to come out of this, and I think should be part of maybe a substitute motion, is that we cl actually clean the camp and have an accurate population count and a census, and that we track our success. I was overjoyed to hear uh, Ms. O'Hara talk about the data that's been collected. I, I think that is uh, key to any, um, in any process moving forward to actually get a grip on well, who is homeless, why are they homeless, and how we can we direct them to, to services. Somebody said that there are only 16 uh, mental health beds. Is that, is that accurate, uh, Susie? 16 in the... So that's detox beds. Detox, yeah. so how many mental health um, programs do you say we have in, 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 in the county now? I mean, maybe that's uh, too much. So mental health or behavior, like substance abuse or mental health or both? Both. You know, I don't have that figure, but I know that between um, the, the resources that we have at Encompass, Janus, um, and the other uh, SUD programs, you know, there is a significant shortage of beds in our community. And the detox beds is, is quite frankly where we have um, that funnel. Because um, people that are, you know, either um, abusing alcohol or particularly heroin, they need detox in order to move on to residential programs. So I do think that's an important conversation for this, for this council to have. And I know that there's other council members who um, would be interested in engaging on that. 
thank you. And I, I know we're always thinking about, well, people tell us what not to do, tell us what to do. A lot of folks leave that part out, just tell us what not to do. I really was impressed by Serge talking about um, having transparent conversations and including law enforcement, the fire department on a committee, any committee that we're gonna have to set up with the, the committee of experts, um, create an expert draft of recommendation and then go out to the community and say, what do you think? That, I think that was an excellent suggestion uh, and move, um, the, the determination to October, I think that's what he said, before the winter uh, shelter is needed and before the winter begins. I wanna thank um, uh, Rabbi Posner too and pointing out our dog parks because I, I, I really like those dog parks, but he made a very um, uh, poignant uh, statement about having, you know, we're letting the dog, we're, we're, we have a lot of good dog parks, but, um, and Mr. Graham said about being honest with campers, and that's what I'm really focused on too, and that's why I brought it up to Ms. O'Hara's attention that people have been told they will be able to move back, uh, and I, I wanna be, you know, honest to what our staff has been um, maybe telling folks, and what I got from people yesterday as well. Um, I, I wanna, last two, last two comments are, I really want to hand it to my colleague, uh, Drew Glover. Um, it took me a couple years to figure out um, the, uh, what I will call deceptive nature of um, agenda review and how agendas are put together and he has figured it out and continues to articulate that. I'm really proud of you, Drew. And um, also the power dynamics uh, over that. And, um, you, and the stuff that he's putting out and for solution oriented um, and protecting rights and the power dynamics that exist. I mean, showing a slide, you know, it is really hard when you are the most vulnerable and you're confronting these, you know, uh, amazing um, resources that the community has, but they're using those resources, what appears to be using them against you. And I just wanna point that out. I think that if we, um, I'm gonna support uh, uh, folks moving to the bench lands, cleaning up the camp, um, and, cr and, and if we don't do that, we're gonna create insecurity for people. Uh, we're gonna cause homeless people to um, go to places that they were before. The one that I always jog by alongside Holy Cross used to be up to 30 tents there at any given time last year. Since the Ross camp, it's, it's been cleaned up, and uh, I'm assuming people have either moved on or gone to the Ross camp. Um, and I don't wanna, I think having a camp actually also concentrates folks into a place you can get them services and you want them to be near uh, the homeless services center, for example. Um, that's why I think it's important that we maintain some sort of um, overflow capacity that we're saying, I think there's, if there's 150 to 200, we should be preparing for you know that many, at least 200 to 250. And I think keeping the 1220, the Ross camp, and the other venues at VFW and um, Laurel Street open, that would provide us with some, uh, some time to uh, continue to work these things out. Thank you very much, Mayor. Yeah. Yeah. Brown. I, so I have a question. I would like to hear a little bit about the uh, plans for the operations at the River Street Camp, um, because one of the major issues of concern to me is, is related to um, obviously access and um, particularly with respect to ingress and egress for people who you know work odd hours, have need to come and go. Um, I, I do wanna hear more about that. So um, while we have the opportunity, it would be helpful. And then I do have some comments after that. Yeah, so the transportation at River Street Camp 2.0 <laughs> will be the same as the previous program. So between the hours of 7 a.m. and 9 p.m., there will be um, nearly hourly shuttle service. What we found um, during the last iteration of the River Street Camp is there are plenty of people who have jobs that fall outside of those hours. We have we made accommodations for every single person. So, you know, while walk-on, walk-offs, on mass is challenging for the neighborhood. Um, once the community is established and we understand people's schedules, there's absolutely, flexi ab absolutely flexibility to ensure that people have, can access those services. Uh, well, we're in charge, the city's doing the transportation, but you should hear from Captain Harold because he's, he's here and he, he's, he's really amazing. I would like to hear, Captain Harold, if you don't mind, just coming up and telling us a little bit about the plans. <clears throat> and thank you for taking this on. Don't thank me yet. Um, 
Oh my, okay, so concerning River Street and transportation on and off, so as, as Susie noted, uh, we do, our staff in all of our locations do go essentially on a case-by-case -case basis when it comes to uh, families, uh, whether it be taking children to school, picking children up, uh, going to, uh, people going to employment, though some have vehicles, some do not. So in every case, uh, all we assure is that uh, whatever the need is, is, is uh, documented. So if they have, uh, what we, we simply ask if they have a work schedule, we ask them for the work schedule when they get it. They tell when they get it, so we realize what hours they're going to come or go on or off the property. Completely uh, doable, that's, that's no problem whatsoever. River Street will operate the same way. Um, so we don't, we don't uh, come up against many issues when it comes to transportation. We do see the inherent risk of walk-ons and walk-offs in all of our locations, and therefore um, the programs that we put in place so far with both with having external security and with uh, providing uh, busing on and off every property every morning and every afternoon, um, we have negated just about every community concern so far when it comes to um, people hanging out in other, someone's neighborhood or uh, neighborhood, uh, whatever, car theft, things like that, that tend to increase when you have um, a large population just, just hanging around somebody's front yard. So uh, that doesn't happen around any of our properties. It doesn't happen at the VFW. It doesn't happen at 721 Laurel Street. And, um, so I think uh, with the uh, different security, can, the security precautions that we've taken so far, we've addressed most, most of those issues. And uh, because of the flexibility with our, with our staff and uh, timing, uh, we've addressed most of the issues when it comes to employment and schooling of children and things like that as well. Oh, what about the, um, uh, Mr. Vice Mayor? Um, what about um, the bench lands? What kind of security or issues do you think going on there? Are you gonna proceed in the same way you are going to at 1220 or is it a different uh, plan? Uh, similar, very similar. So, so it's uh, be a fence property that does not allow walk-ons and walk-offs except through a controlled entry point. So we can monitor who comes on, who comes off. We can monitor um, uh, whether it be medical emergencies, uh, all, um, law enforcement calls, things like that. So yes, those things can be monitored. Um, at the same time, uh, all of the same services that we currently use or utilize in all of our other things, whether it be the partnership with HPHP and uh, for, for medical, um, for wound care or for medical referrals, uh, for vaccinations, all those things like that, we utilize HPHP in every shelter that we have here in the county, which is three currently. And uh, not, not just them, we, we utilize uh, services from Wings and, and, and Encompass and HSC and, and uh, we have um, relationships ongoing every day with uh, Polly Loft and the Roland, uh, the Reveille Family Center. And I believe I, I shared with um, uh, Councilman Cummings the other day, I, we have a partner list of uh, 23 different agencies that we work with weekly just here in, in the county. The last question is, yeah. if you were called upon to manage both the 1220 um, and, a, a, and a future encampment behind Ross, would you be able to do that? At current staffing levels, no. I would need at least, I'm gonna say 60 days to, to uh, acquire enough staff to operate two camps at one time. Thank you, thank you, Mayor. Okay. Oh, I ceded the floor to allow for questions, but I do wanna make my comments. Thank you, Mr. Brown. Okay, okay, so. You want um, so I really try not to use this space to hold forth about my broader views on issues Related to the agenda microphone? items we consider here. Sorry. Um, so I really try not to use the space to hold forth about my broader perspectives on the issues uh, related, broader issues related to agenda items that we consider here. Um, I try to be very specific to the agenda item at hand. Um, but I'm going to make an exception today because um, I really feel the need to respond more broadly to some of the assertions being made by members of the public. Um, and kind of the broader constellation of, of challenges that we are facing here. I am sad, I am frustrated, I wanna scream. Thank you, Barbara Riverwoman, for screaming on my behalf. I'm not gonna do that, um, but it's that kind of day. Um, so, I'm dismayed by the assertions and implications that um, we, from members of the public, that we on the council who support safe spaces for people to sleep, and those who, of us who are defending <coughs> human and constitutional rights of unhoused people, that we're somehow enabling them. Um, 
I just disagree, and I have all kinds of reasons why. I'm happy to talk with anybody about that and debate that, but I just do not think that evidence suggests that you know, supporting people's human, basic human rights and constitutional rights um, and, and wanting to work in solidarity with them um, and support of them is enabling. Um, I'm just made by the conflation of the presence of unhoused people in our neighborhoods with increased dangers. I understand there are concerns, and I, I don't want to disrespect people who come forward with legitimate concerns, but there's kind of this implication that anywhere that unhoused people go, danger and crime ensues. And I just don't think that the data I've reviewed, the evidence I've reviewed, um, particularly with respect to transitional camps, supports that. So I just disagree, I'm going to agree to disagree with you all who, but, and I'm dismayed about that contention. Um, I'm dismayed um, that this has become such a contentious issue um, in our community among ver people who I believe are all, are mostly very well-meaning. Um, and I look forward to working with, with members of the community moving forward because this is not the, the, the final act, um, action that we will take on this, this matter. Um, I'm also dismayed by the, um, by the uh, really dismayed by what I consider to be strong arm tactics of the county, the agency, the entity, um, the jurisdiction that has control over the kinds of resources um, that we need, that we so critically need to, to provide critical shelter space and, and supportive services. Um, that if we don't vote for a permanent camp closure today, um, we will lose access to other resources. I'm, I'm, just, I'm just very dismayed about that. And, um, and, and I want to acknowledge that that's, that's happening. Um, others may view it differently, but that's what I, I see when I look at the, the balance of, of evidence here. Um, You know, there is an optics question here. Um, and we hear from people who visit the camp or, you know, have ideas about what the camp is like um, that may be exaggerated on all sides. The reality is people see what they want to see. Some people see rats and needles and despair, um, you know, and, and scary activity, scary um, people. You know, that's not what I see. I don't see needles. Well, I've seen a few needles, but I don't see needles just like everywhere when I visit that, the camp. I don't see, um, uh, you know, rampant, um, you know, dangerous activity. Um, I'm sure it's there. Um, that's not to disrespect those who have those concerns and are trying to do their best to address them. You know, what I see is guys like Kevin, who calls himself one of the original levee dwellers. He started living on the levee in 1973 when his house burned down when he was eight years old. And he's had a lot of practice at, in, in, at living outside, you know, on the margins in our community um, and, and in mutual aid, you know, situations with other people. That's what people really expressed. When I go there, that's what they express they want is they want to be able to be in a space where they can support each other. That, that is, a, there's a, tr and you know, there are some people who are not there for that reason, but that is a, a huge factor. I mean, many people that I've spoken with, the, the vast majority of people that I have spoken with, that's what they want. A space where they can, they can identify each other, they can find each other, they can, they can be in, in, you know, I mean, Kevin, who, while we were talking yesterday, gave the shoes off of his feet to another, camp resident to run down to the county building um, so a guy who had to go to court for, on another matter had shoes to enter the courtroom. It's an anecdotal experience, but I don't think it's um, you know, unique. These are the kinds of, of things that people do for each other when they can be, um, they can be together in a safe space. Um, I could say a lot more about Kevin and some of the other people that I've met um, and so, you know, the myths and facts that um, a member of our community who was out there with me yesterday, Barbara a River Woman, who was here today, um, put together about the camp, but I, I won't. Um, I do think that we have our he heads in the sand about the lack of adequate shelter alternatives. 
I think it's genius, disingenuous to say that we take this, you know, we need to take this action because no one should have to live this way. When the alternatives we are giving them are constrained with respect to um, the, the spaces that they can go to, limited in numbers, limited in um, terms of ingress and egress and other, other factors. I appreciate, um, Sergeant Harold, that you've said, um, Sergeant Harold? Captain. Captain Harold, I'm sorry, I, I knew I was gonna get that wrong. Captain Harold, that you wanna work with, um, with folks, and I, I, I really appreciate that, so I don't wanna discount that, but I do think that there are still challenges, um, you know, and I've heard about many of them over the years. Um, the other option being dispersal back into the neighborhoods, into the streets, where um, people are hard to find, they're atomized, you know, they, they can't protect each other, they can't support each other. And that is the reality of what is going to happen. I just, I'm, and, and with all due respect to, and you know, and, and, and really kudos to, the, to our staff who have worked really, really, really hard and with really good intention to come up with viable solutions, alternatives, we, to an intractable problem, we just don't have alternatives. And for that reason, I cannot support the action today to permanently close the Ross camp. Yeah. <laughs> Vice Mayor Cummings, Councilmember Myers, and then uh, City Attorney Kondati, okay. There's been a lot of information and sentiment from all members of our community on this issue, and I want to thank all the members of the community for reaching out and expressing how they feel about this. Um, before I actually say anything, I actually had another question for Susie, if you had an opportunity. I was just curious what some, there, there was a mention of other alternatives, and I was just curious what those other alternatives are in, in, in addition to 1220 and um, the VFW Hall and the Laurel Street Shelter. Yeah, so um, the Poly Loft has 40 beds. Uh, we had, for instance, a woman that showed up to the Gateway Encampment yesterday who currently has a bed at the loft who wanted to move to the Benchlands. <laughs> so there, there is just a lot of uh, movement um, day by day with our shelter beds. There are um, substance use disorder programs that have beds. There are mental health beds as well. Um, there is the AFC rotating shelter that has, that has beds. Um, the Salvation Army has um, a free substance use disorder program in, in San Jose. I don't know how many beds are there. Seven open beds um, over the hill. Um, we have, um, when I was managing the PACT program, we had a number of people that elected to move into that. That's a six month program that provides free substance use disorder treatment and housing. Um, so in addition to that, there are homeward bound options for folks. Um, what, somebody on the camp council who has spoken many times um, to this council was expressing interest in homeward bound to Sacramento. Um, um, last Friday when we were there doing outreach. You know, I think when people are, um, you know, at a place where they must make a decision, those decisions become very diverse and very depending on not only the resources that people have in front of them, but their individualized needs at that time. And so, you know, across the spectrum of shelter opportunities, and in addition to that, we have, um, we have uh, about 50 uh, hotel vouchers in our hands right now. I think we could double that number easily. Um, so we, we do really have a, a number of different opportunities for people and it really does get down to what are those individualized needs um, and how can we best meet those needs. I guess to follow up, I think I have the same question that some other folks are kind of murmuring in the background, which is how many days um, would those vouchers be for? They can be for as many days as this council is interested in providing. I might have a couple of questions. Thank you very much. I might have a couple of questions for Captain Harold. I was just wondering if you could comment on um, barriers to entry, because I think some folks are concerned with um, Salvation Army shelters 
um, in other states restricting people based on their gender, based on um, their sexual orientation. And so I wonder if you could speak to that a little bit. And also um, some folks are concerned about uh, pets as well as barriers. Pets. Pets. Okay. Um, so for, I'd start off by saying don't believe everything you read on the internet. Right. So, um, uh, and I won't say that there's that no Salvation Army unit has any employees that uh, that may have uh, biases or, or um, racist issues. I, I I don't know of any organization, including government, that could uh, guarantee that none of their employees ever do anything wrong or whatever. That said. The Salvation Army, uh, specifically in the United States and more specifically in uh, Central California, has for the last few years done a um, remarkable job uh, putting out um, both press releases and personal accounts of uh, people from the, LGBT the LGBTQ community both being employed by our agency and, um, and participating in our adult rehabilitation centers, which are the drug and alcohol treatment centers, uh, as well as our different housing programs, uh, transitional housing programs from everywhere, from, from LA to Eureka and, and, and every place in between. Uh, so, so that said, um, again, um, the bad things that hit, that hit the, the, uh, the media and, uh, and the internet uh, are not always believable. I, we all know that, right? We're, we're adults. Um, at the same time, uh, many, many years ago when uh, there was a, a very large public issue in another country that made it to our internet issues here about uh, the behavior of one person in, in another country that did something like that, um, again, what we forget is it was in another country and it was one time 10 years ago and sure enough, I still get reminded uh, annually on my, on my uh, my internet media um, about that. People, they, they drag it up, they bring, you know, they, they forward me things, is this true? Uh, our our uh, public relations department have put out, uh, you know, videos and, and uh, different things like that on what our stance is. There is, there is no uh, discrimination and or bias in any program that I operate or that I am currently aware of in California for anyone based on uh, uh, gender orientation, on, on, um, income or, or disability or, or anything like that. So while we are a faith-based organization and we refuse to back away from that, the services that we offer are generally speaking not faith-based. And, and we receive many uh, contracts from different local uh, cities, county, state agencies that would uh, immediately stop if, they, if we were ever found to be in violation of any of those discrimination policies, right? So, uh, so I can say it doesn't happen here. It doesn't happen as far as I know of. In the off case that it does happen, the employees are dealt with in the legal way that you deal with employee disciplinary issues. And could you also refer to uh, pets? Oh, pets, uh, yeah. <laughs> so generally speaking, in all of our shelters currently, our pet, uh, our pet guidelines are uh, that, it ha that the pet has to stay leashed inside while you're inside the building. Um, that, uh, of course, obviously, for the legal reasons, we accept um, uh, service animals, but even we, we accept support animals as well. So, uh, so as long as it's leashed and it's not, uh, and it's not uh, you know, combative and, and you know, biting, things like that, I don't have a problem with pets. We have, uh, we have right now in our, in our at-risk shelter down in 721, at least three of our residents uh, bring their pets with them nightly. So not a, pr not a problem with that. And then thank you, thank you very much. Anytime. Um, and I have one more question for Susie. I think a number of folks have been concerned with um, like what comes next because 1220 is only going to be open till the end of June. And I think it's um, something that folks are concerned about with you know what's going to happen once June hits. And I was wondering if you could speak to that at all. So we are in the process, um, this is Homeless Action Partnership, really um, that is coordinated through the county on working with the Salvation Army on the extension of VFW as well as Laurel. Um, at this point, I think there is interest and readiness to move forward in that direction. There's a lot of different players that are involved in that um, and we don't have that fully solidified at this point. Um, in terms of 1220 River Street, you know, it really has been the intention of the Homeless Action Partnership through the funding through HEAP and CASH to ensure that we have a transitional um, 
shelter or an interim shelter as quickly as we possibly can. Um, that is part of the city and the county joint action plan is to move forward with that. You know, our intention is to, as soon as we have this um, issue managed and dealt with, is to move um, as qu quickly as we can to ensure that those beds are available and ready to go. Um, I think we're in a position to say that, you know, we need to right. ensure that- I'm sorry to interrupt. Oops. Um, yeah. Thanks. Mr. Condotti. Uh, Susie and Mayor, but I have some important information I want to share with the council at this okay. time. Uh, Mayor, please. We were just served with a, uh, an order from the U.S. District Court in the Quintero case. Uh, I'll just read it, um, or at least the holding of it. Okay. Uh, we, yeah. it, it states, think, yes. given the urgency of this matter, the city of Santa Cruz, its officers, agents, and employees are hereby restrained from taking any action whatsoever Go ahead. or seize or destroy personal property belonging to the homeless persons currently residing at the Ross camp until further action of the court. Yeah. A hearing on this matter is scheduled for 9 a.m. on April 26, 2019. Um, we were aware of the hearing um, this morning that was scheduled for the, the Friday, but we were not aware of the TRO until it was just issued by the court a few minutes ago. <laughs> and so uh, I want to make sure that whatever course of action the council directs this afternoon, um, hey, hey. It, it will not. A motion that's. There's a, few, should, there's a few other folks that have been acknowledged before. You. Should the council um, move forward with the direction to close the encampment, it will not be implemented, uh, or at least the. Uh, order that was issued by Judge Burdick yesterday will not be implemented until after the court hearing on Friday morning. So, uh, for clarification, the delay would be um, essentially to af till after Friday to move forward with the plan that was already previously set into place, but not necessarily changing any of the recommendation to, upon if approved on Friday, to move forward with a new location at 1220 River Street as opposed to returning back to the Gateway Camp. It doesn't impact that. It, it would not unless the judge extends the order beyond the sure. Friday hearing date, but that's right. Okay, the motions would still apply. Okay, Councilmember Myers. I'd like to call a question then on the motion on the floor. Okay, sweet. Councilmember Matthews. Um, I have not spoken yet. I'm gonna be very brief. I think the campsite as it uh, has evolved before and- Before you do it, we have a motion to call the question. Oh, excuse me. We have a motion to call the question, so we'll go ahead and take a vote on the motion on the floor. Is there a second? A second, I'll, se I'll second that. Second. Okay, um, so we'll go ahead and take the, we'll take the motion that we have currently existing at this time. Okay. Let's call the question. Yep. Uh, all those in favor of the motion, would you, would you like to repeat the motion for clarification? The motion is to direct the city manager to implement the city council approved standard operating procedures for a permanent closure of the gateway encampment with a target closure date of April 30th, 2019, and coinciding with the opening of the 1220 River Street Camp and convert the temporary relocation of the gateway encampment at the benchlands under the existing council directed site management plan to a permanent closure and direct benchland occupants to alternate shelter sites at 1220 River Street, VFW, Laurel Street, and any other available shelter beds in the county at the earliest possible time to ensure full access of the benchlands for upcoming scheduled events. And this will be dependent on any outcomes that happen with the court proceedings on yeah. Friday, correct? Should the motion carry, then yes, it would be, um, it would not be implemented until at least after the hearing on Friday right. okay. morning. That makes That's sense. Right. Okay. Okay. So we have the motion stated. Councilmember Brown? Calling the question. Calling the question. Yep. All those in the, the, this is But the, that's okay. the motion that we're voting on is not the motion that was just stated. Yes. The motion is mm -hmm. to call the, the question. Yes. Well, so I'd like to let my council colleague, um, Councilmember Matthews, speak before I vote, but mm -hmm. just call the okay. question. Do you want to do you want to resend the, the motion to call the question and allow Councilmember Matthews to vote? I'm fine. She's fine. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All those, okay, so we have a motion on the floor. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Nay. No. So that fails with Councilmember Brown, Vice Mayor Cummings, Councilmember Crone, and Councilmember Glover voting against. <laughs> Councilmember Matthews, Myers, and myself voting in support. Councilmember Matthews, Myers, and myself voting in support. Okay. All right. Susie. So we need some clarity on what to do with the 
now about 95 people that are moving to the bench lands. I just wanna make sure that the council has some understanding as to next steps with that. So um, I think you should have a discussion. I mean, I think we're in a position of, um, in, we're in a position of making distinction between volu a voluntary exit, of which we are now nearly up to 100 people who are voluntarily exiting to the bench lands versus what I, my, what I understand the council is considering with the court order or the TRO is a question around involuntary removal. So I just would ask for some clarity around that. Okay. I'll go ahead and have Councilmember Matthews and then we will return to Councilmember Glover for comments if you'd like at this time and then we'll go ahead. And I just it. want to say very briefly, I think the campsite. I can hear you. Louder. I, really? Am I not on? Okay, the campsite as it has evolved and now exists is uh, currently not tenable. Um, it is, I think, demonstrably unsafe. The uh, impacts on the surrounding neighborhoods and businesses are also unacceptable. They're demonstrable and unacceptable. We are all, I think wherever you are on the spectrum, uh, searching for solutions that work. Uh, these take time. Right now, we're dealing with emergency situations. We are committed to longer term solutions as well. We recognize the complexity of populations uh, involved in this broader issue and the scarcity of resources. I want to particularly acknowledge the extremely diligent work of our staff and the good faith of our partners, particularly impressed with how the Salvation Army has stepped up to this. Um, I uh, am supportive of the motion that was previously uh, on the floor uh, for consideration. I am concerned that we are being left in an absolute limbo right now. I understand that Council Member Cummings has additional questions. Uh, I understand the staff truly needs uh, direction, and um, I might even suggest uh, if we are at some kind of an impasse, if it would help to go back into closed session for consideration as well. Vice Mayor. I just wanted to note that. Um, I'm sorry, you know what, let me, forgive me. Thank you. Councilmember Glover, reminding that we, you had a significant amount of time, so Councilmember Matthews had not spoken at that point. Oh, that's fine, no, yeah, totally, to absolutely. Um, so uh, I'd like to make a motion to, con just to provide some clarity and direction for the staff, to continue offering voluntary temporary relocation to the bench lands while conducting a coordinated site cleanup with the remaining residents of the Ross camp and approach the Association of Faith Communities as a potential partner for the implementation of a transitional encampment at the existing Ross site. City Clerk, can I'll you second that. email that or restate it slower so we can capture Oh yeah, absolutely. Should we state your motion? A motion to continue offering voluntary temporary relocation to the bench lands while conducting a coordinated site cleanup with the remaining residents of the Ross camp and approach the Association of Faith Communities as a partner for the potential implementation of a transitional encampment at the Ross site. Okay. So we have a motion by Councilmember Glover. Was there a second? Second. Seconded by Councilmember Crone. Any further discussion? Councilmember Matthews? Speaking against it. Uh, two main things. This does not resolve the issue long-term of the gateway encampment. I think it's been very clear that that is not, it's, I should say, clear to me that that is not a site that's appropriate for a long-term uh, encampment. And also, we have no idea of the capacity of the association or willingness uh, to um, uh, appropriately manage that. So I'm, I'm not at, at this point prepared to, to uh, give that direction. Okay. Vice Mayor. Mm -hmm. I just want to state that I wasn't really done making comments and asking questions, and this is a big decision that I wanted to weigh in on, and so um, that is what, and especially given the information that we just received from the city attorney, um, 
I wasn't at that point in time ready to move forward with this because I feel like it changes um, a lot of, of what I think we should be doing with regards to the closure of the camp. So um, I would like to recommend that we um, take this back into closed session and discuss this uh, before making any final decisions at this point in time. So do you wanna make that motion? I'll make, yes, the motion that we, um, we go and adjourn into closed session to discuss uh, the motion, that the, the information that's brought for us from the city attorney and how it relates to the recommendations to staff on camp management. So we have a motion by Vice Mayor Cummings. Second. Second. Okay, seconded by Council Member Brown. Council Member, so we have two motions on the floor. One is a, uh, so we can ha have two motions on the floor without taking a vote on them. Okay, Council Member Cronin, then Council Member Glover. Um, are you suggesting, uh, Vice Mayor, that we go into closed session right now, or maybe we finish our agenda for the afternoon since a lot of people are waiting for other items? I think we should go now. I think mm -hmm. this is very important. Mm -hmm. So. Okay. Council Member Glover. If you could just clarify, Vice Mayor Cummings, um, why is it that you wanna have the conversation outside of the public eye? Yeah. I would just say that I was ready to continue our conversation until um, we took a vote. And so um, I wouldn't mind going into closed session since this regards legal issues and implications for the city that it might be in our best interest to speak about this. Mr. Mr. Gundotti, do you have further uh, interest in that? Input? Given that there is pending litigation, um, the council, it's certainly within the council's prerogative to discuss it in closed session. I, I do think it's appropriate under the circumstances as well. Okay. Okay, we'll go ahead and take a vote then on that. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Nay. So that passes with Council Member Crone and Glover voting against. <laughs> Council Member Brown, Matthews, Vice Mayor Cummings and myself, and Myers voting in support. So we'll now adjourn into closed session uh, to discuss this item. We'll return back. council meeting. So we have a opportunity for a special uh, presentation and uh, I want to uh, now uh, let those that were waiting a response from the earlier item know that we'll go ahead and take a pause, have our a special um, item before us at this time and then we'll return to the item upon completion of that. So we have a, a presentation of the Santa Cruz Sister Cities Committee Hans Christian Anderson Writing Awards.
This is a wonderful writing competition for children, teens, and adults sponsored by the Sister Cities Committee. And I'm pleased to introduce Linda Snook to please come forward as our chair of our Santa Cruz Sister Cities Committee. Hi, Linda. Thank you. Our Sister Cities Hans Christian Andersen essay competition is presented as part of the Hans Christian Andersen Fables Bay competition held in our beautiful sister city of Sestri Levante, Italy. Hans Christian Andersen lived for a short time there and considered, is considered a favorite son. This is the 52nd year of the Sestri competition. The competition in Santa Cruz is open to writers in four age categories from three years old through adult. The essays must be an original folk or fairy tale and the first through third place winners of the Santa Cruz co competition in each age group are submitted to the Sestri competition. Without further ado, I would like to invite Mayor Watkins to join me at the podium to congratulate the participants and winners of the contest. Thank you. And before I do, I will just say that it gives me such pleasure to acknowledge these creative, talented writers and winners of the Santa Cruz Sister Cities Committee Hans Christian Writing Award. Um, each of the council members has had the privilege of reading your work, and so we are so proud um, of your efforts, and we wish you the best of luck in Sestri competition. And so I'll come now, and we'll announce the winners. I understand that we have some of these participants who are able to attend. If you could please hold your applause until the end, we would appreciate that. Our, is it our third place winner? Six to ten. Hold to the end. You just broke the rule. I was like, oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> Stop. <laughs> Eleven to sixteen category. Second place is Isabel Brandenburg for Jade in the Attic. First place is Ella Rose Velosmi, the Maple Tree. Simone, long live the queen. Okay, well, that's 
to each stand between Thank you all for being here and congratulations. Thank you for your work and thank you, Linda, and the Sisters Committee for all your work as well. Okay, thank you, Rachel. Yeah, great. So um, at this time, we have uh, to reorient uh, those who are in the audience. We uh, adjourned our uh, meeting to a uh, closed session in light of some information that came forward to us um, by our city attorney in regards to um, a legal action that was taken today. So we'll go ahead and return back to our item, which is item number 13 on our agenda for action and deliberation. I'll also notify folks that we have a motion that is uh, on the floor uh, at this time that was made by Councilmember Glover and seconded by Councilmember Crone. So that is still pending. Um, but we were able to discuss a little bit more about some of the legal constraints given this new information in closed session. We'll return back. Councilmember Matthews and then Councilmember Glover. Yeah, I would like to um, propose an alternate motion um, because it's on the same topic. I'd like people to know what's out there as a possibility. So I would like to move uh, the following that the city move forward with opening of the temporary managed campsite at the Benchlands that the city move forward with the preparation of a managed campsite at 1220 North River. The city move forward with the voluntary relocation of Ross campers to the bench lands. And I will say parenthetically, there's apparently significant interest in that already. That, this, that upon the closure of the bench lands um, temporary site on May 1st, the city assist and facilitate bench lands campers to new shelter facilities such as 1220 North River, the Salvation Army locations and other resources. During the uh, Ross camp closure, uh, the site um, be secured um, and uh, an accurate census be taken of those uh, remaining that there be no new occupants at the Ross site uh, during this um, closure period, and that the intent is that uh, uh, campers not return to the Ross camp once it's closed. Okay, so we have a motion by Councilmember Matthews. Is there a second to that motion? I'll second it. Okay, second by Councilmember Myers, Councilmember Glover. So we have two motions on the floor. Yeah, so this is my concern, like I mentioned before, about the weird power, that there's a really weird power dynamic on this body. Um, we were all in the closed session. We all were privy to the new information and all talking about the things we can be on board with. And instead of giving me, knowing that I have a motion on the floor, to give me the option to either maintain the motion or to change it because of the new information that were brought in, you immediately called on Councilmember Matthews, who I saw you back in the room calculating and coming up with this new motion. So it just seems, again, it's, it's just, I have to say, I'm consistently disappointed by the structure and the for, the way that this body operates. It just seems so uh, orchestrated with regards to the way that things are handled and the way that people are prioritized in the speaking order. That's really disconcerting, uh, and dis disconcerting in general. Um, I don't think that the, 
uh, as Councilmember Matthews just suggested in her motion, to not be relocating people back to the Ross camp or taking that totally off the table, as we were told by our staff that that's what they've been telling people, that they're going to have the option to do once they get a chance to renovate the, the Ross camp location. In addition to that, the police, the fire chief rather, who is the one that has expressed the deep concern for the situation at the Ross camp, openly admitted that there are uh, the potential of there being 100 beds uh, locations that would be viable and safe at the Ross camp if it is cleared and then restructured in a way that is congruent to safe fire safety standards. So uh, there's, there was a, it, uh, and I, what I really dislike also is that we had that conversation in closed session because there was nothing in that conversation that people in, out here, in my opinion, should not have been able to hear. And it makes it so that I can't reference things that just happened in that conversation to give you context about the thoughts and opinions that are represented on this body. So again, I will uh, express my disappointment with the decision to move it into closed session, to have a conversation which I think should have been in the public eye, and I will express my frustration and concern with the power dynamic on this body and the relationship between some of the members. Uh, I'm just going to leave it there. Yeah. All right, good news. So there are two motions on the floor at this time. Is there any other discussion, or shall we take each motion? Count, uh, first motion is, uh, or the first vote is whether to accept the substitute motion. There was, it wasn't a substitute motion. I think it's just a there different motion. It was a mo substitute motion. That was a substitute. I interpreted that as a substitute motion. As you wish. Okay. I okay. mean, assuming that there was a motion and a second on the floor, and there was a subsequent motion. Mm -hmm. My understanding is that there can be three motions on the floor at any right. given time. Right. But it is a substitute motion. Okay. It wasn't specified. And as I a will. Substitute I motion. will put it on as a substitute motion and ask that people support a vote on that motion. Okay, we'll vote go to ahead. accept it and then vote to approve it. Okay, and within the subs within your motion, there is an element to uh, close the Ross camp, um, the Gateway camp, uh, through this process, but to not have folks return at a certain point. Yes. Okay, I can go ahead and support that. Is there any further discussion? Wanting, can you reread? The yeah, motion, sure. I'm, I totally appreciate yeah, wanting to know what the motion is. Uh, um, that we, the city move forward uh, with opening of the temporary managed campsite at the bench lands. The city move forward with, uh, um, continue with preparation of managed campsite at 1220 North River. The city move forward with voluntary relocation of Ross campers to the bench lands. Upon closure of the bench lands temporary site on May 1st, and I'm gonna say parenthetically, there's a major community event already scheduled on May 5th at the Benchlands. So there has to be a closure date there. <coughs> so upon closure of the Benchlands um, temporary site on May 1st, assist and facilitate Benchland campers to find new, to relocate to new shelter facilities such as 1220 River, North River Salvation Army site and other resources. During the Ross camp closure process, the site be secured, an accurate census of those remaining be taken, and no new occupants be allowed. The intent is, is that individuals not return to the Ross campsite. So that's the motion on the floor by Councilmember Matthews. There's a second by uh, Councilmember Myers. That's a substitute motion. Before any discussion, or can we discuss before we take that item? Because I'm not clear. You may discuss. Okay. Councilmember Crone and then Councilmember Brown and then Councilmember Glover. Question for Vice Mayor Cummings. You um, had skepticism before if there was enough bed spaces. Are you satisfied now if we're not going to look at the Ross camp, a reconfiguration of the Ross camp? Um, are you satisfied that with and, and supporting the motion without the Ross camp in the mix? I think that currently with having the security and by slowly decreasing the size of the camp, it's gonna give us a good census of the number of people, if we're gonna bring 1220 online and we're moving people to the Benchlands, if we're able to get a good census of the number of people that we're moving to 1220, people who are taking alternatives, and then we're um, controlling the population that's at the Ross camp, I think it'll give us a good census of more spaces that we'll need when the time comes that we wanna fully close it. But I think that by doing this, um, we'll have a good understanding of 
the number of people who will remain at the Ross camp and won't want um, any of the services that are offered. And we'll also be able to see how quickly people are moving or, and transitioning on to different uh, forms of shelter. I, I think in theory it's good, but um, in reality, I, I don't think our homeless situation is going away, and I don't, I don't think, it, you know, wanting it to decrease and go away, but the reality is we are going to need more spaces, and I think the only difference that we're suggesting in our motion is that we go a little bit farther than the past you know, 30 years I've been following this um, in, in Santa Cruz, and, and that we have, we prepare for the number of, of, of homeless people that really uh, live in Santa Cruz, um, because I don't think they have anywhere else to go but the neighborhoods, and I think you are gonna see, so I'm, I'm saying would you be then willing to open the Ross camp after you, the census is taken and we see how many um, actual spaces are needed? I think that if we are at a point when we, where we don't have enough space and we don't have alternatives for people to go, I think that's a question that we can have at that time. But um, I personally feel that uh, we need to, one, continue moving forward with trying to put, get people into alternative forms of shelter. And I think we need to get an accurate account of who is going to be left, because I completely agree. And that's one of the concerns that I have and a little bit of you know, hesitation moving forward with this um, is that I do, I have heard from communities about what would happen, you know, they, they've been asking like, well, what's gonna happen with all the people there? You know, if, are you gonna shut this down in the state and everybody's gonna go into different neighborhoods and what does that mean for the community? So I think that by slowly having people, you know, um, transition from the camp to other alternatives, I think it'll also give us an understanding a better understanding of what is happening in our community as we're transitioning people out of the camp. So if we're opening up 1220, if we're opening up the Benchlands in 1220 and people are starting to find alternatives, are we finding that we have increases in crime throughout the city? Are we having more uh, property damage throughout the city? Are we seeing a decrease in the area of Felker Price and the Tannery? I think it'll be a good opportunity for us to actually begin to collect data. How, do, how long do we, I mean, it's a real question, how long do we wait in, in, in a month or you know, in collecting data? Um, I would imagine that by the next city council meeting we should have a good understanding of where we're at because if, if we're gonna find out on Friday uh, where we're headed in terms of uh, the legal decisions that are gonna be made. Um, after that, by the time we are able to meet again, we'll, we will be at that point having had at least two weeks where people will have been transitioning on and we'll have a good sense of where we're at. My main concern is that our, the people were told that they could come back. When I talked to them yesterday, um, at least seven people said we were told, and then the police officers also who were present said they were telling people this is gonna be cleaned, you have to go to the bench lands and you can move back. That's, that's one of my concerns. I think there's just there's two potential pathways forward in terms of the majority of the council's interest and direction, and that could reflect in our voting. Okay. Just one last thing. Vice Mayor. Last thing I'd like to uh, say to that is that we'll have a better understanding, I would imagine, as people go to the Benchlands and other opportunities are offered to them, we can get a sense then of whether people do want to go back, whether they want to transition onto something else, whether they want to go to 1220. And so I think that we're going to be able to um, We'll know a bit, a bit more about what people's desires will be, um, I'd say, after the decisions we make today. Do you support a friendly amendment to um, take the, the Ross closure off that off the list that uh, Councilmember Matthews put forward and then deal with that at the next council meeting? That's not his motion to make a friendly amendment towards. Would, It'd be Councilmember Matthews' motion to accept a friendly amendment. And, uh, and Councilmember Myers. Speak. <laughs> so, um, I would just say that there's the intent in the motion, I don't think there's a specifics, but the intention is to close the camp. So that's, I, I would say from my perspective, that allows for some degree of flexibility, though I think that um, one of the things that many folks has, have expressed is that um, other council members have expressed that they do want to see the camp eventually close. So I'll just put that there. Okay, so there will be an intent to close the camp. There's, there's, again, I think I'll just sort of reorient it. There's sort of two motions on the floor. One is to have uh, potential modifications, I guess, to the original motion, but essentially the current plan in place is to have folks return back to uh, the gateway encampment. And the second motion, with other considerations, is to not have folks return back once they are moved out into other sheltering options that feel more suitable for them. The, and so the intent is. The intent is. So do you want to specify what intent is? 
I think that's the expressed intention. We still have lots of unknowns before us. The desire is that we um, uh, clear the Ross Camp site for all the reasons that are obvious to us, the health and safety issues, um, that uh, <laughs> campers be accommodated at the bench lands and when it comes online, 1220, um, that we uh, need to close the bench lands on May 1st. We will assist and facilitate the bench lands campers to relocate. During the closure of the Ross Camp, that site will be secured. We will take an accurate uh, census of who's there and no new occupants will be allowed. I think that's really important to the management plan and that our intention is that individuals not return to the Ross Camp site. While others that are still there, no, oh, that the that Ross have, campsite will have by, been closed. Closed by yes. attrition. Okay, just yeah. making sure we're clear on that. Uh, count, I'm, I wanted to say it was Councilmember Brown, and then Councilmember Crown, and then no, Councilmember. No, then it was it was Brown. Then, Glover, then it was Council. For, forgive me, Councilmember Brown, then Councilmember Glover, and then Councilmember Crown. So go ahead. Well, I just want to say I uh, support all elements of this motion, um, all aspects, with the exception of. Uh, the intention to close the camp because this is just another way, you know, it's just another way of saying permanent camp closure, which I voted on previously to oppose. I'm going to do the same, but I do support all of the other aspects. So I, I'm sorry that won't be reflected in our action minutes, but I am going to make it clear here um, that that's why I'm opposing the motion. Councilmember Glover. Yep, and just to reiterate, uh, I my motion was almost identical to that minus the collection of data and some other minutia which would have been included if I had given, been given the option to m change the motion before the other one was made. Uh, that being said, I will just remind my colleagues that we as a city have been communicating to the people of the Ross camp that they will have the option to relocate back once the renovations are complete. So if you vote today to intent to potentially close the camp or to redirect or all this other kind of stuff, you will be directly lying to the people of the Ross camp and therefore damaging any semblance of trust that exists between this body, the city staff, and the people that live over there. And to say that we're gonna be uh, encouraging them to go other places that are a better fit, is it a better fit or that we're pushing them into those sites? And so that's where it becomes another issue as well because there are the, con the concerns that people have about the limitations. And I appreciate Captain Harold Captain, Her Captain Harold for coming and, uh, and expressing his perspective and ideas, but there are uh, alternative sources that have made phone calls to the shelters that were being uh, referenced, and they were either told that they didn't have room, they didn't have space, or all these other kinds of issues. And so this isn't even going to address the issue of people outside of the Ross camp, and that's what I keep trying to talk about with transitional encampments, is that we're just gonna be back here again in another three or six months when people move to another location and we have forced with the same situation again. So I encourage this body to stop doing the same things. There are those of us on this body that have been here for the last 20 years and there's some suggestion that we're doing the same thing. We cannot keep doing it. We must change course and do something that's progressive, forward thinking and innovative, not criminalization and punitive just assault on people that are the most vulnerable in our community. I'm tired. It's ridiculous. Okay, well we have two <laughs> We'll go ahead, okay, okay, okay. We'll go ahead and ask those that are in the audience to please allow us to, we'll have Council Member Cohn and then we'll take a vote on the substitute. Uh, I, was, I had a question to the fire chief if he come up for one second and I don't mean to put you in the middle of anything here. I just want to get uh, what the, uh, the council member referenced the management plan and I thought the management plan that you had outlined included designing the Ross camp and moving back to it. So which management plan, I guess, are we talking about? Or was that the management plan that originally that, that we were gonna um, move back to the Ross camp? We're gonna move to Benchlands, reconfigure the Ross camp, and then move back to the Ross camp. My direction from the city council was the temporary relocation of the Ross camp. And that was at the last city council meeting. So that was designing the Benchlands um, to have room and capacity for everyone who would be at the Gateway Camp, as well as coming up with a management plan for the Gateway Camp itself. And then in the intervening time, there was a, another motion that was brought forward to close it. 
Um, okay. That, so well, I, th that motion's still on the floor, and I'm just trying to clarify the management plan that Councilmember Matthews referenced, which that's the reference. That's the management plan. I'm not sure what management plan you're referring to. No, I didn't Matthews. refer to a management plan. I referred to the opening of a temporary managed campsite at the Benchlands, which it is. Okay, so we have uh, Vice Mayor Cummings, and then we'll go ahead and vote on the motion. I just want to state that <clears throat> I think one of the things that we've been discussing over time is the fact that, you know, if we move people from Ross Camp back to Ross Camp, we're still not going to have enough space. If we move people from the Benchlands to 1220, we might not, we still might not have that much space. And so I think that what we need to be focusing on right now, while we're waiting on decisions to come down from um, our, you know, governing bodies, is that we need to be able to move people out of this situation clean that situation. We need to try to get as many of those people to 1220. We need to hear about what's going to happen on Friday, and then we can decide whether or not we need to reconfigure the direction that we're taking or if we should stay on course. It will then give us an opportunity to understand where people are at and what they want to do with their lives. Um, and I think that at that point in time, between now and then, we should be thinking about whether there are you know, alternatives, if you're speaking with the faith community, whether or not they want to start another program, where that would be, our community is okay with something like that, because knowing that we are going to have um, a situation potentially where um, if we don't provide enough space, then people can end up in other neighborhoods and we can just have people kind of roaming all over Santa Cruz. I think that um, that is something that we seriously need to take into account. But given where we're at right now, I think that we need to continue to move forward and we should see where we're at in terms of how the strategy that we're, that's unfolding right now might actually help to reduce the, 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 number, the size of the camp and whether or not people are actually going to come back to it after we have uh, seen the impact of moving, cleaning, and providing alternatives. Okay, so the motion on the floor is to actually have some elements around having people not to come back. And I'm going to go ahead and ask to keep your voices down, um, to have people not come back to the, Ross, to the camp, to the gateway encampment. The other motion is to do that. So there is a decision point, I guess, to say in that regard. I was going to ask what the alternative, what the first motion was, if it could be repeated as well. You can repeat your first motion. So the alternative motion that I was going to make, or the, to the revision, was a motion to schedule, um, or rather, it, it was going to be scheduled in that special meeting that we talked about with a special closed session to continue the conversation, but that seems to be a moot point. So to continue with the temporary voluntary relocation and management plan of people from the Ross camp to the bench lands while working to renovate the site and bringing it up to the standards of the fire chief, continue to move forward with 1220 River Street opening and transitioning people from the bench lands of those who are interested in going and approach the Association of Faith Communities as a partner for a potential implementation of a transitional encampment potentially at the Ross site or somewhere else in the, in the community. Okay, so that's the motion, um, somewhat modified the original motion that was on the floor. It was made by Councilmember Glover and seconded by Councilmember Crone. City Attorney Kandati? There is a substitute motion. Mm -hmm. We should vote on. Councilmember Matthews, so you should vote on whether to accept the substitute motion. Should you do that, then you can vote on Councilmember Matthews' main motion. Okay, so we'll go ahead and vote on whether to accept the motion. All those in favor to accept Councilmember Matthews' motion, all say aye. 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 Any opposed? Nay. So that fails with Councilmember Glover voting against, if, and Councilmember Brown voting against, and Councilmember Crown voting against. So then Councilmember Matthews, Vice Mayor Cummings, myself, and Myers voting in support of uh, accepting the motion. So we'll go ahead and now vote on that motion. Now the substitute motion is on the floor, correct? So the substitute motion is on the floor, so we'll go ahead and take the vote on the motion presented by Councilmember Matthews, seconded by Councilmember Myers. Okay, all those in favor, please could, say could aye. We, could we take out the Ross, uh, moving back to the Ross and, sep and, and separate that away from the rest of the motion? You can ask the maker of the motion. Um, I believe I would like to leave it as one motion. Okay, so we'll and just go I, ahead. I we'll see that Council Member Cummings has a question. Okay. Or, yeah, I had a question around um, with 1220 coming online. Is this is the idea behind this that the city would be managing that, or would this still be Salvation Army? I believe no. I thought they were. The idea is that the Salvation Army would still be running 1220. Um, I want to make a friendly amendment to. Um, to, for the consideration that Council Member Glover mentioned about um, working with or reaching out to the Associated Faith Communities to understand whether or not they might be interested in running a transitional encampment. 
Well, it's my it would, motion on yeah. the floor right now. That's why I ask as a friendly amendment. Um, I personally am not interested in, um, as part of my motion, pursuing an addition, uh, committing to additional uh, encampment at the Ross site. So we'll go ahead and vote on the motion. So all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Nay. So that passes with Councilmember Matthews, Vice Mayor Cummings, uh, Councilmember Myers, and myself in support. Councilmember Brown, uh, Councilmember Glover, and Councilmember Crone voting against. Uh, Councilmember Glover. I want to make a motion to approach the Association of Faith Communities about the potentiality of partnering with them for the establishment of a transitional encampment somewhere in Santa Cruz. There's a motion. Second. I didn't even hear it. Uh, to approach the Association of Faith Community, uh, faith community to uh, support the transitional encampment. No, 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 no. Oh, that was me. not the okay, language. Uh, it is to approach the Association of Faith Communities in a conversation about potential partnership or implementation and their involvement in a transitional encampment somewhere in the city of Santa Cruz. Okay. So we have a motion by Councilmember Glover. Is there a second? Second. Second by Councilmember Crone. Any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? No. 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 So that passes with Councilmember Crone, Glover, Vice Mayor Cummings, and Brown in support. Matthews, myself, and Councilmember Myers voting against. Okay. So we'll go ahead and close this item for this time. Um, correct? Just a point of clarification. Yes. So uh, how does that work with the, I mean, we're gonna find out what happens on Friday with regards to the, the stay away slash TRO. Yes. Temporary restraining order. I'm sorry, I hate when people use acronyms and they don't know what I'm talking about. So temporary restraining order, but if that is the case and then they just accepted Council Member Matthews' uh, motion, then how would we stop people from being at the Ross Camp location if, per se, the TRO is granted by the court or the injunction or whatever it is decided is decided by the court on Friday? Well, um, certainly moving forward with the closure of the Ross Camp would be contingent upon the outcome of the hearing on Friday. So if, if the court grants the restraining order on Friday, then we would have to evaluate our position, but we certainly could not move forward with a closure of the camp um, if it's if it's barred by a court order. And so basically all we just did right now was uh, add an extra layer of panic and fright and fear essentially uh, on top of a vulnerable communi okay. community of people. Just want to that clarify. sounds like a rhetorical question to me. I'm just wondering, <laughs> I, I, just wondering, because it seems like there's no action that the city can take right now in moving people forcefully at all until at least Friday. Yeah, so I mean, anyone's gonna hear this. You're, you're absolutely gonna... right that um, <laughs> pending the outcome of the hearing on Friday, uh, people who want to relocate to the Benchland site, um, we will facilitate that, but no one will be required to move. I just have to say that's rather uncivil. Okay, well, we have another item to move on to, so we'll go ahead and uh, move on to item number 14 on our agenda. Sure. And um, so, uh, so this, the, okay. The biggest hypocrites in the world. <laughs> I'm going to go ahead and pause just for one second. I want to get clarification on this on the clerk with the clerk. I'll be right back. A little bit of time for some transition, then we'll convene to our cannabis item. Reconvene here and we'll go ahead and move on to here. Uh, cannabis. Jeez. If I could have uh, your uh, attention, we're going, we're reconvening to item number 14 on our agenda related to cannabis policy. 
Good afternoon, Mayor Watkins and members of the council. My name is Sarah Fleming and I'm principal planner with the long range planning and policy team here with the city of Santa Cruz. Uh, I'm here with Catherine Donovan, our senior planner on the advanced planning team. Uh, cannabis item you'll see today, you have an A and a B. Item A is a long range planning team item, so we'll be presenting first, and then item B is a finance department item also on cannabis and they'll be presenting second. And I'll turn it over to Catherine. Good afternoon. Um, so this item, uh, we have a recommendation for a code text amendment and then a couple of items that we're asking for direction from the council. Um, the first item has to do with cannabis delivery services. Um, and in 2016, this is just a little background. The voters approved Proposition 64, which decriminalized marijuana. Um, we, the city adopted a cannabis ordinance in 2017, and at that time, um, city council had directed staff to include a provision that would prohibit delivery to uh, cu customers in the city from businesses located outside the city. Um, and this was to uh, provide protection for our own local businesses. Um, recently, the, um, s the state passed regulations for um, retail services that um, allow uh, delivery services from anywhere in the state to anywhere in the state. Um, so this is contrary to our uh, ordinance, but because it is state law, it trumps our ordinance and is, is de facto the legal law of the land. Um, there, in response to this, there was a bill proposed, AB 1530, which would have allowed local jurisdictions to control delivery within um, their jurisdictional boundaries. Uh, but since the staff report was written, that bill has been shelved for this year. Um, and also since the staff report was written, a lawsuit was filed um, against the state related to the delivery service to, prov to go back to allowing um, local jurisdictions to have control over their own s cannabis uses in their cities. So we're kind of in this, um, limbo land right now where the, right now the state controls whether we can whether there is delivery within our city from outside however um, if this lawsuit is successful then um, we we will once again have control so we have um, written the a, a proposed amendment to our ordinance that would allow delivery from businesses located outside the city only if it's required by the state. Um, and this will bring the city's ordinance into compliance with state law, but also uh, if the lawsuit is successful or if AB 1530 or some successor legislation comes into effect next year, we, don't, we won't have to go back and change this again because it will automatically um, put our old rules in, in effect. What we also did with the ordinance is we reiterated um, that a business delivering into the city is required to have a city business license and to pay both state and local sales and cannabis taxes. This would be true even if we didn't have it in the ordinance, but we want to make it very, very clear to businesses that are not located in the city that they still owe taxes if they're operating within the city. And so um, this is our, our recommendation. I'm not gonna read it at this point, but I just wanted to let you know I have it up there if you prefer to read it from the screen than from your, your staff report. Um, the next item that I mentioned, there's a couple of items we have that we're requesting direction on. Um, the first is whether to change our ordinance to allow the transfer of the cannabis retailer licenses. 
um, prior to a, a, the original adoption of our cannabis ordinance, um, we had come to the city council for direction and city council recommended that we limit the number of retailers to five, that we give preference to local business owners as well as a number of other um, preference factors, and also that we come up with a mechanism to prevent the flipping of licenses for profit. And to meet those objectives, we came up with a competitive pr process for those five um, retailer business licenses, and we um, prohibited the transfer of the licenses. Since that ordinance was adopted, we have heard from people who hold those retailer licenses, and um, they have <laughs> noted that they want to be able to sell their businesses, which our ordinance does not prohibit them from selling their business. However, the business is pretty much predicated on them having the real retailer license and they can't um, sell or, or transfer that license. Um, and so we are now coming to the city council to um, get direction from you on whether you would like us to change that and allow the transfer and if so, um, to give us some, some direction on the manner of doing that. Um, and I've, there was a question from, from some council people on what those factors were, um, and I think even if you were involved at the time, you probably don't remember them all, so I've listed them here. Um, I don't expect you to read them all here, but we can go back to them if there's a question. Um, the second um, issue that's, that we are asking for direction on has to do with the definition of proprietor. And um, as you know, the cannabis industry, because it is not legal federally, um, can't deal easily with um, banking and loan institutes. And so one of the best methods for a cannabis business to um, raise funds is <coughs> through taking on new investors. Um, and you know, generally investors require some sort of security for their investment. In our ordinance, we define a proprietor as someone who has a 10% or larger interest in the business. And so under this definition, um, that means that the original business owners can accept less than 10% um, investment into their business, which can be um, can limit their their potential for for getting uh, funding for expansion. So um, what we're asking at this time is whether you would like us to um, expand on that, and if so, what kind of parameters? And there were some some general suggestions in the staff report. I'm sure there's many other ways that we can look into this, but we just want to some direction on whether this is something that the council would like to pursue before we spend a lot of time on that. And um, this is the definition of proprietor that's currently in the ordinance. And again, I'm not gonna read it to you right now, but I have it here if it, if it becomes a question. And that's my presentation and I'm happy to take questions. Okay. So we'll go ahead and return back to the council for any questions. Thank you for your presentation. Are there any questions from council members at this time? Councilmember Matthews? Well, I did have a question. Since there is a challenge, I'm, I'm back on the first part now. Since there's a challenge to the state law and many other jurisdictions and the League of California Cities are challenging that uh, legally, uh, uh, I would like for us to join that challenge and um, is, um, I guess, is, does that supplant the um, need to come into conformance with this, with the uh, existing state law? I'd uh, also like us to support 1530. I mean, I would like yeah. us to aggressively <laughs> assert local control. I, I think we, I would like to defer to, to Tony on this, did you were you here for that question? <laughs> Unfortunately, I had 
was just entering the chambers when Councilmember Matthews uh, posed the question, so I apologize. There's a challenge to the state law that permits delivery services yes. statewide, and that's been, um, that challenge has been uh, launched by a number of cities and the League of California Cities. Um, That's my understanding. Is it um, <clears throat> on hold at this point in the courts? Uh, is there a need to um, comply with the state law now if that matter is in the courts and still to be decided? Yes, unless a court issues uh, an order staying implementation of the law or an injunction barring or invalidating the law or barring enforcement of the law, then we are obligated to comply with it. Um, then just I'm trying to get the train of thought. So we have both a need to um, comply if we have to, but not unless we have to, but also we can challenge the underlying state law. We can join in the, in the challenge to the yes. state law. Um, my understanding is that the resolution would basically establish the policy that if state law um, is not binding on the city, then then our regulations would go into effect. And since it's being legally challenged, is it currently binding on the city? Yes, that's my understanding. So right away, bingo, we have to start allowing deliveries from anybody. Yes. We can't prohibit that, that's correct. Yeah. Even though our ordinance currently does prohibit, we, it's not, the state law would trump. Okay. Well, I'm, I'm very interested in knowing the status of the legal challenge. I'd like us to join that. We are monitoring that and, and uh, if the council gives direction, we will look for opportunities to join as amicus um, or as a party, if that's the council's direction. Okay. Any other questions? Quick. Council Member Cohen, do you have a question? Okay, Thanks. Have a um, question. Uh, do we have uh, businesses right now that deliver in Santa Cruz? If you have a retail license, can you del also deliver or is that a separate license? No, well, it's a separate state license, but it's not, the, the retailer license would allow delivery. And I, I believe both of our um, original retailers are doing deliveries. I'm not 100% sure of that, but I believe they are. You said both of ours? I think they are, yeah. And it's, but there's five licenses out there, but only two are operating right now? I think the third has just opened its doors in the last, within the last few weeks or month. Are the, are the Con Peoples, Oz, and uh, what are the others? There's um, Canna Cruz and Kind Peoples and... West End. Western. West End. West, West, End. West, West Cliff, Cliff Wellness. Wellness. Right. Thank you. <laughs> So that's um, that's only three, four. Okay. Oh. Yeah, and I just, I don't believe they're open for business yet. Yeah. And where does Wham fall into that? Wham is the fifth, and they are also not yet open for business. So both Wham and Reefside um, have locations, and they're working on their tenant improvements to get ready to open. It takes a while. Who's in the Finns building? The Finns Coffee building. I think that's Reefside. Okay. Um, a question about um, investment. Uh, right now, it's ten, below ten percent. Right? You can. Can you take it from five or six different people? Uh, that. No, it's a total, the total ownership, total uh, of the of the ownership. And how have other cities been dealing with that? Um. You know, we are in a kind of a unique situation because A, we have limited the number of licenses, which is not uncommon, but we also um, gave out those licenses on a competitive, through a competitive process, and I don't know of anybody else who's doing that. Um, and, and that's really um, one of the main factors that makes us come to you with a question of whether whether you want us to pursue this because the 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 factors were something that were important to the council at that time that that we be able to 
choose a business that was providing the best benefits for our community. What do you think would be the difference between um, raising it to 50% or 49, do the Chinese, the China rule, 49, 51 versus 100%, you know, like where somebody can just pass their business or sell their business to somebody else as, along with the license? Um, most of the businesses that we have are not owned by just one person or two people. So in effect, giving them 49% would give them the um, controlling. If, I, I suppose it depends on what the corporate structure is, but just in simplistic terms, if you had two people who owned the business and then they had an investor who owned 49%, that investor would potentially have the, have the controlling. Would you suggest going along with cannabis retailer license factors for if we did go to a model where somebody could sell their business and license that the person who bought it would have to comply with the, the criteria we already have in place? Um, well, we had several suggestions. One is that we set up a, a kind of a minimum criteria that you would have to meet and, uh, you know, maybe you could say you have to meet, you know, five of those factors or you could say you have to continue to meet all the factors that um, the original owners supplied um, or, um, you know, there's an infinite number of things, but those were the things that were came up to the, us on the top of our heads. Are there any cities that have a transfer tax where the city gets a portion of, uh, or a, a significant portion of the sales <laughs> of that business? I, I'm not aware of it, but that doesn't mean it hasn't happened. Thank you, Mayor. All right, I just had a couple quick, quick questions just to sort of follow up on <laughs> Councilmember Crone's question. Um, one of the things that I think is the underlying principle behind the transfer is really maintaining the character, increasing the minority uh, women-owned businesses, having um, a protection from a, sort of a corporate potential takeover. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Um, and then in terms of, um, so the, and, that, and that also meets the, the conversation around the flipping. And then I had a question around, um, no, I can't find it. Okay, I'm gonna look for it because there's two sections of the item and I'll get back to it because I'll, I'll see if other council members have a question. Council Member Brown. Yeah, I guess, I mean, it, Council Member Crone kind of, I mean, I t asked the question and I'm just gonna kind of, because I, and you touched on it with your response, but I just wanna make sure that I'm like looking at all of the possibilities before us here um, as we make this decision, because I am sympathetic to the, um, you know, the limits that we're placing on, um, you know, retail or on businesses to be able to transfer, well, to sell their business for what it actually is worth without necessarily inflating or um, deflating the value of that business, right? I mean, this is a big challenge. Um, I think that you know, I'm, I'm trying to figure out a way forward so that um, people can kind of invest, take on investors, build their business, and have some assurance that they um, could sell the business for what it's worth um, and, um, you know, without artificially kind of um, uh, uh, restricting that, um, that value at the same time that we want to protect the integrity of, you know, the intent of our original um, uh, rules around and, and pr um, priorities, um, preferences around local business and et cetera, et cetera. We can see them all there. Um, so I'm just trying to figure out how, how we can do that. Um, and I know this is like, that's what you've been trying to do, right? So um, <laughs> if it's I had an easy answer, I would have given to it to you. to you to come up with another <laughs> a solution that you haven't already come up with to bring before us today. Um, but I do want to try to figure out how, you know, how we can kind of at least get at that. I mean, if we, if we take no action today, um, you know, we can revisit it, but that's just kicking the can down the road. Um, 
Um, if I may, I think that um, what we're really looking for on that item is direction on if you would like us to go and look at it. And we would be happy to go and, and come back, bring back some more thought out proposals with pros and cons, if that is something you'd like us to look at. Um, it wasn't noticed for today to make any changes to the ordinance in that regard too, so I don't know that you'd have the ability to make changes today if you wanted to, but um, we would be more than happy to take direction from council to go and investigate that, um, do some community outreach and, and come back to you if that's the will of the council. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll just let other people speak, but I'd like to investigate that. that direction. Yes. Vice Mayor Cummings, then Council Member Crown. I just had a quick question on how much um, licenses are currently, what, what the price is currently on licenses. I know that it seems like there's five businesses, so they all have the licenses currently. Right. Um, but how much those were purchased for, and if the purchasing of those, if the price was the same? The um, license is not for sale. Um, it's just that the city only um, distributes only has, we will only release five licenses. So um, there, I think there was a, a fee for applying that was in the range of I think 1500 to $2,000. Maybe somebody who applied for one could <laughs> verify that. Um, and then there's also a use permit requirement which is about um, 2000 to 2500 somewhere in that range. At the time. Council Member Cohen and then Council Member um, Cohen. I wanted to pose a, a question um, to Council Member Brown. Just the free market, we all know, is not really a free market. And um, I'm just thinking about the model. Uh, I think it works really well up at the university when they sell homes up there. Um, it only goes up um, according to this uh, cost of living uh, index. So if you bought a home for, you know, as a friend of mine did maybe for 182,000, it's only gone up to like 220,000 in a few years. So like a model like that I think is a good one that kind of you know, depresses it because, but also you know, keeps it within a, uh, hopefully within the family, <laughs> within the Santa Cruz family. Um, and that's what I would be um, looking at. I had a question for the city attorney um, I, in t speaking with two other council members before this meeting, we all thought uh, the tax rate was actually on the agenda. Uh, you said to me that no, that's not what's being asked here. I'm just looking at paying applicable taxes, including state, local, and sales taxes and cannabis taxes. I don't know, and that, that's in recommendation Sorry, number one. Sorry, what? what uh, Re recommendation number one. Uh, for 14.1, correct? Yeah, so there are two items on the agenda related to cannabis. The first one is presented by planning, that's 14.1. And then the second one will be presented by finance after this presentation uh, related to the taxes. Okay. Okay, I'm sorry, Let, uh, allow, allow me please to read this language. And we were gonna have both presentations before we open it up to public comment and then return back for council action and deliberation. This. Uh, refers to delivery services being subject to the tax uh, a city business license and paying applicable taxes including state and local sales tax and cannabis taxes so it doesn't really relate to tax rates it's it's applying those tax rates to delivery businesses what the recommendation is referring to so just to clarify we can't take any action on the amount of tax sales tax that's paid um, by um, retail outlets in Santa Cruz today no, the only thing the council could do is direct uh, that an item be returned for consideration at a future meeting to, to consider um, taking some sort of action on those tax rates. Thanks. And Catherine, it looks like you, did you wanna add? There, there's a second item that's 14B. It's not my staff report, it's the okay. next staff report. Okay. And um, where we'll have tax. discussion around cannabis business. That's, tax. yeah, that's where the taxes come in. That's right. So we'll see, before we go move on, we'll see if there's any further questions on your presentation, then we'll um, invite up the second presentation and then open it up to public comment, at which time we can discuss that. I'll, I'll respond to that question when that item is, is raised. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So I, um, Council Member Myers. Uh, I just have a question on uh, first of all, um, congratulations to some of the folks who have opened their stores recently and also um, just want to recognize the uh, number of local families who are in the business um, and uh, setting a standard, I think, for our community. Um, with the license, I'm just curious, uh, these, these aren't typical, typical businesses because you really can't get a sense from their 
you know, sort of from their structure based on loans. And I mean, it's, it's very difficult. So I guess I'm just wondering, is there any way to, when we're looking at the, the, the actual um, license transfer piece, is there, we, we really can't get at evaluation per se um, with that. I, I think what I'm hearing potentially is the concern is that um, either that the, the value of these businesses may be inflated because of the limited licenses. So if you're looking at a, a toggle, you can either increase the, the licenses, <laughs> but I know we also have a very high percentage of, of um, facilities in, in Santa Cruz County per capita. So the other option is to kind of look at the valuation uh, potentially to try to come up with some community benefit standard or metric that we would be able to, is there is anyone doing that in the state? Is there any jurisdiction that, uh, it sounds like we're really the only one right now that's got limited licensing and that might be county, that's countywide, right. correct? Well, what, no, this is, city. the city has a separate license, separate ordinance from the county and we're not the only, community that has limited the number of licenses, but we're the only community I know of that has based who those licenses go on through a, a competitive process. And and that's sort of the, that's what makes this difficult. If it was not competitive, if it was just kind of, okay, we're gonna do five licenses, first come, first serve, then there wouldn't, we wouldn't be, um, the issue wouldn't wouldn't arise because we wouldn't we wouldn't have these factors that we're trying to um, encourage in our businesses. Um, there would still be the issue that if a business is selling a, a business that includes a license and there's a limited number of licenses, then part of the value of the business is the license itself. Um, but I wouldn't be as concerned about about that piece as I am about trying to um, get the the best businesses for our community because that was the a very strong direction that council gave us when we wrote this ordinance and we spent a lot of time thinking about how to do that. Okay, thank you. Sorry, did you have additional questions? No, I think I think I'm good for now. Um, I just have one kind of uh, final clarification question. Um, first, I want to thank you for that because I haven't been on the council at the time. We really, I, you know, the council members that were there really did want to emphasize an opportunity for uh, more equity and, and allowing more minority and women owned businesses um, benefit from the industry as well as having that local preference. So I appreciate your work on trying to do that. I also recognize the challenge that there as well. Um, my question I think is sort of related to Councilmember Meyer's um, interested in is is there between the tr the two options presented in the staff report around the license transfers and the removal of the license limit would it make sense to think about those in terms of direction for you all to research how that they kind of interplay with each other or would you consider them two sort of separate pathways forward um, well if you remove the limit on the number, then it becomes a non-issue because there's no competition and, and the business, it, whether we transfer a license or not doesn't really matter because um, a, a, if someone bought a business, they could, they could go out and get a new license. They could apply and get a new license. Um, allowing the transfer um, without raising the number is where the problem comes up. Right, yeah. okay. Okay, so in regards to trying to move forward with potential options policy-wise, um, if we wanna maintain a commitment to increasing minority and women-owned businesses and locally-owned businesses, but also trying to work out some of these details, I think similar to Councilmember Brown, if, I, if I'm correctly summarizing, I'm interested in understanding a little bit more about that as well. And I know that's sort of, I think, my understanding of your hope for today. Okay. So if there aren't any more questions for 14.1, we'll go ahead and re ask 14.2 to present and then we'll go ahead and open up public comment on the item. S thank you.
give this back to Lisa? Or how it's a dark statement. Yeah. <laughs> Hello. Hi, Marcus. I just want to um, go ahead and before we begin your presentation, I was just sort of checking with our staff in regards to um, some of the items that need to be heard before us today and some of the ones that could be potentially deferred uh, action on from council. Uh, we are, um, as you can imagine, well behind in our agenda. And um, we have a couple items that need to uh, um, happen today, one of which is the item number 16, which is the CDBG um, item, and that I will recommend that we take up next. Um, I want to also state that item number 18, which is the census item, can likely be deferred until the next meeting, and I'm getting ahead not of confirming. We also have our uh, two additional items, item 15, um, and that is the general plan amendments, and my understanding is that could either be deferred until the next meeting or taken up at 7.30 this evening. Okay, and um, and then this evening we have two department presentations currently calendared. Um, I personally think that's really important for us to understand sort of the uh, pulse of where we're at from our departments in, in light of uh, our upcoming budget hearings. Um, but I'll go ahead and see if a council member wants to make a motion, which I believe needs to happen in regards to some of these items. Is that correct, City Attorney Kandati? Okay. Okay, so um, if there, if we could either, def so essentially what the motion would include is a motion to uh, defer the census item and to either defer the presentations or the general plan amendment item, item number 18 and item number 15. Um, is there a motion? Uh, Councilmember Glover. I'm just curious, um, with uh, item number 18, what's the timeline necessary for the 2020 census? Do we, ha do we have enough wiggle room to be able to reallocate that for the following agenda three weeks from now? Hi, Sarah Fleming, Principal Hello. Planner. Um, yes, we do. Uh, that is a resolution of support. I think in terms of the funding, if the council does wish to give staff direction to utilize that funding, we'd like to do it in this fiscal year. Mm -hmm. So getting that done this fiscal year would be ideal. Um, but the census itself doesn't start until next year. Okay. So we do have some wiggle room on the resolution. Okay, great. Then I would make the motion that in the interest of time that we reschedule items 15 <clears throat> and item 18 to the following City Council agenda. Okay, so it's the motion to reschedule items 18 and item 15 to uh, an upcoming City Council meeting. I'll second it. Okay, motion by Councilmember Glover, seconded by Councilmember, I'm sorry, Vice Mayor Cummings. Any further discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? That passes unanimously with Councilmember Matthews. Um, oh, I'm sorry. You're did you vote, did yeah. you vote in support? Okay, with Councilmember Matthews voting from the side. Okay, so uh, for, just for the benefit of those who may be in the room uh, wanting to uh, address the council on, on those items, I wanted to make sure that you're aware that we will likely not get to a few of them. So at this time, what we'll have is our uh, CDBG item before us after we conclude the cannabis item, and then we'll return for our um, department presentations for the evening session. Okay, thank you very much. Please, Marcus. All right, so Marcus Pimentel, your finance director. In October 2018, the city council directed staff to return with the fiscal impact of if rates were reduced, what was the impact would be. Um, we've since met with the industry a couple times, many of them who are here in the room, um, and they've been very helpful, very informative, very candid, very uh, support, um, insightful in, in the knowledge of the industry. It's, it's a place that we don't have, you know, we, our, our little finance group, we don't have practical experience in the industry, the, the retail market, the cultivation market, the testing labs. It, it, it's, it's, it's an incredibly challenging place. And then you add in all the complexities of state, federal issues, um, permitting, it's just a complicated zone. And so we don't have, we recognize we, this is not a place where we have, we feel we have great subject matter expertise. And by way of example, I think you received an email that perfectly outlined some of the industry's concerns with the tax rate structure. And you know, it was very thoughtful in the email and, the, and they, their numbers come out to be 1% uh, is about 240,000. You know, our numbers are 1% is 175,000. I would tend to trust their numbers. You know, it's, it's just a space we don't have really great insight into. Nonetheless, getting to the point, in October 2018, council asked us to come back with a fiscal impact if we reduced rates. 
Um, we, we, we believe our numbers show about $175,000 per 1% rate reduction. Right now, the city cannabis business tax is an 8% rate. Under a couple scenarios we just plopped in here, if we reduce the rate from 8% to 3% retail, it could be about an $875,000 annual loss in, to the general fund. Not factor, this is before factoring in other bonus things that might happen. If rate reductions goes down, maybe there's a change in consumer behavior. It's hard for us to see that being a material impact with the heavy burden of the state fees and tax systems. But it's not always one for one, we recognize that. If there's, if we followed a, a rate model that, for example, the county of Santa Cruz has, they have a 7% retail rate and a 5% rate for manufacturing and cultivation, which would bring our rates down from eight to seven for retail and eight to five for manufacturing and cultivation. We think that could be about a $200,000 annual loss to the general fund, <laughs> again, from a revenue perspective. In the staff report, we try to outline some of our thinking behind, we don't see an immediate dynamic change in the market from our rate structure, <laughs> but we're, we don't, we recognize we don't have the subject matter expertise to really articulate what that would be. So, you know, it's just really hard for us. When we make phone calls to our peers, um, there's just not a lot of uh, great information from our peers in this industry. And we just also truthfully really struggle with resources and time commitments and all the other things we're working on. So our, our the recommendation is that we absolutely support and have heard that the, the, the state level of fees and taxes is, is really large. And maybe we're biased, we feel these businesses are in our community, um, we're supporting them. They're also dealing with our own, own uniqueness of how we wanna um, regulate and process. So locally, we, we have a lot of, we spend a lot of our resource time locally at the local level with, with the business operations. And yet the state has a huge heavy tax burden on them which puts pressure on us to lower our revenue, but yet we, we're the ones who are supporting or dealing with or helping or supporting whatever. We're spending a lot of staff time in that. So we clearly recognize that and support that the state consider reducing the rates. There's, every year there's been a couple bills that have supported that measure. We also, maybe it's a little bias 2.0. The state's in a position where they have surpluses. We're not. And so we feel they're positioned structurally and uh, politically to be able to do that. We also want to affirm a couple of years ago, the city council established a children's fund. The, at that point in time, they raised the rate from seven to 8% and that additional 1% was set up to be a children's fund. So we just want to make it clear and transparent that it isn't that eighth percent that is the children's fund, it's 12.5%. It's essentially one eighth of the tax base. So going forward, one eighth of the tax base would be set aside in the children's fund. It could be interpreted maybe loosely that if we dropped a rate from eight to seven, the children's, children's fund wouldn't apply. I mean, I'm not sure. That's how we read it. We just wanna be absolutely clear and transparent with that. Second recommendation. Our third recommendation is to recognize that it's, however you define regionally, cities in the county, Monterey County, Santa Cruz County, Monterey County, San Benito, Santa Cruz County, the greater Central California, all California, there's a, 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 greater, a greater good that comes out when we have a regionalized tax system. Uh, sales tax is a, a bad example of that where industries, uh, government agencies have fought for and provided rebates and incentives to attract businesses to relocate from point A to point B. The businesses sit back and just wait for those rebates to come and then jump ship. And we don't wanna create that type of paradigm. So our third recommendation is to work, try to work collaboratively locally. So Capitola will be looking at the rate structure. The county is poised to raise rates. So we wanna have a, a regional conversation about a regional rate structure that makes sense. It also makes sense for our consumers and businesses who are working across boundaries and dynamically where does Santa Cruz in and Live Oak be in. Um, so those are our three recommendations and I can go down into some more details that we have in some, a few slides just to support it. Just as a, you know, none of our recommendations would impact the lower 1% and 2% rates that's already established for testing and distribution. Certainly whatever is happening, those rates are staying the same for the time being. Um, so why? So I'm, I'm also, I'm the finance director and we're feeling pressured in the general fund and, and I know council members haven't seen this and some of these numbers are still being finessed into the final budget that will be released any day now. But this is one of the various scenarios we're looking at right now if, you know, things that could be possible. The left chart is our deficit position or so our net operating results in the general fund. And the right chart is fund, is our fund balance, our total available um, fund balance resources. We're facing, at some level, uh, increasing deficits as we roll out into the 
out years. Uh, we have been projecting these for a while. We've got measures in place, but more recently costs are, are going up faster than we have resources and strategies. So there's more work to be done. So we're feeling a lot of pressure to offset future deficits. And we're also looking at our cash balances that are pretty good, but they deplete fast, really quickly if we don't, if we don't act now. So those are some of the pressures of just considering a major rate reduction. Much of this you might already know better than I do, and, and certainly the industry better than, than us. We just thought we'd touch on just a, a brief recap of where we've been. Uh, generally, our city voters voted to approve a tax rate of 10 percent. A council directed to increase it to 7 to 8 percent, that 1 percent increase going to the children's fund. Uh, the industry approached the city and staff and council members asking for relief on distribution and testing, recognizing those are good businesses and good local businesses and good jobs. The rates were reduced uh, down to one to 2%. A council in October directed staff to return with a cost impact. A staff have met with industry a couple different times and also uh, collaborated locally with other taxing agencies to understand where, where they're at. Um, we as staff, we as a finance department, me as a finance director still don't have a lot of confidence in how to project and understand the impacts of A equals B. Um, in much of our other revenue sources, whether it's water funds or enterprise funds, general fund taxes, we have that level of appreciation and understanding. This is still a dynamic place that, that, that's tough for us. Um, we found with the, going sideways a little bit, when vacation rentals became a, a bigger thing, we all had a lot of conversations about vacation rentals, it was a new market to us. And it was once we started getting into the market really from our audit lens and we started tapping on doors and opening up records and meeting with uh, vacation rental properties and finding them, that we really got an intimate understanding of how the Airbnb, VRBO, and all those intimate, complicated websites work. We, we, we think equally the same when the cannabis industry has applied for the permits. You know, it's knowledge that at some point in time we'll going to be starting audit programs. Um, once those audit programs start, we'll, we'll get some more insight into that. We're not moving aggressively to that space, but it is a space that we recognize that will probably be the place where we start seeing some more familiarity with it. And, and in the meantime, we're dependent on relying with our industry to help, help us understand. Um, so our, our next steps would be um, ideally, you know, these are dates I put out there candidly that we would like to, by April 30th, because of the timeliness, get out letters of support, um, recognize that AB 2286 is a good bill and, and try to get our support behind that. Uh, return no later than September 2019 with what we're hearing from a regional approach. Uh, and uh, uh, move forward with an RFP process to help find us uh, industry resource to help start us a, an audit program to re be able to review and understand what's going on in the, in the market. Um, those are what we think to be our logical next steps, again, subject to what else comes up that might slow us down. City Manager. I just wanted to add a little bit more background related to the recommendation on the regional approach. So uh, last week, the uh, City Selection Committee uh, met. The City Selection Committee is a committee made up of the chair of the Board of Supervisors and the mayors of the all the cities in the county. Uh, its primary purpose is to uh, make appointments to regional entities um, and uh, also just discuss various regional issues. And so this issue of taxation was on the agenda. Uh, the committee discussed uh, uh, whether to take a regional approach to ta taxation and uh, unanimously agreed that it would make sense for the jurisdictions to work together to review taxation and to develop recommendations before the individual jurisdictions make any adjustments. So I just wanted to sort of report out on that discussion and, and what action they, they took at the meeting on April 18th. Thank you for that. And having been at the meeting, I'll <coughs> second that. Go ahead. So then finishing this with some data and tables, because I'm a finance director and it's hard not to have a presentation about data and tables. Uh, we, we try to do an update of our rate comparisons, recognizing that we might be missing something, might not be the most current, what, what might be happening in the jurisdiction. But recently around us, looking at the county of Santa Cruz, Watsonville, Capitola, uh, Monterey County, and Salinas, the, the rates are, are across the board. Some agencies like the county and Salinas are poised for big increases. Salinas, I think, is going up to 10%. Uh, I believe it was in January 2020. Uh, they're poised to, to go up aggressively in their rates. The county will be going up slowly over the next several years. Uh, county of Monterey has some trigger increases that, that will also be happening. So that's the, the lay of the market as it currently stands, noting that there are many agencies that are signaling rates are going to be going up um, in the very near future. You know, I'm not sure that this is the way to set rates, saying we want to follow that model, but I think it's 
having more conversations, city select, whatever that might be, about what is the, the right reasonable model that addresses our local needs and, and provides a, a, a transparent playing field. Finally, we know we get this question a lot, our cannabis tax, where it's been and where it's going. Uh, so it started as a very small revenue stream and it's been growing, wish all revenues were growing at this pace, at the same level of percentage growth. We believe in 2020 our forecast might be a little aggressive, we recognize that. Uh, we have 1.9 million anticipating uh, expansion in certain types of businesses. Um, some of that is just, again, again, a wild guess on our part, an educated wild guess, but we recognize there's more work to be done on, that, on the right number for 2020. Um, so the bottom five lines are actuals where we were, where we think this year is gonna finish pretty credibly, and then the top line of 1.9 million, that's where we had our budget from about six months ago where we thought the revenue stream was going. Um, we're probably more leaning towards a pullback on that number just be candid, in our budget document, we're at 1.9 million, so there's a little bit of risk in that one. Um, that ends the presentation. Happy to go back and recap anything or certainly be available for questions. Questions, Council Member Cook? What's the, the, the difference between Monterey and Santa Cruz? How did that happen, do you know? Um, maybe Catherine knows what's going on there. I don't know. Do, do they limit, I'm assuming they don't limit their licenses or do they? Actually, uh, do you know the, the number? Every jurisdiction caps their retail. Every jurisdiction caps their retail according to the industry. You're now the industry. Um, I, I know when I looked into this issue last fall, um, Monterey County had just lowered their rates and I think um, when they started, m m almost all of the jurisdictions I looked at did a similar ordinance to ours where it was up to 10%. A couple of them were, I think Santa Barbara was up to 20%. And um, a lot of the ones that started out very high, you know, if they had up to 10% or up to 20% and set them towards the top, a lot of them came down um, in the last year. Um, and Monterey was one of them. They had come down, I think, pretty pretty recently when, when I reported to you in, I think it was October or November. Um, Selena, uh, Capitola is new. They've just um, allowed retail. And so um, they just set it at seven. And I think um, Santa Cruz County had just lowered the cultivation and manufacturing last year, and they're um, at 5% now. They're going up to 6%, and I think uh, they were gonna be 5% for two years, 6% for two years, and then it was gonna go to seven and stop. Um, I don't remember Salinas. I wouldn't mind hearing from the public when it's time. Um, what? If, if, for example, the city recommended lowering the tax and things got better and better and better, was there a trigger mechanism that other cities are possibly using for the city then to uh, recoup some of the, the benefits that you all have by us lowering the tax so you can make it in the business, but then later on down the line after you're making it, is there any way of the city recouping um, some of that money? Are there any questions for uh, staff at this time? Because if not, then we'll go ahead and open it up to the public. Any additional questions? Um, off the topics of the, the taxation rates, and I imagine there will be people want to weigh in on that. I guess I'm confused, and it hasn't been addressed yet, so I'll ask it here. In the uh, staff report, the agenda report, um, the fiscal impact related to a decision that we make on taxation rate changes is um, is suggested, but there's no fiscal impact related to um, the RFP proposal recommendation to go out and, and ask for industry um, consultant to help us sort through some of this. So what, I just wanna know what we're looking at on that. Uh, that that's a to be determined. If, you, some, if we're going down a path of using the consultant only for the purpose of setting up an audit program and being able to start randomly doing occasional audits. Generally, their audits 
recover the fees so there may not be a direct cost for us. So it depends on the, the, the firm and the contract. So I think that would be something we report back once we start understanding who then who the players are in that industry and how those agreements work. Typically they're on a, they get a percent of what they find. Um, so there may not be a direct cost outlay, but we might not recover as much. So we'd have to report back to you on what that might be. So, so we would get a report back. My understanding is anything under $100,000, we don't necessarily hear about it because we don't have to weigh in. We'd, we'd be happy to, to, okay. to just let you know what's going on. We'll... Um, I'll leave it there for now with questions I want to hear from. Okay, unless there aren't any further questions at this time, we'll go ahead and open it up to the public to speak on this just item. Just one for the 12%. Uh, I'm just wondering why it's so important that we go to 12.5% of uh, for the Children's Fund rather than just 1%. Why, why is that uh, something that? Cause, cause it, it's effectively the same thing, but if we start lowering rates, we don't want a confusion that the children's fund was only the eighth percentage point. So when we went from seven to eight. Um, it's just, so if we lowered it to four and then 1% for children's funds, that's what you're trying to stop? So if we lowered it, we, they would children's fund wouldn't get any more money? I just months. want to be very transparent about it. The intent was at that point in time, one eighth of the revenue would be right, one percent. So yeah. maybe it's still 1%. Moves with the rate. You no, know, what the council approved was that the additional 1% increase would be allocated to the children's fund. Not 1%, but the additional 1%. So this just makes it so that it's proportionate so that uh, if for some reason you do adjust the rates, it, it, it doesn't become problematic. Right, so, so if it went down to four, you're saying we wouldn't get to have 1% be five total. Be less than that then. 12.5%. percent Are you trying to lock it in instead of just going with the 1%? <laughs> okay, I, 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 I get it. It's essentially equivalent f funding for it, no matter what the Maybe fluctuation. the council supports 1%, <laughs> even if we went down. And it would still, it would still, it would modify with the one percent or two. However, the count, the trend, the taxation rate might fluctuate. It will uh, the one percent, which represents uh, twelve point five percent of the total eight no, percent, no, I get it, but, will fluctuate but, with it, okay. essentially. So it's actually Let's make the motion writing the language more clearly. Um, I was just going to add that, for example, with the testing laboratories that are at 1% right now, that would mean 100% of the revenue coming in is going to the Children's Fund. So that's the situation that we were <coughs> aiming to address. Okay. Is there any member of the public who would like to address the council in one minute? Uh, briefly, uh, they are welcome to come forward first. If not, we'll go ahead and open up public comment for those that would like the full two minutes. Okay. Go right ahead. We'll go right into the two minutes, I'm assuming. Good afternoon. I'm Jim Coffus. I live in Ben Lomond, and I'm here on behalf of uh, Green Trade, which is a, an association of the licensed businesses in the throughout the county, in all sectors of the cannabis trade. And I trust that you all received the uh, recommendations and, and background that information that we shared. Uh, I'd like to make. Uh, Madam Mayor, one request perhaps. We had a number of uh, other business owners here, but uh, for one reason or another had to leave. And we're curious if it would uh, be possible to extend the time, the total time that uh, is available to uh, d direct our comments to each of these three or four major issues that you're considering. Uh, if I'm, I'm not sure if I'm clear on what you're uh, requesting. Well, uh, uh, some... Uh, some additional amount of time to either uh, answer questions or uh, present arguments above and beyond two minutes. For every member of the public interested in speaking well, or for those that are representing industry? For those like that, that request it at least. Okay, so we'll do uh, two minutes, three minutes for those that are requesting the additional time on behalf of industry, two minutes for those that are not representing industry. Is that feel, that feels accurate to me that's since we're priority. significantly behind that's schedule. I feel like very that's thoughtful. fair. Thank so you'll have up to three minutes then. Okay, so uh, I'll try to, be, try to be quick and see what I can uh, touch on as fast as I can. First of all, um, I want to c correct a couple of things that were said that, you know, for no fault of anybody's, but just because this is such a uh, dynamic, fast-growing, fast-moving uh, new uh, endeavor, one that's never occurred in my lifetime, and so therefore I would guarantee it's never occurred in your lifetime where we've taken something uh, as big as this and tried to 
tried to make it uh, fit it into a regulatory system of some sort. So to date, about 100 jurisdictions in the state have tackled this in one way or another. As far as the uh, issuance of licenses, the retail licenses, in every case it's been a competitive uh, situation. In other words, they've never uh, just said, you got a license, you got a license. It was always, uh, you had to apply and there was some set of criteria. I think the city of Santa Cruz had some of the best conditions that they look for when they chose among the, I think you had 13 applicants for your licenses. <coughs> You set conditions and then you judge the applicants based upon the conditions that you set. And, and a lot of the other jurisdictions have done similar things. Uh, one that I found interesting was no one ever did a, uh, a real vetting of the capitalization of any of these applicants because that turns out to be probably the most significant one was how much money did they have in the bank uh, in order to, to uh, sustain a business of this sort. But that be said, that was one mistake that I wanted to clear up. There was uh, another which was uh, about the, uh, the projections and the difference in what the tax uh, revenue may or may not be based upon what percentage you, say, you set it. Obviously, uh, if you set the tax at 8%, you're going to take in more revenue than if you set the tax at 5%. Uh, that isn't really the question. The question becomes at what point can you um, in, encourage the consumer to use the regulated market as opposed to the illicit market? Right now there are uh, estimates that 80% of the consumer dollars are spent outside of the regulated market. So those are at zero tax. So the 20% that is set inside the regulated market is at 8%. So if you move that rate down, certain amount of the unregulated uh, consumers are going to move in, so they're uh, likely to be an, uh, an increase in, in revenue from that source, because, specifically because you changed the tax rate. Now, as far as trying to project, I, was, uh, I would suggest that without knowing... Okay, am with, I done? The, with the three minutes, uh, Bonnie. Okay, thank okay. you. Thank but, you. But we know you're here if we have yeah. questions. So we could have the industry, those that are representing the industry to come forward first and you'll have up to three minutes to speak on behalf of the industry. Hello, I'm Nicole Lagner and I'm an attorney with Clark Newbert. We're a woman-owned small business with an office in the city of Santa Cruz. We represent cannabis businesses across the state and do a lot of regulatory compliance and policy work. Um, I agree with what Mr. Koff has said. I personally have worked on 15 applications in the last year in various jurisdictions, West Hollywood, San Francisco, um, all over LA, and they're always competitive and they're always limited in re reference to retail. So that is not unique to the city of Santa Cruz. I think most jurisdictions realize that was an important thing to do. Also, real estate and setbacks are kind of self-limiting for those types of businesses. There's just not enough real estate. So. Um, I think that this entire issue has not been framed correctly. Um, and again, I, it, I have so much respect for Catherine and Mike. They've worked really hard to know and understand these issues. So um, with due respect, it's not transferability, it's change in ownership. If you read the state license, the reason that they have that is that inevitably managers or equity owners are going to change. So it was a little bit glossed over in the presentation tonight that part of the definition of proprietor is a manager, a manager with control over the day-to-day -day operations. So as, as written on its face, the city of Santa Cruz would require the one person whose name on the license to self-fund and do all of the management activities of the business. That is completely impossible and unrealistic. So when it says, in the report to possibly change you know, the ownership threshold from 10% to 20%, the conversation doesn't start there. It, it's, that is the threshold of who is an owner versus a financial interest holder if you're using the terms from the state. So that is saying, okay, if you're an owner of this business, you have to be live scanned, you have to submit a lot of information to the city of Santa Cruz if you own X amount percent, or you're a manager of this business, we need to know who you are and we need to vet you. Now, 
if someone dies, um, if they want to take on equity partners, or they've worked really hard, like all of these business owners in the city of Santa Cruz are longtime cannabis business owners, and they have built this industry. If they want to sell their business because they grew it, what is the problem with that if the city of Santa Cruz is able to vet the new, quote, owners? That's why every jurisdiction has a process to do that. Capitola, Santa Cruz County, Monterey, every county has a form and a way to to do this. So we encourage you to take on a process so that you have transparency and you know who the business operators are rather than trying to limit what these people can do. They have a lot of competition out there statewide <laughs> and if they can't compete with the businesses that every other jurisdiction can raise equity, they're not going to survive. Thank you. Oh, good timing. Okay, next speaker. Hello, hello. I prepared a statement. <laughs> So thank you for bringing the cannabis items forward. Um, I do look forward to the discussion and decisions made today. We'll start with the taxes. Uh, we do need to align our tax rates with the context of today, not from 2014 when they were originally set. In terms of financial projections, uh, three additional retailers are opening up uh, on top of many new other local cannabis businesses and other sectors of the industry. That was also failed to mention uh, in the staff report. So all those retailers will be providing a tremendous amount more tax revenue uh, in, this, in this fiscal year. Uh, regional structure sounds great, but cooperating with multiple bureaucracies is completely impractical. Everyone in this room knows that. Um, that could take years. We've been waiting years already. Been sitting here for two years waiting. Most regional jurisdictions have reduced their tax rates, in fact, including Oakland from 10% to 5% and Monterey. They were up at 6%. They dropped it down to 4% last year. San Francisco is actually at 0% and they have a tax holiday for a couple years. They know they need to get the industry off the ground. With respect to ownership modifications, dozens of jurisdictions in the state have had a merit-based application, as the previous two folks mentioned. Uh, they've had a process, and they've since augmented their ownership rules. Every jurisdiction in the state limits the number of licenses for retail. There are many viable options for how this could be done in a fair manner. I don't think that's all gonna come out today. I think we do need to take some more time here and understand the needs of the industry, slow down a little bit, and actually look at the nuanced industry and what options are available. The state is in control of the California market, and having special rules only for Santa Cruz City puts us at a distinct disadvantage, especially when county rules and state rules allow for flexible ownership. If we can't have that same thing in the city of Santa Cruz, there's a disparity. Our current ownership rules do not allow for investment whatsoever. Adjusting the 10% threshold to let's say 49% really effectively doesn't do anything. And I understand in policy making sometimes it can feel like a change is going to actually affect positively, uh, but sometimes on the ground it works completely different. And, and again, I'd like to be able to have that conversation. We need your help in adjusting ownership rules in order to continue generating the substantial tax revenues that we do. We recently opened our new Ocean Street location by borrowing as much money as we could from our friends and from our family, but now we need a plan to pay that back. We're competing in an oversaturated market with the highest density of dispensaries per capita in the state, and we're on an uneven playing field with the 12 retailers in the county. Our rules allow no path of succession. What if I got hit by a truck? Everything I've ever built for my family and my two children technically has no value, and my business dies with me, it's unworkable. What about the 93 families that my business supports? They are without a job the very next day. So I believe our business should have full flexibility in our ownership, in our ownership percentages, and I urge this council to discuss non-binary solutions. Thank you for your consideration. Uh, hi, Pat Malo. I'm the executive director of Green Trade. I think everyone got our recommendations. Um, I'm also I have the pleasure of serving on the WAM board. Um, Valerie Corral, our executive director and founder, was here earlier. She has a sick mother she um, to go take care of, and so she asked me to read a couple things or summarize. Um, first, she wants to thank you guys, um, and I do too, for the swift action on the creation of a local equity program. I think that is exactly in lines with our history of leading the cannabis issue, and hopefully we can have more discussions on what to encourage those folks. Um, and then <clears throat> Val makes the point that of kind of the effects of high taxation. And first thing is it reduces access. Um, you know, 
by increasing these costs, we pass them on to, you know, not just recreational consumers, but people who are using it for health reasons, right? Um, and so that obviously has an impact on profit as well. But I want to remind you, and Val wants to remind you, that profit for every organization doesn't look the same. And profit in the WAM model is any extra goes literally into the bodies of the sick and poor who desperately need it. And I don't need to bring up the relevance to the last issue of that, but Val likes to say we are all one illness away from homelessness. And in that situation, that we need organizations like WAM to be able to provide this free medicine. Um, you know, and so ultimately, you know, we can consider all these things from a business perspective, or we can consider it from what I got into cannabis for is to, you know, provide medicine for people who can't provide it for themselves and to, you know, to say it bluntly, to end the racist drug war, right? And so as we're considering these tax rates, we need to consider what type of industry we're trying to encourage and figure out a way to get there. And so, you know, to kind of take off my wham hat and just talk as a community member. Um, you know, I've grown up in Santa Cruz, never intended on living anywhere else, desperately trying to stay like everyone. And I've watched the old medical system and all my friends who were still able to stay here, employed or as business owners in that old legal medical system, which Santa Cruz was leading in. Now, after legalization, they're having to, you know, figure out whether they want to be criminals or not. And that's a very sad situation. I am lucky enough to have several friends who also grew up here, who are in this room, who are still somehow owning businesses locally. And I want to make sure that they stay. And you know, I'm also a member of CPP, Community Prevention Partners, and there's nobody here to represent them. Our, um, you know, Thing with CPP, our motto is keep it small, keep it local. We need to ensure local businesses survive so we don't have corporate ownership. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. And I believe you're representing industry as well? Yes. Okay, so you'll have up to three minutes and then we'll open it up unless there's any other industry representatives. Your industry as well? Okay. And then you'll be the last on behalf of industry for the additional three minutes and then we'll have the two minute time. Go ahead. Hi. Thank you and uh, <clears throat> thank you everybody for taking and still listening to us. I know it's been a long day for, for everybody here. Uh, my name is Jacob Lagner. I was awarded one of the uh, cannabis retail licenses by the city. Uh, my store is set uh, to open this summer on Ocean Street, uh, Reefside. Um, I'm also the CEO for Oz Distribution, uh, located in the city. And today I lend my support um, <clears throat> for the motion submitted by Green Trade. Uh, to make the necessary changes to the ordinance regarding the definition of uh, proprietor and uh, the related re re uh, revisions to allow for my business to function as any other corporation uh, that can raise funding through equity, enter into strategic partnerships, <clears throat> and hire managers for my store. Um, as written, the ordinance seems to require me to personally fund and manage all aspects of the business. Uh, which would be impossible for me to accomplish. Um, the revisions drafted by Green Trade and their attorneys complement the state process through which the licensee uh, provides the information and background checks of any new managers or equity owners be beyond a certain threshold. Um, this is a benefit for the city. Uh, it's not a, de a detriment as it maintains the transparency and allows the businesses to thrive and operate with the sophistication they deserve, um, creating more revenue for the city, uh, more jobs and other benefits to the community. Um, as a CEO of Oz Distribution, um, you know, I see a lot of businesses out there. Uh, we work with 370 dispensaries uh, across the state and uh, it's an extremely competitive environment and uh, I believe that we deserve the same um, tools that dispensaries are allowed in other jurisdictions as well. So I request that you vote today uh, to amend the ordinance pursuant to the motion uh, provided the thoughtful uh, document that was provided by Green Trade. Thank you. Okay.
Hello, Troy Bookout with Santa Cruz Roots. Um, I am an owner operator of a cultivation site here in Santa Cruz. I'm also really nervous uh, talking in public, so do my best. Um, it's really hard, I'm born and raised here. We're a self-funded operation and um, we're up against a lot. Um, one of those things is the state and being in compliance. Um, I understand that the city of Santa Cruz needs to make some money off of the cannabis industry as a whole. And I'm just hoping that that can be adjusted down, even if it's temporarily, um, to the recommendation by Green Trade, which is uh, 32200. Um, as a cultivator, we're paying 8% right now. Dropping it down to 2% of gross would uh, significantly benefit us and allow us to stay in business. Um, thank you. Oh, and thank you so much for uh, dealing with the homeless issue. I know it's a really potent and intense issue, so thank you. So now we'll go ahead and open it up to folks not uh, representing industry, but wanting to speak to this item, and you'll have up to two minutes. Uh, NateAlex.Kennedy at gmail.com. The big thing that we seem to be missing here is everybody's talking about cannabis as marijuana, but what about industrial hemp? Why have we not heard more about this from the city? What we need is to change the regulations so that people can grow basically as much as they possibly can and maybe put some restrictions in, say a quarter of a percent THC in the final plant. You know, I think it should be higher, more like 1% for the city just because the pollination from blowing in from anywhere can, can pretty quickly change that around. But hemp is something that can be made into virtually anything. The shoes I'm wearing right now are hemp. And uh, the pants I had a while ago were hemp and I wore them every day till they fell apart and I couldn't keep using them. Um, I, it's one of those things we could be, in fact, before 1937, when marijuana was outlawed, cannabis was one of the key ingredients in almost or even more than 90% of all medications that you would find at the pharmacy. These days, the pharmacy can't even sell you this stuff. Um, the, from an industrial hemp point, it can be made into clothes, paper. Uh, Henry Ford, in 1937, had shown a hemp car to the world, and right after he showed it to the world, it got outlawed. I think he showed it in 1936, but it ran off hemp seed oil. So we don't even need to be using petrochemical oils that are destroying the entire environment. We could be running off of hemp seed oil, which would be grown from an organic source that would actually provide more oxygen, not take it away. If we had completely legal industrial hemp, we wouldn't need to be tearing down the rainforests in foreign countries all over the world just to make into Thank you. Into houses here. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Our next speaker. My name is Ernestina Saldana, one more time. And um, as I was here uh, waiting to talk about uh, the uh, issue with homelessness, Valerie Corral um, asked me to come and talk. Um, on her name. I am a member of the One Collective, and uh, let me tell you why I am a member of the One Collective. I can go and get my fentanyl or my hydrocodone anytime I need it, and I pay one dollar for that. Being a low-income person receiving Medicare, that's my copayment for that common kind of medication. And I used to do it that way, and uh, what happened was that every time I was on need or more and more doses. I have multiple fractures in my body as a result of a car accident 30 years ago. So um, I'm here to ask you to consider to lower the tax for medical marijuana because people living with social security, which is the ones who need most of the time the medical marijuana, cannot uh, pay a lot of money. I live, my income is $900 per month, and with that I had to pay my rent, my bills, and help my two daughters at college when needed. Um, if you have a uh, big tax, 
even for free product, as uh, one provided me with, okay, I will have to pay tax on that product. And that is um, onerous in people who has a very limited uh, income. So please consider that uh, um, proposition and thank you. We have one more member of the public who would like to address us on this item. You'll have up to two minutes. Good afternoon, I'm Scott Graham. Um, <laughs> uh, following up on what Ernestina was saying, medical marijuana should be without any tax. If you go to a pharmacy and you buy a prescription drug, there's no tax on it. So why are we taxing medical marijuana, especially now that recreational marijuana has this high tax? I would suggest removing the tax altogether from medical marijuana. Um, another issue is the number of outlets that you're allowing. How many alcohol outlets are there in the city of Santa Cruz? And why don't we just match that number? Um, in Oakland, they give priority to people that have been arrested for selling marijuana to get the marijuana licenses. And that may be a good direction to go here too. I would say if you lower the taxes, the revenues from taxation may increase because more people may be buying at the, at the, dis the distribution points. Whereas if you keep the tax high, more people are gonna keep on buying it at, in the gray market instead of buying it at the legitimate market. So I would suggest that you not only eliminate the tax on medical marijuana, but you also decrease the tax on legal marijuana so that there's just the people that have these businesses can stay in business. Right now, they have a lot of costs the gray market doesn't have. They have to pay for rent. They have to pay for security. They have to pay employees. They have to pay you know, um, workmen's compensation for their employees. These are all costs the gray market doesn't have. And the prices on the gray market keep on going down because of thank the legitimate market. Okay, your time is up. Okay, thank you. So at, at, at this time, we'll go ahead and close public comment on this item and we'll return back for action and deliberation. Um, having been sort of a part of the conversation, this is definitely an iterative process. And I just um, want to acknowledge that it's a, it's a changing industry and we're learning as we go. I also want to thank those that I know have been waiting to have this item come before us for their patience and waiting even longer this afternoon and sticking here um, after a, a long earlier item. Um, I, I just will say a couple of things, just because I can't make a motion sort of uh, in terms of my thoughts on this, and and you all uh, can, we can have the deliberation at that point. One of, of which is that uh, for the, for the uh, policy language around the children's fund, um, I wanna thank you for bringing that back. My only thought would be to, instead of having it reflect to ha be designed, designated for the creation and funding of a dedicated children's fund, just to take out creation and funding and just say for the purpose of the children's fund, that would be my request. Um, I think that having sat through the city select committee meeting recently in regards to the cannabis taxation question, um, I think it'll really be a, a great opportunity for us to think about how regionally we want to um, discuss this or learn and work within each other and not trying to go too far off base. I also recognize that, um, that for those that feel that this is way out of whack currently regionally that um, you know, it could make sense for me, I would support potentially going into alignment with the county's model um, in the interim of having a, a new sort of cannabis taxation structure um, created while the conversation about the regional uh, taxation rates w ensued, essentially. Um, so that would be my instinct. I would also just say that um, in terms of the, I, I, maybe it's more of a question, but you know, maybe just sort of understanding a little bit more about the uh, the investor conversation and proprietor, 
what does that look like um, regionally? It sounds like we're off there, but how do we also ensure what I think uh, what we all value in terms of our standards and ensuring that we maintain um, some some control over how we get uh, locally owned um, businesses without risking the potential, which I can imagine is probably pretty high for big business to come in and purchase um, these types of businesses and communities. Um, and so just more clarification on the state definition, is, is that what the regional uh, partners have? I don't know. So that would be something to explore along with what was originally discussed with Councilmember Brown's thoughts around um, the same topic and the licensing. Okay, so th those would just be sort of my few, my few comments on it and then I'll open it up for council uh, discussion and recommendations. My understanding is you're really hoping that we can move forward at this time with some guidance for you all to return back to us for action. Okay, so any council members uh, want to uh, share? Council member Matthews. I'll take the first item in 14.1, which was the ordinance amendment. Um, I had a little bit of a hard time slogging through the language, so I got a, um, a slight revision from the city attorney. If you look on the ordinance, it's page 14.16, that um, paragraph A at the very top, all commercial cannabis uses allowed within the city must be authorized pursuant to the procedures described, et cetera, et cetera. And then there's a long red line that I honestly couldn't make sense of. So it's simplified to say, delivery services performed by businesses located outside the city of Santa Cruz are not permitted within the city with or without a permit, except as otherwise required by state law. <laughs> So I, I would go ahead and just move that. I'll second that. So is that a motion? At yeah. the time? Are you, okay. I mean, I'm, I think we just take these things one at a time. One at a time. Okay. okay, great. So we'll go ahead and take that. Uh, that's his recommendation of the presentation of item 14.1, correct? Number one. Yes. Number one. 14.11. 14.11. Um, and that was a motion by Councilmember Matthews, seconded by Councilmember Myers to add that additional language to the ordinance. So what I, the, the language motion? then the motion actually, I was just reading the language change, but the motion would be introduced for publication, the proposed amendments to part 14 of chapter 24.2 of the Santa Cruz Municipal Code, restricting cannabis delivery services within the city of Santa Cruz by outside delivery services, only to the extent, uh, permitting them only to the extent uh, uh, required by state laws or regulations and also conditional on the delivery service business obtaining a city by business license and paying applicable taxes and fees. That makes sense yeah. to me. Okay, do we want to take these items one at a time and vote on them at that time? Is that the consensus yeah. of the council? I'm seeing head nods. Okay, is there a discussion on the motion on the floor? Council Member Crone and then Council Member Lever. Um, just a question about deliveries. That, that's already started. We, we, anybody in the state can deliver to Santa Cruz? Right, as of January 16th. <coughs> and um, I don't know, I'd like to hear from somebody in, in the industry, how has that affected Santa Cruz? I mean, what are you seeing? What, what, what you know, I'm without, maybe the lawyer person that was uh, spoke I think earlier. I, before we do that, I think I just want to be mindful of time because we have uh, another item that is actually now I think about two or three hours behind what was originally designed for, as well as evening session and oral communications. I think this is definitely gonna be a process where we can get more information from industry and have those conversations, but as opposed to an ongoing dialogue at this point, it would be my preference that we postpone that. And honestly, mine is only simplified language. Right. <laughs> I, I would like to also add, if I could, as part of the motion that uh, we give, uh, and maybe we can't do it now, city attorney, you can tell me support AB 1530 regarding local access for um, local control of delivery services and join the legal challenge to uh, the current state Are you, regulations. Before, before Should we, those be separate? Before we do that, I'll just go ahead and acknowledge Councilmember Glover was next to speak. You yeah, thank you. I haven't finished my questions yet. I had two more so questions. We can go ahead and postpone that yeah. then. For um, time. The, the medical marijuana, do you know if there's a tax, if anybody else has that in the state and have they relieved them of taxes? I believe this, it's actually exempt from the state tax. I'm, uh, my now, I, I knew the original um, proposition very, very well. There's since been a lot of regulation that's gone in and I don't know it, but I, I believe that's the case. Okay, and my other question was, do we know how much has come into the children's fund so far? 
We've got 60,000 allocated uh, available for use currently. Is it is it already earmarked or is it no, waiting? No. Okay, thank you. I'll just add, if I may, because we had a city schools meeting yesterday, we met to discuss uh, current needs, gaps, and ways to move forward with the children's fund allocation recommendation, knowing that that um, entity was designated to be sort of the oversight of, of the fund. So that should be forthcoming. Councilmember Glover? So there's clarity who decides on where the money for the children's fund goes? The, the city council will decide ultimately where the money goes, but the city school's city committee is the committee that is, as experts, are looking at needs and how a process could ensue in regards to how those resources are allocated to meet the needs of early childhood education, prevention, and vulnerable youth populations. Right. They'll return with a recommendation. Okay, cool. And then the other thing was just clarifying, because um, as she was referencing it, I was pulling uh, the red line version up on my page, but um, uh, Councilmember Matthews, would you mind just clarifying which section you're talking about yeah. with the revision? Yeah, it's just that very first one, A. A, okay. And the red line, I just confessed, I couldn't make sense of it as written. So uh, it's rewritten, um, revised to say, delivery services performed by businesses located outside the city of Santa Cruz are not permitted within the city with or without a permit, except as otherwise required by state law. Simplifying. Mm -hmm. Okay. City Attorney, did you have an ad? Um, I, I have a follow-up uh, comment, but I think it can wait. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. <coughs> okay. Is, that your, is that the question? Okay. So did you want to now add to the original motion in regards to um, what if it's permissible can... to do it at this time, I'd like to also have the city go in support of AB 1530, uh, uh, state bill currently in the works, uh, which would support local control of delivery services and also to join uh, the legal challenge to state regulations uh, restricting local control, um, uh, joining League of California Cities and other jurisdictions. That was what my comment was going to be directed mm -hmm. to, and my recommendation would be to um, to direct that that be agendized yeah, for council fine. action at a future meeting. Yeah, that's okay. fine. Yeah. Okay, so that is um, directing that. Okay, yeah. a component of the motion which would be directed to come forward at a future meeting. So this is again 14.11, and we can, um, unless there's any further conversation on this element, we can go ahead and take the vote on that. Okay, so all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, that passes unanimously with uh, Councilmember Brown, um, who had just stepped out. Okay, so that moves us on to 14.22, 14, I'm sorry, 14.12, <laughs> which is the second um, element to the agenda report, which is to provide direction on to staff on whether to propose amendments to the cannabis retail license ordinance to allow for the transfer of cannabis retail licenses and whether to uh, change the definition of proprietor to allow original applicants to add investors to the approved retail business. And if I could, before we jump into that discussion for clarity, um, from the agenda report, it appears that the uh, staff at, at minimum suggested what would make sense in this regard without further kind of investigation would be um, to, to simply change our definition to align with the state. Is that correct? That, that was an easy one, yeah. Okay. Okay, thank you for that. Any further discussion or action to be proposed on this component of 14.1? Councilor Myers, and then okay. Go ahead. Counts oh, right. I'll I'll make a motion unless there's any other comments. Um, I would like to provide direction to staff um, to. Uh, evaluate proposed amendments to the cannabis retailer license ordinance um, at this time and to come into um, alignment with the state definition of proprietor. I think that this um, based, so that will be my motion. And I guess my follow-up comment is just that this is a complicated and um, uh, I, I feel like we, we need to hear more from the industry and I think uh, staff direction at this time is appropriate uh, uh, to, to continue to evaluate this. Okay, motion by Councilmember Myers. I'll go ahead and second that motion. Further discussion, Councilmember Glover. Uh, just with regards to some of the suggestions that were provided by Green Trade specifically on this item and then also from what we heard from Ms. Lagner, is that how you say it? 
Lag Lagner, as I said. Yeah, so Ms. Lagner uh, brought up the issue of the need for there to be the potential change of ownership. And so I don't know what timeline is associated with your motion, Councilmember Myers. I'll just say that this um, entire item, in addition to the other um, component of the item, is further direction for staff to explore and then return at a future time. Um, as my understanding, it's no, there's no real urgency either way. There's no real set timeline. Is oh. that correct? In terms of the ask from the staff? Um, there's no urgency on my part. The industry might disagree. I, I was going to say, from my conversations I've had okay. with people from the industry, there is a sense of urgency because if something were to happen in these tomorrow, then their business could be at jeopardy with regards to the investments they've made or their ability to gain capital. So I was just wondering with your motion, do you have a timeline associated with asking staff to come back or is it just an open-ended comeback whenever? I guess I would defer. I, I don't want I don't want it, this to disappear for a year. Uh, I, I guess I'm looking to see can planning fit this in and and how quickly could could this evaluation be done? Um, it would be difficult to get it back to you before your July break. Um, I believe Marcus had a suggestion on when he was coming back with some September. in September. So it makes sense to me to come back at the same time. Okay, thank you, really appreciate that. And thank you, Councilmember Myers, for clarifying. Um, yeah, uh, there is this language here, so uh, is that something that you would include in your motion or that's uh, insinuated, is that they would review the recommendations coming from industry and then come back with their recommendations from that industry recommendation or just them doing general research? What was? My motion is to uh, come, into, come into alignment with the state definition uh, which would be to set the definition of proprietor at a percentage of 20% interest. Uh, and uh, then I would direct staff to evaluate the continued definition um, as has been brought forward by, by the industry, uh, specifically regarding um, the description of managerial interests uh, such that there could be alignment with, with the actual operational capacity of the business, uh, so that would be, and I would like to see if we can get this done soon. <laughs> so for clarification, it seems yeah. that if I may, that this, yeah. the state change could probably happen pretty quickly while the other types of conversation take place. Okay. And, and just to clarify, is that including, I mean, you mentioned the definition of management, so in this provided version from the representatives from Green Trade, it talks about a managerial interest shall be deemed to exist when a person participates in the direction, <laughs> control, or management of the business, including a general partner. So are you talking about that language? Yeah, as that's well? their language in 16, 6.91.020. Right, and then, um, and then also there in the event of the sale or other transfer stuff, so including that in the conversation as well, just so for clarity. I believe that it, it aligns with looking at the retailer license ordinance at this point. So that would be evaluated then. Both of these things would be evaluated. Okay, great. Yeah, I just want to make sure that the recommendations from the industry, granted, I'm sure that may have been insinuated, are just clear, clear that uh, to look at both their suggestions for revisions in 6.91.020 and the following section with the definition or rather clarification the event of sale or transfer with the business or operators covered by the license, et cetera, as per provided by Green Trades. If that's in there, then I can. Yeah, I mean, yeah, we okay. could we Explore. could clarify it. It's submitted on April 23rd from Green Trade, the, the letter and the communications. Okay, great. Um, Councilmember Brown. Okay, so that was one of my, I don't want to wordsmith your motion here, um, but so that was one of the things that I wanted to just make sure was clarified and confirmed here. And then, um, I mean, could could we say for the sake of uh, clarity to staff um, to immediately re, uh, realign align the um, definition of proprietor with the state's definition of 20% immediately and to return as per, uh, you know, with all the other language, um, uh, with, with uh, discussion recommendations, no later than September 
2019, which seemed to be acceptable by, to staff in alignment with the other return date recommended on the tax. I accept those. Okay. Thanks. Mm -hmm. So there's no further discussion on 14.12. We'll go ahead and move us along to 14.2. So all those in favor of the motion made by Councilmember Meyer, seconded by myself, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? That passes unanimously. <laughs> Thank you, Catherine. So we'll go ahead and move on to the additional item on the cannabis tax rate policy discussion. <coughs> Excuse me. And I see three um, elements here. Are, uh, do council members have any questions um, at this time in regards to 14.2, um, the presentation by uh, uh, finance, uh, our finance director here? Council Member Crum. In the, um, the projections that you had, Marcus, uh, was that 1.9 that you were projecting for 2020? Yes. Was the um, medical marijuana included in that? Yeah, it's, it's our total tax base as it currently stands with some expansion expected in the industry. Could you come back to us and what if we didn't include medical marijuana? How do you even, um, how do you project? There is no, they're not selling anything right now, right? I mean, they haven't been selling anything or is there, are they up and running their business? I that's just wham. Yeah. Uh, just wham, yeah. Medical, medical marijuana, marijuana is, is sold by all of our retailers. Oh, they are, okay. Um, and I know. don't believe at this time when they submit their taxes, they differentiate they do. between medical and, and non. Okay. Well, I, could we find out if, what that would, how would that would affect the, our um, sales, uh, our re the revenue that comes into the city if we, you know, did not tax medical marijuana? I don't believe unless planning has something, we don't possess any data on that. We'd have to default totally to the industry and have them produce that for us. Thanks. Provide the financial records or something like that. Councilor McLaughlin. I'd like to just ask if Ms. Lagner would mind coming up and providing some clarity for that. I would just go ahead and request that the council not engage in a dialogue at this time, knowing that we will have a further discussion about this and can later conversate with other people from the industry and, um, and our staff in regards to how to move forward. If we open up the dialogue at this point, we'll be further behind. And I know some folks have been waiting equally as long as some of the cannabis folks for an item that should have been heard, I think about three hours ago. So the interest of time and adhering to some of their um, time, I'd, I'd appreciate that. Absolutely, thank you. Any questions uh, on this side in terms of, uh, I guess we'll start with item, we'll just take them maybe one by one in terms of um, the recommendation, which is one to um, support reforms to lower the state taxes and state fees on the cannabis industry and directing the mayor to write to Senator Monning, Assembly Member Stone and the League of California Cities asserting this position. So moved. Okay, so we have a motion by Councilmember Glover. Second. Seconded by Vice Mayor Cummings. Um, definitely. Yeah. <laughs> we should get the state to reduce the taxes at the state level. Okay. Councilman Brown and then Did Councilman we get a second Mathis. already? Yeah. It was a so, motion thanks. by uh, Councilman Glover, seconded by Vice Mayor Cummings. Thank you. Um, I, um, I'm gonna support that motion. I'm, um, I would also like to include, um, perhaps as a friendly amendment, and maybe it's already kind of implicit, but uh, uh, to direct staff to um, engage with the industry um, in uh, lobbying efforts with the state because- Accepted. I'll, I'll, I'll just add, I'll zip it there. But I have a point, a reason for that. Okay. Councilman, so friendly amendment made by Councilmember Brown, accepted by Vice, uh, by Councilmember Glover and Vice Mayor Cummings. Okay, Councilmember Matthews. And then if we could uh, bring back for an official action a future time endorsement of AB 286, which has to do with lowering state taxation levels. So Accept yeah. it. Right. That would be for future action, yeah. Great. Okay, is there any further discussion on item 14.21 um, at this time? Okay. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? That passes unanimously with uh, Councilmember Myers um, having stepped out. Okay. So now under recommendation two of 14.2 is a resolution amending council policy 12.16 to affirm that the set aside for the children's fund is set to 12.5 of the total cannabis business tax collected. In terms of a motion, I would just only recommend simplifying the language in the policy to say purpose instead of creation and funding. 
So moved. Okay. So I'll second that. There's a motion by Council Member Matthews with the language modification for uh, the from creation and funding to purpose. Does that work for you, Council Member Matthews? Yes. Okay, mm -hmm. great. Are you changing? Sure, it's just basically changing, um, modifying the policy statement that um, the first sentence in the red line version uh, stating, did you get it? I'm sorry, so it states, um, it is the policy of the city council that 12.5 of the city of Santa Cruz cannabis business tax revenue be designated for and, and striking creation and funding and putting the word purpose instead <coughs> of a dedicated children's fund. Minor, okay. Any further discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. Uh, aye. aye. Any opposed? That passes unanimously. Thank you for that. And then um, the third recommendation is to uh, direct staff to advance a countywide regional cannabis business tax study and taxation model and present an update to the city council no later than September 2019. I'll just add before we begin that discussion um, to uh, city manager Martin Bernal's original comment that there was at regionally that conversation that took place at the last city select meeting with interest in um, moving forward with a countywide strategy and I think um, um, there was a lot of interest in wanting to have uh, kind of a, that kind of conversation ensue. So just sort of to highlight that as a regional interest as well. Do you have anything to add? Uh, yeah, that's correct. Uh, the, there is uh, just concern that uh, without just really being thoughtful about the different tax rates and also understanding the different uh, uh, markets that are or operations that uh, function within the different jurisdictions, like for example, you know, the the amount of revenue that's generated off of retail versus cultivation manufacturing does vary. So how you adjust the rates could have an impact on competition, on revenues, a variety of factors. And the thinking is we should be really thoughtful about that because there have been some, in some counties where they just sort of, there was sort of a race to the bottom kind of approach to taxing and also really not really being very thoughtful and it has not turned out to be a very good, uh, thing for them, for those agencies. And so we wanted to be make sure and, and, and be careful about that. Uh, again, again, it's also further, uh, uh, a further concern just in light of our budget situation that anything that we do that uh, potentially reduces our revenue uh, makes it much more difficult for us to balance our budget. Okay, thank you. And then in the interim, I, I mentioned this earlier, I, if there's the interest of the council, one suggestion I would support is um, modifying and aligning our tax structure to uh, mimic the counties um, while this took place so we can have more information before we move forward with just sort of choosing a taxation number. Council Member Glover. So two, or two questions. One, um, what's the cost associated with the uh, establishing the tax study? I don't know, I don't see it in the staff report on the agenda report. Maybe I'm missing it, but mm -hmm. I just see the fiscal Is impact that talking clarified, about. Clarify, you mean working regionally with? It says to put together a business tax study and taxation model. So is there a fiscal impact on that? It, it may be nothing and it may be something. So I, I think it depends <laughs> on, certainly as, as you heard it from the industry, we, we know ourselves and sometimes things are more complicated than we think. Mm -hmm. So as we talk with our fellow uh, agencies, it may be pretty straightforward or we might need help. So I think it would, have to be something we'd come back to unless. And then just to clarify. So, it, it looks like there's a, a more information. I was just gonna say, it, it would just start with the staffs of the various agencies getting together to discuss the and understand the issues and then figure out what's the best approach to take to take forward. And so we may, um, you know, need some assistance in that regard, although we may share the costs associated with that. That's the other, uh, or you just use some of the data that some of the other agencies might have uh, with their existing uh, consultant services. So um, it's anticipated that it would, again, it would start as a, as a sort of a staff led effort. Okay, great. And then um, just to clarify, so then you said, Madam Mayor, is that you would uh, support three and suggest additional language that the city mimic the county tax model during the process? That would be something I would support, knowing that particularly the 8% is somewhat out of range, particularly right. around the cultivation manufacturing percentage. Okay, then um, I'd like to make a motion directing staff to advance a countywide regional cannabis business tax study and taxation model and present an update to the Santa Cruz City Council no later than September 2019 and in the interim mimic the county tax structure until we hear back about the analysis. 
Okay. We have a motion by Councilmember Glover. I'll second that Moved for the Council sake of Brown. discussion, but I have a question. Go ahead, Mary. I just want for clarification, our, the county, I believe, taxes um, testing and distribution at 7%. I, I, I'm sorry, I presume I just, you're not going no, raise our rates there. We'll you're talking specific to cultivation retail. To, for retail cultivation and manufacturing. So, Seven. so is the, I'm sorry, I, I was momentarily distracted. Is the motion to reduce the city's rates of taxation to mirror the county at this time? And with respect, sorry, I'm gonna just, can I do this? Right? Brown, yeah. With respect to retail cultivation and manufacturing. That's right. Mm -hmm. So it's, since that is not described on the agenda, I'm gonna recommend that the motion direct staff to agendize that for action at your next meeting. Okay, we'll go ahead and have that. I will adjust that then, yes. So uh, move with number three on 14.2 and uh, instruct the staff to please uh, put it on the agenda to come back at the next city council meeting for us to take action on the changing of the tax structure in the city of Santa Cruz around cannabis. Uh, and, and just for clarification, I, I believe your intent would be, let's say hypothetically it becomes January 2020 and the county's rate goes up, we would mirror wherever they're at you in the know. interim? Well, it, well if, if say we don't finish, I mean this is to come back by, by <laughs> September 2019, so, yeah, so I don't anticipate I'm just being hypothetical. But if that were the case, under that direction, that's how I would interpret it as well, yeah. Okay, Vice Mayor Cummings, it is most, okay. All right, any further discussion? No? Uh, Councilmember Brown. Okay, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, that passes unanimously. I think that concludes our cannabis item and we'll go ahead and have maybe a three minute break. <laughs> and uh, get a break. I wouldn't have really we? Uh, very quickly, I th a lot of these can come back on consent, right? We've already yeah. given the direction. Yeah, yeah, so, a lot, yeah. that was pretty yeah. much essential. Yeah. Mm. Okay. We're now on to item number 16 of our agenda. And item number 16 is the CDBG and home funding and the housing and community development program discussion for our 2019-2020 program year. And I'll turn it over to our economic development department to kick off the presentation. I will also um, note that at 7 p.m. we have oral communications and we will go ahead and pause um, if we need to for oral communications at that time and then reconvene uh, after. Uh, for those in the audience, I wanna let you know that we we don't allow food in the chambers, so we'll go ahead and ask you either to step outside and enjoy your food or to put it away for the time being. And um, there will be an opportunity for public comment on this item um, after with the presentation. So at this time, we'll go ahead and have the presentation, maybe open it up to public comment and then return back. So please. Great. Good evening, Mayor, members of the council, Bonnie Lipscomb, Director of Economic Development. And I'm just briefly going to introduce the item and then turn it over to Tiffany Lake, who's our Principal Management Analyst in Housing, pulled the presentation together and has been working on CDBG since she started with the city recently. Um, so the item before you today is preliminary approval of the recommended funding program for the, our Community Development Block Grant, more commonly known as CDBG, and HOME 2019-2020 uh, program year and direction to staff to complete the draft action plan for the upcoming year. Um, we annually receive funding from the Community Development Block Grant and HOME program uh, annually from the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development, HUD. In order to receive that and reallocate the funding, we must have an adopted consolidated plan. It's a five-year plan that identifies and analyzes strategies for addressing community needs. We currently are in the fourth year of the five-year consolidated plan, and the action plan and draft today with your direction will, will be for the final year of our five-year plan. Next year, as I mentioned, will be the fifth year. We'll be, we will begin a, a robust community outreach process for the new five-year consolidated plan later this spring, and we will turn at the May 28th hearing, at the second hearing, with an outline um, that goes along with the final plan for the proposed community outreach process for the next five-year plan. 
On February 11th, um, 2019, the commu Community Programs Committee, um, Council Committee, um, met and made preliminary recommendations um, on the Community Development Block Grant, CDBG, and um, Home Funds. And that is actually what is before you today. This is... Um, a preliminary plan. Um, it's an important step in the process, but it is not the final decision. Um, Tiffany will go over the timeline and the decision points um, in, a, in the next few minutes. But we do need a motion from you today approving the preliminary recommendations and directing staff to proceed with a draft action plan. As Tiffany will review, the second hearing will be on May 28th, following which the action plan will be finalized and submitted to HUD. Funding does become available July 1st, so we have a pretty tight timeline. Um, I do want to clarify that the uh, motion that's in the staff report, uh, the actual sort of revised motion, um, just to, to clarify, is to approve the Community Programs Committee recommendations um, and for the recommended funding program for CDBG and home activities for the 2019-2020 program year. And also the second motion, which is in your packet, is correct, which is also directing staff to complete the draft action plan for the upcoming program year. And with that, I will turn it over to Tiffany Lake, who has a brief presentation. Okay. As Bonnie mentioned, we are in the middle of our five-year consolidated plan. And what we'll be talking about today will be related to the year five, our program year 2019, which is for fiscal year 20. And we need approval on recommendations for funding so that we can move forward and draft the action plan and submit it to HUD. So the annual action plan has a pretty regular schedule. It always starts with the application submitted submissions. We've already had that. We've noticed the public hearing dates. And in February, the CPC reviewed the applications and made initial funding recommendations based on rankings from staff. So t now we're in the first public hearing today. And you'll hear the draft recommendations from the CPC and confirm those so that we can move forward. This graph shows the historical funding for both CDBG and home over the years. The green is CDBG and the orange is home. So we can see that the amounts have varied a lot and they've been declining over the years. We did have a spike in 2018, but we can't count on that. So our, our estimate for the 2019 is somewhat conservative. So for CDBG funding from the grant itself, we expect 485,000. We're expecting program income of 8,000. That's a total combined amount of 493 that we have available for allocation. And again, that is a conservative amount because we don't want to tr budget more than we really have. So of that 493,000, 20% of it is for administration. So administration can cover environmental assessments, layering studies, consultant and legal fees, as well as staffing costs. And our staffing costs include researching, monitoring, drafting notices, the action plans, doing environmental reviews, reporting, and also drafting the consolidated plan, which is coming up the, other, the next five years. And so this administration portion doesn't cover all of our costs. And we could charge administration to the programs and projects themselves that we award money to, but economic development and the housing division wants the dollars to go further in the community, so we keep it only at that 20%. The rehab administration is for collecting fees, uh, for, sorry, for collecting loans, so we pay fees for collecting on the rehab administration. And code enforcement which was part of the consolidated plan as the number one goal, which ha was to increase and preserve affordable housing. And we specifically outlined in our consolidated plan that we would do that with enhanced targeted code enforcement in the neighborhood revitalization strategy area and also the code enforcement target area. And that is how HUD will evaluate us at the end of the five years. So that means we have only 290,900 available for programming, but we can see that's not nearly enough compared to the request. We had 240 requested for programs and over a million for projects. So that's more than a million difference between what's available and what's requested. We can see all of the applications we received for community programs here. And the top three, which were ranked based on meeting national objectives, being in the target areas, and having goals that were part of our consolidated plan are seen here. And all of the top three were recommended for funding by the CPC. Now we have a 15% activities cap that's mandated by HUD. 
uh, but we can have an exception to that because Nueva Vista is a CBDO, which is a community-based development organization. So we can go over this cap of $74,000, but if we do, that means we have less funds available for funding other projects, so that's something to keep in mind. So you can exceed the cap, but it lowers the amount available. So when the CPC met in February, they recommended funding Nueva Vista at 50,000, and the city also provides additional funding to Nueva Vista from Red Cross funds and also core funds for a combined total for this upcoming year of 128,000, which is above the requested amount. The CPC also recommended funding the Teen Center at 35,000. And we have a star next to California Rural Legal Assistance. The CPC recommended interest in funding this program if available. And so we did some research to find how we could make it available. So we are able to move the security deposit administration that the housing authority runs, uh, that's $12,500. We can move that to home, which had no other applications this year. And we can do that if we track the administration by the unit and the housing authority has agreed to do that. So that freed up 12,500. And we've also lowered the administration portion of the rehab program. Um, and that's 7,000 that we've reduced from our own administrative budget. And that allows you to consider funding CRLA at 19,500, as, as was indicated um, that the CPC was interested in. So we also had project applications. And again, the top applications are ranked and circled above. The CPC recommended funding all of these. MH Can and New Life were ranked the lowest, and because of the lack of funding, CPC did not recommend funding them at this time. I, I wish that I could talk. We'll go ahead and pause and here. We just want to remind folks in the audience that you're not able to speak while we have the presentation. We'll have a chance for that. Okay, go ahead. Now, the total available of 186,000 for project applications is less than 104,000 that we had allocated for the programs. So if that amount changes, this amount could go up or down, depending on whether that the program allocation increases or decreases. So in February when they met, CPC recommended funding Central Park at 96,400. Highlights of that program, program project include improving drainage and improving ADA access. The CPC also recommended funding the Boys and Girls Club at $40,000, and that is for creating a safe and secure check-in area for staff and participants. And they also uh, recommended funding the Poganip Farm Kitchen at 50,000, which would partially fund their kitchen renovations that they're proposing. And that's a total of 186,400. Moving on to home, for 2019, we estimated that we'd get 250,000 and also another 40,000 of program income. And the amount mandated by HUD is 10% for administration, so less 29,000. We have 261,000 available for programming. So again, the star indicates a change from what the CPC recommended. So the CPC did recommend funding the security deposit program that was at 50,000, and I'm proposing that we fund it at 100,000. That allows us to cover the admin portion that we moved from CDBG at 15%, and it also allows us to increase the security deposit money available for assisting low-income households get into housing from 50,000 to 85,000, because this year, even though we extended the deadline, we had no other applications. So this year, the Housing Authority ran out of funds in March after assisting 35 households, and they've also run out every year for the last few years. And when families move out of housing, they also return the security deposit funds for us to use again in home in future years. So we also have a 15% set aside for CHOTOs. That's a community housing development organization. So HUD mandates that we allocate 15% for CHOTO or we lose the money. We have only two in Santa Cruz and Habitat for Humanity wasn't ready to apply for it this year. Mid Peninsula Housing has an upcoming project, Jesse Street, where they're gonna be converting 14 units that are available for low income, very low income persons with psychiatric disabilities. That'll go from 14 units to 27 units. So we're proposing that we use that set aside for them. And that gives us 117,500 available for programming next year. So we have some steps we still have to do after today. So based on your decisions that you make today, we'll draft the action plan and we'll also place a notice in the paper summarizing the decisions. And then we have 30 days required between this first public hearing and our second public hearing. 
At that second public hearing, we should have the final budget numbers from HUD and we can finalize the amounts. And we also have a hard 15 days between that second public hearing and submission to HUD, which is gonna be due June 21st of this year, unless HUD changes it. And then funding, as Bonnie mentioned, will be available in July. And that is it. Okay, thank you for your presentation. Um, as a member of community programs, I want to thank uh, Councilmember Glover and Matthews, who serve on that committee with me, in terms of the conversation that took place at that meeting to get us to this place, as well as some of the modifications that seem to extend the dollars based on your presentation. So we'll go ahead and open up for questions. I want to just let the council know that we're approaching our 7 p.m. Um, timeline for uh, oral communications. So we'll go ahead and pause uh, the item at that time, open up oral communications, return, and then invite folks to speak to this item uh, during public comment. Um, we could potentially postpone oral communications depending on how many folks are here in the room who want to address this item on public comment. And and um, if that's the case, then um, I think the council would need to be supportive of that, given that the council member handbook suggests that it's generally oral communication at seven o'clock, no matter what. I, I, I agree, and I would, and it would be my preference to do so. And I, um, so I can make that, I will make that plea that we could potentially even pause questions at this time, open it up for public comment for this item. If it exceeds into oral communications a bit, then um, we'll go ahead and deviate from our practice. You have a motion for that? Or no, just I'm just gonna, it, unless there's uh, any objection to that, how's that? I'd like to see the people who've been waiting here for Me a long too. time mm -hmm. to be able to speak. If, if we're all communications, folks who have been wait at seven can wait for an extra 20 minutes or so, that's okay. That seems totally appropriate to me. I just know that that has been a strong position of the council in the past, so, okay. So who here in the audience is interested in speaking to this item? Okay, if you could please line to my left and we'll have up to, um, why don't we go ahead and do this? If you're interested in, in speaking very briefly to the council, please step forward and we'll allow you to speak um, for one minute and you can self-select that way. And if not, and you would like to speak for the full two minutes, then you're welcome to do so. So if you are interested in speaking, you'll go and we'll have one presentation after the one minute. Are there any folks who wanted to address the council for just one minute to briefly make your point? And, uh, and I just wanna acknowledge and thank um, you all for staying here, and uh, this item was uh, scheduled to be a lot earlier. Please. Go. When we conclude, when we conclude this, okay, go ahead. After public comment on this item, so likely uh, a little bit after seven o'clock, depending on how many folks speak for the full time. Okay, so if you're interested in speaking for one minute, please step forward. Hello, my name is David Steinberg. I'm a bioinformatics programmer at the UC, and I'm also a resident of the Central Park neighborhood. And today I come as a delegate of our household uh, Maya and Fiona Steinberg were not available to make comments today. Let me go ahead and pause you here. Are you here to speak to item number 16 on our agenda or for oral communications? To speak to the, the item. I'm sorry, okay, go ahead. For park I'm funding. Yes. Oh, okay, excuse yeah. me. Okay, I thought, <laughs> so, apologies. It's Please fine. Start, the, start the time again. Should I start over? No. You're, wel you're welcome to start I over. I think we know where we're at. One, okay, go ahead. <laughs> okay, sorry, Central sorry. Park, I live there. Um, and my kids love to play there and uh, so, we're excited about the fact that you all are considering improvements to our humble little park. I don't know if you've seen it. It's called Central Park. It's probably one of the smallest parks in Santa Cruz. Uh, it's also a lake a good amount of the year. And this year we went and uh, made boats and floated them on there, but it would be great if it drained out. We'd be able to use the park more. Um, I'm really here because Maya and Fiona wanted you all to know that they really love the merry-go-round that's there. It's like an old fashioned metal merry-go-round thing that they really love and that I had to be here in order to tell you that. Um, other than that, we appreciate the improvements that you know keep this park usable by us because we're out there every weekend. Thank you. Thank you. Apologize for the interruption. Okay. Are you interested in speaking to the council for one minute or for two, the full two? two for, for, Let him be first, he's been here all day. I just want to acknowledge that uh, at this time we will have one presentation. I apologize, it was in my uh, script at, at the wrong location, so I don't have it here. And then we'll go ahead, you'll be our first speaker. Uh, but we had one presentation that will follow uh, the one minute. So we'll have just a one minute, a three, a four minute presentation, and then you'll be the first speaker after that. So you will be the first one after the presentation. Ray, please uh, feel free to come in. You, oh, you would like the one minute? Okay. 
Give me one for a minute. Hi, my name is Cleaning Humanis, and I live in Beach Flats. I've lived there for almost 10 years. And every, um, I'm gonna come here every year mm -hmm. and speak on behalf of the community center there. It's such an awesome place for these kids to go to. They get their homework help, they get, they get food. There's always something for them to do. And it's a positive thing that's going on there. And you know, if they need the funding, they need the funding. And it's just, you know, it's the only park in Beach Flats, in that area, that's the only resource that's available for low income, especially the Hispanic community. And I just wanted to lay it out there, and my son wants to talk to you, too. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So you'll have up to one minute as well. Hello. My name is Rocky Jimenez from the Community Center. I just want to talk about how it really helped me. And, um, like, I could do my homework over there. And then we also have other activities that we can do. Like, I forgot its name. Um, <laughs> but um, they help, they also have, they also go to the ocean. We also, we can go to Monterey Aquarium and also uh, do other things. And I really appreciate it, that they are always there for us. And I'm happy about that. Thank you. And you'll be given the additional time of four minutes, was approved. My name is Raymond Cancino. I'm the CEO of Community Bridges. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak and for the City Council and the staff of the continued partnership. With your support, we've been successful in working with over 750 families annually through a wide array of services to ensure that everyone has the opportunity to unleash their full potential and thrive. We request the council to consider investing in Nueva Vista by supporting a proposal that directs 100,000 of CDBG funds to support our work. Your support is needed now more than ever. As our community continues to be targeted by ICE and federal government uh, policies such as the census citizenship question, we need to ensure that we continue to provide a safe space for immigrants and community members who might not otherwise seek services. We need your help to ensure we continue to meet the measures, goals, and desires of almost every single strategic plan that identifies the services we provide at each family resource center in Santa Cruz County in a cost-effective, bilingual, and bicultural way from being eliminated because of reduced funding. We ask that this council continue to align your values and objectives to the budget decisions. Throughout every single strategic plan, we see that services we provide at Nueva Vista Family Resource Center are needed to accomplish our community goals. That is why it's a criti critically important that you support us. We see this laid out in the Santa Cruz uh, Strategic Plan 2018-2024, where it calls out comprehensive health and safety as basic needs services and health integration, behavioral health care, providing two years in promotional health equity that integrate our nutrition and education program geared to um, go beyond this county as well. Dyna the dynamic economy as well is called out, allowing us to help support people that are underemployed or unemployed. Our services are also covered under Santa Cruz County Office of Education. Number two, increase educational options, opportunities for all students and parents and the community. This has also been something that's been created. Along the same lines, we have your own um, Santa Cruz City two-year plan that specifically outlines, prioritizes youth, programs, and families, as well as within the Beach Flash strategically located priority locations. I ask you not just to have lip service to these strategic plans, but to actually invest in some of these programs. Lastly, the comprehensive turning the curve by the youth violence prevention, which we had partners here today that wanted to explain that our intervention services help support youth and families locally and reduce the crime rate. 
In light of these needs and the goals, we need the council to match your objectives to your budgets and ask that you invest and not divest. We urge the council to direct staff to increase our funding without the requested amount. We're gonna see an overall 25% cut. Here are the funding over the last several years across all the different different funding sources, including the city and county. Even though we changed the language in this last presentation, it still doesn't change the facts that we're seeing a 25% cut, regardless of how and who paid for what. The, re the reality is that we're losing services in this community. It's gonna be most impacted as 86% are low income, Latino X, and long-term consequences will result in this community. It's having a negative impact on a small minority that's already under attack, and we don't need the city of Santa Cruz to, to also add to that list. Please, now, thank you for your patience. You'll have up to two minutes. So my name is Shantanu Pukan. Um, I live directly across the street from Central Park and I'm concerned about a persistent problem arising from the misuse of its merry-go-round. On warm nights, it has become a magnet for groups of young adults who are not the homeless, by the way, I want to clarify that, who gather on the merry-go-round to drink, to make noise, and on several occasions now to have sex. On summer nights, I am awakened by these noisy revelers about once a week. This problem has gone on for the last 80 years. Before the installation of the merry-go-round, the park was largely quiet at night. I have now had several conversations with the park department officials, whose response has largely been that the merry-go-round is immensely popular with parents and their children. That apparent popularity has not prevented both Galt and Soquel schools from removing merry-go-rounds from their play playgrounds because there's a higher incidence of injuries to children playing on them. One park official has told me that he is aware of this risk and also of the resultant trend to remove merry-go-rounds from playgrounds. So my question to the park department is this, how do you justify retaining a structure despite knowing its risks and now also its unwholesome night nighttime uses? So far, the parks department has not recognized this as a problem that needs to be solved. They have not, for example, suggested any alternative structures to the merry-go-round or any design solutions that might make the merry-go-round unusable at night. I'm asking the city council to urge the park department to think resourcefully and responsibly to solve a recurrent problem which they are now, of which they are now fully aware. Children and their parents are not the only users of this park. In fact, adults outnumber children in this neighborhood. Okay. So your time is up, but you're welcome okay. to submit your comments to the council and we'd be happy I to will. take a look yeah. at them as well. Thank you again for your patience, okay? As well as those who've been here as, as long. You'll have up to two minutes. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Kevin Steerhoff. I'm also a resident of the Central Park neighborhood. We've been residents there for about two years now. Uh, I'm here representing my wife and, and daughter who were here for many hours this afternoon but had to leave ultimately and also four other families with about five or six other young children that utilize the park heavily and uh, are very uh, excited and happy for the proposed improvements to the park. Very much appreciate that. I'll echo David's comments in the back that it's often flooded and unusable during certain times of the year. Um, so uh, rectifying that problem would be a huge improvement to the park and greatly improve its use. Um, we're quite sympathetic to the concerns that other neighbors have about misuse of the equipment on the park, but um, in pulling the families and the other children around, it's clear that the, the merry-go-round is sort of a central um, from their perspective, at least the central aspect of that park, it makes it quite unique uh, within Santa Cruz and is heavily used. Um, we'd really like to see it stick around. Um, and just got a moment. I'd like to play a, a short statement from my daughter who sent this uh, after she had to leave. Uh, she's speaking for her friends. Maybe this will work. This is Emma. Always film. My name is E-N-N-A. I am five, and I do not want you to take the merry-go-round away, because even my friends like the merry-go-round. 
hopefully that's somewhat convincing. Uh, again, uh, we really appreciate the, the efforts to improve our park. Uh, we use it heavily. We, we very much appreciate it. And, um, and just want to put in our two cents to see the merry-go-round stick around it. It does make the park quite unique, and we appreciate having it there. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, next speaker. You'll have up to two minutes. Good evening. Um, thanks to all of you for your patience today as well. Um, it's been a long day. My name is Gretchen Regenhardt. I'm the directing attorney of California Rural Legal Assistance um, and for our local offices here in the county. I want to thank you for considering renewing our partnership which um, for many years uh, was in place and until uh, just the last, last few years. Uh, as you know, I hope, um, our services are designed to help city residents address the effects of poverty through the legal system. Specifically, we work to, um, to keep people in their homes by doing eviction defense, by addressing housing discrimination, working for affordable housing. We also uh, help people collect unpaid wages and address employment discrimination. We try to keep kids in school by uh, assisting kids who are in the school discipline system. And we also work on public benefits. So we hope to bring all that here to you. Uh, we thank you for, um, for supporting us. And um, we have opened an office again in Santa Cruz at 501 Soquel. We're having a grand opening next uh, Wednesday the 1st, and we hope you can join us. It's in the, it's in the evening, 4.30 to 7. Please come by. Thanks. Yeah. Okay, next speaker. Good evening, everyone. My name's Edgar Landeros, and I'm the program manager for Nueva Vista Community okay. Resources, a program of community bridges. Nueva Vista has been serving the Latino community of beach flats and lower oceans since 1983. It's originally began as a health clinic servicing the Latino community's health needs. Since then, it has morphed into a multifaceted resource center that continues to address the emerging needs in our community. Today, I'm here to ask that you please reconsider the proposed recommendation of another $25,000 cut in CDBG funding and propose that we be considered for $100,000 in funding to support instead. Another cut in CDBG funding to our center will reduce our capacity to operate at our current level of support to both the community and city departments. The center has been at the forefront of every major neighborhood shakeup. It has been there to advocate and support the immigrant community. Some of these events have included the redevelopment of the Nueva Vista apartments, outreach and assisting with census count of the hard to reach population uh, 2010 and the redesign of the Beach Flats mural and the downsizing of the Beach Flats Community Garden. On multiple occasions, the Latino community has entrusted us to carry their concerns to elected officials. Furthermore, Nueva Vista has had a long standing relationship of collaborating with the city. On an ongoing basis, we work alongside the city's departments. We have history of working with the police department as well. For instance, the morning of February 13, 2017, when there was the Homeland Security raid in Beach Flats, we were called shortly after to disseminate accurate information about the event in the community. This was done to restore trust into the community, especially during the current political climate that has generated fear into our immigrant community. As a sanctuary city, our role has been to provide accurate information and to advocate for Latinos. Thank you. Okay. And I believe you're our last speaker on this item, correct? You're on, yep, yeah, okay, thank yeah, you. And one process question, I actually, I'm Paul Goldberg from the Homeless Garden Project. I had a large crew of folks. I have a letter here from one of our trainee graduates um, who has been battling drug addiction and homelessness. He okay. had to go to his SLE. He did write out his speech. Sure. I can circulate it or if I might have a minute to read after my speech. I think it'd be most appropriate for you to circulate it at this Great. time. Thank, thank you, you very much and we'll ha be happy to look at it. Okay, so you'll have your two minutes then, thank you. Thank you so much, Mayor Watkins. And again, on behalf 
of our executive director, Derry Ganshorn, and our board president, Kathy Kalfa, who are here to make comment. But in an in extenuating circumstance and a very interesting day, um, you've heard how much, you've, you all know what a crisis homelessness is in our community. And here you have an opportunity to fund and make an impact on a program that is successful. Last year, 100% of our graduates obtained stable employment and stable housing within, within three months of leaving the program. So here's your opportunity to fund a program that's really making a concrete difference. Um, a few misconceptions um, at the CPC, uh, one, one item came up about wanting to fund city-owned property. This building that we are building, it's not a renovation, we are building a new home for this innovative program that is 30 years old that drew me from the East Coast to Santa Cruz because it is so innovative and so progressive in changing and transforming lives. Um, it's city owned, it will be a city owned building that will be a part of our public private partnership where we will be operating it with volunteers and community members who cooked. Our uh, a major donor and volunteer Patrick Teverbaugh was here to speak to that earlier, but fortunately he also needed to go. Um, 50,000 is wonderful. That represents 12% of the cost of the kitchen and 1% of the entire Pogonip project. Our $150,000 request, our full request that we please respectfully request that you consider would be 4% of the overall project that will be on city owned land. Um, so this remains the only government grant that we could go for. Heap and cash was suggested at CPC. We were not funded from Heap and Cash, because our program is really an employment program. It's not about beds, but we create housing and employment opportunities. Thank you, Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Okay, so that will conclude public comment of item number 16. I think um, we'll go ahead and we'll go ahead. Oh, you're here for item number 16. Yeah. Okay, forgive me, please. You're, you're, you're our last speaker on this item and you'll have up to two minutes. Okay. Well, I, I've been going to MH10 over 30 years, and, I, you know, I wasn't born with these chromosomes or these genes, but I'll tell you, I make A's in college, and I'm, a, I'm in college right now. I'm going to Davis, but I, I'm here to address several things, but MH10 would be a perfect place to put the funding that you're saving until next year or whatever. That's ridiculous. When people are in the street, they're laying around, you're harassing them, charging them money or whatever. I mean, I mean, it's just, it's pathetic. As someone who's lived in the street four years and seven months, it'll be on the first of, you know, MH Can has plenty of room. There's an art room over there. You can do art, you can do music therapy. You know, we, we arrange flowers, we do meditation. We have all kinds of groups going on. There's beds over there. There's so many places to sleep overnight that I don't, I can't understand why you don't fund that as a shelter. I don't understand why you don't give the, ask the, university to like kick down some land they certainly can kick down some students why can't they kick down some land like they could kick down land for the students and the weirdos and the people with families you know keep them all separate but they got plenty of land at the village and the farm or whatever's happening over there with no carrots I don't get that at all but back to MH can it helps me it helps me go to college it helps me make A's when when I go there, I can go there and on Monday every morning, this cute little couple out of nowhere, Dennis and uh, Colleen, make, make breakfast for us, and they're so sweet, and everyone loves Monday. We're just so darling to each other, but it's a little family over there. There's free coffee. There's, if you just want to pick, you know, there's stuff to do, and, and I just think if you're going to put funding somewhere, why don't you put funding in the last hidden stigma is mental health. Mental health, if you cross that line, oh my God. You know, you should think about funding MH Can Thank and you. use it as a shelter. Thank you, Thank you very much. Okay, so we'll go ahead and close public comment for item number 16. Um, we'll go ahead and return to council for action and deliberation after oral communications is complete. Um, so at this time, can I get a sense of who is here to speak to the council on uh, in regards to oral communications. Okay, you can go ahead and line up to my left and you'll have up to two minutes. Pat Kittle, Santa Cruz. <clears throat> 
I've discussed this before and it needs to be discussed because frankly, people don't discuss it. <laughs> and a lot of times when I go to discuss it, members of the city council immediately need to go to the bathroom. It's not something you guys like to hear, but the re remainder of you are gonna hear it. And I hope you will too. Uh, the Israel lobby is the most powerful lobby in this country and it has subverted our priorities tremendously domestically. I'll wait until you're done there, Justin. Sorry. As I was saying, the Israel lobby has um, greatly subverted our priorities, both locally, regionally, and nationally. We're fighting wars that benefit nobody in the world but Israel. And Trump promised he was gonna get us out of this crap. He's a liar, he's made it worse than it was in the first place. So long, Tony. <laughs> so anyway, um, you can um, go to a fellow locally, a professor by the name of Christopher Bolin, that's B-O-L-L-Y-N. He has done his homework on this and he has written a book and he will demonstrate clearly, if you care to go to his website, B-O-L-L-Y-N. If you just simply use that search and go through the distractions that Google nowadays will throw up at you, Bolin.com, you will see overwhelming evidence that Israel did 9-11 specifically to get us into these wars, and we have put trillions into it. If you care about funding for anything, Thank you, you sir. should look that up, Bolin.com. Oh, next person. My name is Pauline Seals. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. I'm going to read this. Um, Dear Santa Cruz City Council, we thank you for adopting the emergency climate resolution. Now we need action from all departments of city government. We need to greatly reduce the use of gasoline and natural gas while increasing bike safety and car-free areas and encouraging public transportation. We need to drastically reduce food waste and increase composting. We need to plant many thousands of trees and increase climate education. We recognize that there is some work in action and some progress on these issues, but we need much more. These signatures were all collected at Earth Day. Thank you very much. Oh, good evening, I'm Dana Bagshaw, I live in Santa Cruz. Um, following on to the climate action, the call for climate action, um, I think we need to do that through our budget and we're, we're doing the budgeting process now. And I recently attended the, um, last Tuesday, the parks, um, no, the public works gave their presentation and um, I was overwhelmed with the enormity and, you know, the scope of the work that the city does. Um, I can understand uh, when Mark Dettel said that um, he didn't want to add any more projects to the budget, um, but I think it's time for us to take a look at what is in the budget now. Um, the practice of bringing forward items from years before that haven't been completed. Um, I he heard that from pub Public Works as well at an earlier meeting. So I think we really need to take a hard look at what's there and say, look, does this item increase carbon emissions? If it does, if the answer is yes, then we just slash it as simple and as tough as that is, okay? And then once we cut through all the old projects that no longer make sense today, then we can start looking at maybe <coughs> cost-effective ways of doing other things, like some of the things Pauline just mentioned. One idea that I had was um, 
the West Cliff Drive, if we just made that into a one lane, one way system for cars, and then opened up the rest of the street to um, bicycles and jump bikes and skateboards, and removing that from uh, the sidewalk where the pedestrians are. So things like that is what I would like to see happen. Thank you. Good evening. Anna Brooks, speaking as a private citizen only for myself. Last week, my neighborhood met with representatives of the police department to discuss ways we could improve security because of an increase of incidents in our area over the last few months. I didn't mention where I live. It's important to me that that not be shared in this public arena. I thank and compliment Sergeant John Bush, Officer Raul Pisano, and Lieutenant Jose Garcia. I especially appreciated Sergeant Bush's graciousness and transparency during the well-attended meeting and Lieutenant Garcia's comments. I also thank Deb Elston of Santa Cruz Neighbors for attending and providing handouts in advance regarding what we as individuals and neighborhoods could do to help prevent crime. Please don't mistake the brevity of my acknowledgments for a lack of appreciation. I'm also here to remind the public that there are resources available to help people in, enhance safety in their neighborhoods. I heard Sergeant Bush say during that meeting that preventing crime is the best way to decrease crime. I believe that there is a level of personal responsibility involved in crime prevention. That's why I especially appreciated uh, the handouts of Santa Cruz from Santa Cruz Neighbors, which are available on its website. The police department's website also has crime prevention tips and information about neighborhood watches. Both the police department and Santa Cruz Neighbors are easily found online by typing their names into any search, uh, search engine. Ordinarily, I sp when I speak at or oral communications, I stay to hear the other speakers. Today, however, is one day on the calendar on um, which I usually do not conduct business, and the day is drawing to a close. So I wish you well in your meeting, and I thank you for all you do. Thank you. Okay. Next speaker. Hi, I'm nateallex.kennedy at gmail.com. 3469888. Uh, what I want to say right now is one thing we really need to do is we need to get these city council meetings on the air, on radio, regular radio stations. You know, just go down the list and keep asking them which ones you want to, which ones want to do it. I mean, just off the top of my head, KZSC, KSCO, KION. KPIG, KPIG, uh, so on and so forth. Um, whoever can help spearhead this needs to go to all of them and with some luck we'll get at least two stations that are willing to broadcast our city council meetings live. So people driving around in their car can listen to it. People jogging Westcliff with their little FM radio on strapped to their arm can listen to these council meetings. Uh, aside from that, it, what we also really need to do is take the stream, the in the uh, audio stream and put it on the website for the city where I can listen to the council meeting live over my internet. Uh, but there's, it needs to be scaled down because there's a lot of bandwidth issues, especially if I'm watching the video, it, it usually chokes things up pretty hard. Um, but you get the idea, we need to get this out there. And then what else is really important? Uh, my cell phone, my tablet, if I had the, if I set up the proper software on my computer can all handle uh, live speech to text recognition. So we could have subtitles up there on the screen. Uh, not only that, but it will not only do subtitles, it'll do translations into any other language so we can do a live English, uh, subtitles and Spanish both on the screen. We really need to do that as well. And with all that said, I'm almost out of time. So Justin, Drew, Sandy, all of you get a hold of me. Okay, next speaker, please. And you'll have up to two minutes as well. Good evening, my name is Lisbeth Olasso and I'm a student at Cabrillo College and I'm also a current dancer in the non-profit -organi um, non organization Senderos. And first of all, we wanna thank you for sponsoring and helping our Galaguetza that is, uh, it's gonna be in San Lorenzo Park for the second year and it's gonna be in May 19. We wanna invite you so you can 
appreciate and see Mex um, Mexican and um, Oaxaca cul culture, um, food, dance, music, and everything. Uh, we also um, bring uh, 25 uh, musician students from Oaxaca and a band, the full band, and yeah, that's basically it. And um, um, he's, uh, his name, Roland, uh, is a graduate from that school at Oaxaca, and he's gonna use his two minutes to show some um, Oaxacan music that you could also appreciate in our Galaguetza. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, come on up if you want. <laughs> Right up to the... Hi, I'm Carolyn Coleman. I'm a board member with Senderos. And uh, yeah, I just want to reiterate Liz's invitation for all of you to come out to Galagetza. We have a full month of Viva Oaxaca uh, events, including the week before we have our um, convite, our procession, and our downtown fiesta, Cooper Street closure. And so we thank the city for City Arts, I see Beth back there, um, for sponsoring Galagetza for the second year and um, for the city for all the support. I'll leave these flyers. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. All right. Take I am Garrett. I'm, I'm just going to uh, talk about a suggestion, really, uh, more than a specific. Uh, no item. I'll start out by saying um, that only the federal government is actually authorized by the Constitution, Section 8, to define what is faring well, what is poverty, what is the level of welfare to be administered with federal tax dollars, and not really authorized by a small city government unless it is using federal authority and funds. And a lot of what we've been uh, doing is have a one size fit all, where, for instance, just as an example, uh, you know, the homeless, uh, you know, really, uh, they're, uh, well, start with poor people. Poor people in the, in the welfare system are kind of separated by the deserving and undeserving because there are rules, there are priorities, families with children, uh, disabled, mentally vulnerable people, you know, there's, there's, they go to the top of the list and the grifters really get, well, nothing basically. Um, now, the homeless don't really have that sort of, uh, separation of the deserving from the undeserving. I think that's something that needs to be done. I don't think charity is necessarily that good at it. Uh, and I further kind of think that uh, actually even the nonprofits need a little separation of the deserving from the undeserving uh, if, if they are in fact some undeserving ones. So I'll read this now. Uh, I'll see how far I get. A required full, easy to access, publicly available set of detailed financials and detailed statements of the public benefit accomplishments of nonprofit organizations that receive government funds or use the public land or resources would be an extra benefit to the public. In this way, potential donors may more accurately judge, including deciders of public trust like you, the efficiency of public benefit and presumably promote those who provide best and discourage those who provide the least effective public benefit for those donations. An IRS form 1090. 990s are a good start, but they're really for the IRS use and can still be quite vague and that those forms uh, group together all donations. Okay, your time is up, but you're welcome to leave your uh, document with us and we can review it up here. Okay, so just uh, checking in to see how many folks are here for oral communications that still are wanting to speak. Okay, so you will you will be our last speaker. Okay. Hi, Go ahead. I'm Gail Nakunam, and I'm here to inform you, maybe you already know about the California Supreme Court uh, or 
opinion that affirms municipal authority to regulate utilities and right-of-way small cell towers. I'll leave this article for you. I'd like to give a copy of it to the city attorney as well. <clears throat> April 4th, 2019, the California Supreme Court uh, published an opinion supporting municipal authority to make regulations on so-called small cell public right-of-way towers and uses of the public's right-of-way. This opinion affirms the 2016 appellate court ruling. The opinion seems to go far beyond mere aesthetic standards. The focus of the lawsuit by T-Mobile West LLC affirming the exercise of municipalities' full police powers to regulate small cell towers in the public's right of way, including that municipalities do have discretionary power. These rulings have bearing on smart meters in California because of the affirmation of local policing powers. Uh, the Supreme Court and appellate court decisions repudiate CPUC claims of exclusive jurisdiction over utilities made during the smart meter rollout. An amicus brief was filed May 11th, 2017 on behalf of the League of California Cities, California State Association of Counties, the International Municipal Lawyers Association, and SCAN NATAOA. Um, these decisions give cities and counties a backbone and legal cover to create and enforce rules and ordinances to protect the public, the environment, and public land. These decisions are vital documents for local officials and decision makers. Hopefully as well, they will provide support for actions in other states and countries. Um, one of the things they, they uh, include in this uh, opinion is, Cities and counties may make and enforce within their limits all local police, sanitary, okay. and other ordinances. Thank you. Your time I'll is up. Okay. Next speaker. Good evening. My name is Sherry Talmadge, and I live at 783 North Branson 40 Avenue. And today was the first day they started giving out tickets that cost money. There were warnings given out before because there's a new residential parking permit program established there. Um, I was uh, surprised when we got a warning ticket um, about a week and a half ago because I never saw the mailer that was supposedly sent to me in January about this issue. And there were supposedly neighborhood meetings. I was never contacted by anyone for any of these meetings. So I was upset to see this parking permit. I used to live on Ninth Avenue by the beach. I know why we need residential parking permits if you can't park within like four blocks of where you live. I get it, when you're a resident, that's a, that's a hardship. And the little place we lived there didn't have any garage or any driveway, so we needed to use the public street to park. But where I live now, I've lived now for 24 years, there's never been a problem with parking, never a problem with parking space. We have always been able to park in front of our home or in front of the house next door. My issue is that I believe this thing, which was brought up by residents and supposedly passed by 67% margin, um, uh, is only designed to keep homeless people from parking their vans behind the Whole Foods store and the Rite Aid store. And my concern is that these are residents, they pay taxes, they wouldn't have gotten any notice in the mail to tell them this decision was being made. So I didn't find out till the signs went up in my neighborhood. And there's a lot of other people who didn't know either. I find out now that it's too late to do anything. I have to wait two years to petition this. But my issue, I asked when I spoke to um, Brian, at the, who's the manager of this kind of program, he mentioned that... Um, that uh, it's just a response to requests by the residents and the businesses in the area. And I can tell you that there's not a business that doesn't have a parking place here. They have a huge parking lot that's never full, never full. And this is only designed to keep homeless people out of our neighborhood who have been good neighbors. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. And you'll have up to... Uh, three. <laughs> My name is Dave Willis. Last time I came to the meeting, you had started the meeting pertaining to being civil. So when this member right here was reading his definition pertaining to being civil, this member right here, she was like, had complete contempt for what he was saying, was ignoring him completely. And um, I remember like when he was speaking once, the second after he was finished with his last word, you, the mayor, you just shut him down real quick, like saying, shut up, all right, that's enough. So I don't understand that, but 
I remember that this member right here, he had mentioned, he asked this guy a question, and then this member here <laughs> said she asked him the same question, and he gave her the information. So I'm, I don't understand what that means. Like, is he trying to make her look good, her be smart? Why didn't he get the answer to his question? So, shoot. This member right here, he put in a lot of work. He put in some work about creating a new, better plan, a more cost-effective plan, and he didn't even get notified that, well, we'll go a different way with our answer to this problem. So where's the courtesy or the professionalism in that? I don't know what's going on here, but we the people, we elected all of you all who are up there, so that should be recognized and respected. I don't want to come here no more. I hope I don't. I don't know. Good luck. And then you'll be our last speaker here for oral communication. Good evening, I'm Scott Graham. Um, a, an issue that's bothered me for years about the way the city does business is that projects come forward completely fleshed out to the council and to the public without the council knowing anything about these projects ahead of time and without the, the public knowing anything about them. And the, the, the city staff spends a bunch of time fleshing these projects out and bringing them forward and then it's like, oh, well, we've already spent so much time and money on this. If you try to stop it now, you're wasting all sorts of city resources. And it, to me, it would make more sense that when there, there's a seed of a project to bring that seed forward and say, hey, we're thinking about doing this. Do the council want to want to go that way? Do the public want to go that way? But instead, no, we come, they, the staff comes forward with completely fleshed out projects. And they do it all the time. It's like, um, and to me, that's not being an open uh, government. That's being the staff being in control and trying to push projects forward that don't necessarily need to be pushed forward. The other issue I have is about the agenda. I've talked about this before. I have a copy here of the way Berkeley does their agenda, and I'll leave it here so that it can be copied and distributed to everyone. We don't necessarily have to do it exactly like Berkeley does, but there has to be a formal way that city council members can get an item on the agenda and know it's going to be there. Thank you. So you are our last speaker for oral communications. Uh, I, I'd like to talk about the buses, the buses and the lack of, the lack of shelter in the town. It's totally pathetic and I... Okay, we'll go ahead and we'll go ahead and... Uh, we had oral communications, uh, this is oral communications on items that are not on today's agenda. After having folks come in, it was, Whatever it okay. is, I, I can't stay here till midnight, so I, ha I have to go on the bus, the bus is. Okay, well why don't we go ahead and do this. We'll go ahead and extend two additional oral communications, I believe, and that will be it, no additional. So you're welcome to come up, you'll have up to two minutes. Ma'am, you're welcome to come up, you'll have up to two minutes. That You will be our last speaker. Okay. Well, I just wanted to say that um, on, on the weekends, I don't know if you're aware that the most of the buses start at 10.30, 10.15 as my, the first bus that I'm allowed to go on. And, and they, I always miss the last bus, which is at 10, oh, it's at 4, 4.30 or 4, some, I miss it by 10 minutes every time and then I have to walk from the university, which doesn't seem like a long way, but you know, if you have as much stuff as I usually carry and with a walker, it's 
it's an exciting, I have to pray a lot to get down that mountain. I just like to fund more buses. I, the city streets are totally appalling. The earthquake has happened how many years ago and the streets are falling apart and we need rings in the, on the fire, on the sand, fire pit rings for barbecues. I mean, you know, there's a lot of places you could put money for people to make them like warmer, have a spot to be, you know, over the, the university has a spot over there where they have abalones and you can put people over there to that put them at the edge of town if you want to and if have them keep away from the abalones or whatever but you know I know there is that beach and I know there's a lot of available possibilities there there's I keep saying natural bridges and the other homeless garden and there's Thurber Lane and there's all kinds of places and it's pathetic that year after year somebody gets the money that's studying or whatever's going on I I keep saying to my friends, you're pocketing the money, playing the ponies, or someone's playing the stock market. Like, I don't get what's going on at all. I don't. But I wish that you'd be more cognizant, more appropriate with your funding, you know, more aware of people's needs. When people are laying in the street because they're sleepy, and I saw someone get arrested the other day okay. for laying in the street. I'm sorry, it's appalling okay, to me. Your time is up. You'll, you'll be our last speaker. You'll have up to two minutes. Good evening, city leaders. Congratulations on the downtown to boardwalk trolley going electric. This is a great step forward in green technology. However, we chose to ne again neglect our think local, buy local stance. Why is it that First Transit, a Cincinnati-based company, the manager of this service yet again? For example, our own Metro could have hired a new driver that is seasonal for that specific service to then transition to local bus service beyond the trolley. Furthermore, there seems to be continued patterns of poor communication and con collaboration. These things need to be worked on on every level of governing body, from the city to public agencies or city to county. But if our metro is truly incapable of managing the trolley, keep this in mind before giving them the keys to the Santa Cruz branch line, as that is a very large responsibility. After being fed up with the inconsistency of quality bus service, I resorted to vehicle ownership. There are times I find myself staying late over the hill for friends, for fun, or for an assortment of contract work. I can now park and ride public transit all night long throughout most of the Bay Area, but not thanks to our metro. Another cog that seems apparent in our metro is its non-elected management. With this in mind, I turn to you, the elected officials, to make better judgment of the leaders of our non-elected officials, especially when their term comes about. In the meanwhile, I look forward to seeing you ask the non-elected officials the tough questions, and especially those who lead our housing and transportation sectors accountable. Enjoy the attached reading and look into publications from the Daily Heralds to learn more about this saga. Thank you. Thank you. So that goes ahead, that will go ahead and conclude oral communications. We're gonna go ahead and return back to the item that we had uh, paused for the moment, which is item number 16. Um, and now is the time for any questions from staff and action and deliberation. Are there any questions of staff in regards to this item? Vice Mayor Cummings. Just curious how much the drainage of the Central Park renovation, how much of that, or how much of what is um, being presented is the drainage cost? I believe uh, someone's here from Parks and Rec who could speak better to that. Uh, $55,000. How much is drainage for the park? $55,000. Oh, no, that was. Councilmember Matthews, just while we're on that park, uh, part of it, it was also ADA improvements. That's another component. So for the ADA improvements, it'd be um, another $30,000 worth spent there. And then the, the remainder, we were just gonna try to get a recreational feature, um, find a place to plug it in. Councilmember Glover and then Councilmember Crone and then Councilmember Brown. Thank you. Um, so I sit on the community programs 
committee, which is the one that made these recommendations. Uh, it was a good conversation. I will say, unfortunately, that my perspective was not rec uh, represented in the final uh, allocation recommendation. So for my colleagues that weren't a part of that conversation, uh, I had prioritized the full funding of the Nueva Vista uh, request for the 100,000 as well as 100,000 of the 150,000 request from the Homeless Garden Project. Um, I'm concerned with code enforcement uh, with regards to the impact that it has had in one way or another on our affordable housing, which is why I found it was really interesting um, that the definition was to preserve affordable housing. So maybe uh, I was wondering if the uh, economic development or whoever deals with uh, code enforcement could talk about the impact on affordable housing that it has had and if it has helped to increase, decrease, if the units that have been red tagged have been uh, renovated and put back in the market, have we lost housing because of it? And what's the rationale b behind the uh, neighbor complaint clause, essentially, which is makes it so people can anonymously complain about their neighbors who think there may be a code violation and then people come out and red tag potentially the unit. Why is it not a tenant-based complaint structure where the tenants complain about their quality of living and then that would trigger a city investigation? Alex Corey, Assistant Planning Director. I'm not aware of what you're talking about as far as this complaint process. Code enforcement in the target areas has been proactive, looking to increase and improve the housing stock. And that's been the main purpose for the last 20 years of the CBDG funding of code enforcement. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm not aware of how many units that have been lost as far as that area. I don't believe there's not many, mm -hmm. as, as always in our code enforcement and uh, rental inspection, we try to save units, not lose them. So unless there is a life safety issue that requires the unit to be vacated and, and a relocation assistant provided for those tenants, mm -hmm. we leave them in there and deal with the issues accordingly. Thank you, and then what triggers an in, uh, inspection of a, of a house? Well, we're proactive in the target areas, and, and so we're looking for violations um, however, if we get a complaint, we will deal with them. And most complaints are not anonymous. We require the complainant to file a complaint form. But in the target areas, we are proactive. We're driving around those areas looking for uh, violations of housing and et cetera. Okay, great. So uh, thank you for those answers. I really appreciate it. So um, with that, then I would make a motion to, since the drainage is a big issue at the Central Park area, and I believe there's the opportunity for us to use Quimby funds to supplement any additional, or some additional costs that may be going into the ADA accessibility, I would then move to change the allocations that were put forward by the Community Programs Committee to be 55,000 for the Central Park renovation to cover the cost of drainage, 100,000 to Nueva Vista, uh, resources or community resources, maintaining the 19.5 for the CRLA, a hundred thousand for the homeless garden project, forty thousand for the Boys and Girls Club, and forty-five thousand for code enforcement. Second. Okay. Motion by Councilmember Glover, second by Councilmember Crone, Councilmember Matthews, and then Councilmember Brown. Well, I'd like to speak to some of these. Uh, I was also on the committee and um, we didn't have the benefit at this meeting of uh, many of the project um, agencies coming forward just in general. Um, I think it is important that over time we have used CDBG to support both um, essential city programs and activities and partner with community entities. Um, I do support code enforcement. Um, um, we'll see how that shakes out. But um, typically, uh, this has been a way to fund a, a needed um, uh, member of our planning staff in maintaining safe and secure housing. And I think many of you have seen in the city manager's weekly reports from time to time the kind of um, uh, truly health and safety threatening conditions that are uh, uh, discovered and, and abated through that. Um, um, program. Um, 
in terms of the, um, I, I would say to CRLA, welcome back to Santa Cruz, that's great. <laughs> um, in terms of the Central Park renovation, um, that's long overdue for, uh, uh, upgrading, I'm glad that uh, there's interest in the drainage. I think also at the same time, the ADA improvements definitely should be done and I'm gonna ask our staff, is he, yeah. Uh, uh, my understanding was that the Quimby funds were pretty well allocated. Is that true or not true? Speak to the parks guy. <laughs> Evening, Travis Beck, Superintendent of Parks. Um, <clears throat> the uh, Parks and Rec tax funds, some of which are designated as Quimby funds for particular areas, um, we do have a balance in those accounts. However, we also have an enormous list of unfunded capital improvement projects and uh, two of the priorities that uh, are not likely to make it through. The general fund CIP are safety and energy efficiency. Um, upgrades to ball field lighting at Harvey West Park and De La Viega Park. So depending how some other financing options uh, work out, um, if we have to dedicate the park tax funds to those projects, it would completely exhaust our available funding. Um, that really illustrates my point that these aren't um, allocations um, in a vacuum. and. Um, I would like to see the ADA improvements um, proceed with the Central Park renovation because those ballpark lighting um, projects are um, really important in terms of our, you know, we've had the people come up and speak about climate action and energy efficiency and those are, are um, big ticket items that are very important. We'd like to get those taken care of. So um, I personally would like to see the um, uh, full amount I think it was 55 plus uh, 30 for the ADA, 85, that's pretty close, and maybe some improvements. I will just say parenthetically, the gentleman who brought up the activity on the roundabout, I wouldn't like that <laughs> on a weekly basis outside my house either. Um, there may be some opportunities to um, some redesign of the features. I realize roundabouts have their pluses and minuses, and we're not talking about that now. Um, Anyway, those are my thoughts. I'd like to preserve the um, uh, capital improvement money here for both the drainage and ADA. And um, in terms of the Boys and Girls Club, um, that is a really essential um, local nonprofit that serves thousands of kids every year. <laughs> um, and this is a very modest uh, improvement. I would like to um, keep the allocation for the homeless garden project at the amount when they came and presented to the committee. They were grateful for that. They are on a fundraising campaign. Um, this is a significant contribution to that. Um, it helps leverage, it helps demonstrate the city's support, it helps leverage, but um, uh, I think uh, they will be successful in their fundraising and this can be significant without going to the whole amount. Um, so I th think those would be my comments. I would, um, I don't know if others have questions about the allocations. Um, uh, if so, um, well, I, I guess um, I would like to propose some amendments, but I'll let others comment as well before we kind of see how this shakes out. There was a good deal of discussion um, by the program proponents um, at the actual committee meeting. We had Councilmember Brown, Councilmember Myers, Vice Mayor Cummings. I had a question and then we'll go back to Councilmember Glover. Yeah, well, I recognize that, um, you know, all of these projects and programs, uh, you know, and requests are um, worthy, uh, uh, you know, deserving of investment by the city. I. Um, I understand that we have limited resources. Um, given that, I'm gonna just put it out there that, um, and I'll wait to see how it shakes out with the, the rest of the, the council and the, the way these funds get distributed. But my priorities right now are um, the additional 50,000 for Nueva Vista Center. Um, that is a program that serves uh, the, it's the only program that serves the Beach Flats and Lower Ocean community. Um, it is a critical program for a, a population that is, um, as we know, um, underserved, 
uh, marginalized and increasingly, um, you know, in fear given our, you know, our broader national context. And, and so the support that that center provides is critical, both in terms of the direct services for after school homework programs and just a place for, for kids to be, um, and the engagement with the community around some of these um, immigration enforcement and know your rights issues. So I, I just think that is absolutely a priority and I want to see that program funded. I, um, I understand also, just for those who may not have been around for this history, that the Nueva Vista Center, formerly Beach Flats Community Center, before prior to the merger, um, you know, the, the got shifted into the CDBG funding path or, or, or category um, because they are eligible for CDBG funds, and then um, you know, then Core came along and um, their allocations through for community programs funding through the Core at the county and the city got shifted around, and as a result, um, their funding is is being reduced. So, and I just, I can't support that. We went through this last year at the same, I, at that time I supported Nueva Vista getting fully funded. I will continue to support that um, now and because it really is a, a, a reduction for them that is significant to their operations. Um, I also think that we ought to be making a bigger contribution to the Homeless Garden Project. They've went, waited, they requested funding last year, they got nothing. Um, this is. 1% of their budget. They have engaged in robust um, fundraising campaigns from the community um, and they, they work very hard at that and I think the city ought to, to acknowledge that and, and um, you know, and, oh, and respect <coughs> that um, with a, co a contribution that is, um, while, you know, it's, it's not really a significant portion of their overall funding, they're, they're working very hard and they deserve to have some um, additional support from the city especially given that these investments are actually on investments for, for city-owned properties. So the same argument that is made for Central Park, for the pump track last year, any other um, park in the city, this, the same argument can be made for the Homeless Garden Project in the Pogo Nip. So I wanna support them. Um, and you know, I, I would suggest the $100,000 that um, Council Member Glover <coughs> suggests as well see where people shake out. Oh, and I have a question. I saved my question for last so that I could actually make my comments. Um, I understand that the, um, you know, the rental inspection uh, allocation has, you know, been traditionally in the CDBG budget, but I'm just curious as to, so that's custom and what we've, we've become accustomed to, but I'm just curious as to why the rental inspection um, uh, uh, position is funded through CDBG when that program is supposed to be self-supporting through. Um, I, I would just add before um, Mr. Curry has any comments that it's because the level of service that's our core service is what's in the city budget and that the additional funding that's in CDBG is over and beyond the core services of, of um, of the code enforcement at the city. So the idea was that it would be an additional service in the beach flats um, to assist um, the low income residents of the beach flats per the CDBG guidelines. And rental inspection is not in, this, in the uh, CBDG funding, it's not. It's a code compliance specialist position, not a rental inspector. Rental inspection is not in this program. Right, right, and that's, I, just to clarify, that's been yeah, the, the case point, for, yeah. for, for a really long time, yeah. So for around 20 years, right, the, the we've had a code enforcement program in the Bleach Flats area for the of CDBG, and then the rental inspection program was a separate program. Okay, um, Councilmember Myers, Vice Mayor Cummings, myself, and then we'll return back to Councilmember Glover. I think you just answered my question, Martine. Um, I just had a question. Where... So in the description I, for the code, uh, for the, uh, sorry, my brain is getting tired. Um, the, yeah, code enforcement target area program is, is that lower, is that Beach Flats or what is the target area? Uh, it's a, it's a designated area that includes the Beach Flats and parts of the low, lower ocean as I recall. I brought and up a map of oh, it. There, there's a map okay. for you. There oh, you go. great. You beat me to it. Great. Um, that was that was my main question at this point, and I guess I needed clarification on page 16.12. 
and I'm just prefacing this, I'm just seeing this for the very first time. It's my first go around with these grants, so I'm just trying to understand the um, various descriptions on the um, item for Nueva Vista, which I share similar um, similar comments for as an important resource for our community in uh, in the lower ocean and beach flats. I'm just wondering about the CPC recommendation. There's a note about additional funding and I'm just curious, I'm just trying to understand oh, as, what as that, Council I, don't, I don't see those notes in other Yeah, so as Councilman Glover mentioned, um, his he wanted to give additional funding, but to make the numbers work and to come to a decision, they had to move the numbers around and to reach consensus and move on. That number was at 50,000 when the group left. But as he mentioned, he did express interest in funding it at a higher level. And I'll so, just, if I could, just because it, this was the clarification point I wanted to make during my comments was in the agenda report, it shows that when um, we do get official kind of funding amounts, that that would be prioritized to have an increased uh, award amount um, at that time. Yeah. So knowing that we had limited resources, incredible services that we all wanted to yeah. fund in a million dollar gap, but wanting to help restore that 50,000 if and hopefully when additional funding came in with the final allocations, that's where we agreed as a committee to prioritize. So would it be correct to say with the additional funding that we would know by the hearing, by the, by the second hearing next, at the next second hearing, we may be able to reach beyond this $125,000 request or are we still missing another? We, we wouldn't be able probably to go beyond the 125,000, but um, it's possible that we might be able to go up to the 50,000 and have the final budget numbers. If HUD doesn't make the budget numbers available, then that'll mean the deadline will be extended and we can push it to a later um, meeting where we should have those final numbers because the deadline gets moved out based on them actually telling us the final numbers. But just to clarify that further, that if there's additional money available by HUD, we could know that any day. We just don't know yet. Don't know yet. But if you could make that recommendation to add it to Nueva Vista, whatever is available up to their requested amount, we could put there. It's just we just don't know at this point what that allocation will be. Okay, thank you. Okay. I had two questions just for clarification. Same, same kind of deal. This is my first time going through this. Can funds be transferred through, for example, or transferred between, for example, programs and capital improvement projects, or are they restricted um, to those categories? I'll, I'll bring up a slide and speak to it a little more. So, for example, the, sorry, here, the program funding here, it can move slightly, but we have, um, for example, 104,500 allocated here. If we did allocate less, then more could go to the projects. And if we allocated less for the projects, we could shift more here, as long as we don't go over the 15% um, amount, which is 74,000 for the teen center and CRLA. So we wouldn't be in danger of that if we increase the amount awarded to Nueva Vista, since they are exempt from that cap. But they're the only one that's exempt. Um, and so the, the which there's a different slide that shows that the actual by formula allocation, there it is, is 74,000. And so um, that's what we can award for the program application requests with the exception of Nueva Vista, which we can exceed the cap. But any amount that you exceed is less that's then available for the projects. So just to have that awareness. So just for clarification, so for example, we can move funds from the capital improvement projects to Nueva Vista in the community services, correct? And could we, and I'm then for clarification as well, could funds from city programs be moved to community services to, to Nueva Vista as well? I'm just trying to understand because I know, okay. Yes, they could. I was just clarifying because I know that it seemed like <coughs> funds were going between categories and I just wanted to double check to make sure that that was actually okay. Yes. Um, I think I made my, that was the other point I wanted to make, that there's sort of a cap and we have, you, if you um, move funding around, you're decreasing it somewhere else, essentially. Yeah. Okay. I had one more question sure. as well. Um, with regards to the drainage project, I was wondering if the drainage could be done separate from the ADA improvements, if that would be possible. Mm-hmm. Totally can. 
It would need to be done together because the, the ADA improvements essentially would be um, located in, in the same area. Um, so <clears throat> they'd be providing access to the recreational amenities uh, at the site. Councilmember Glover and then Councilmember Crone and then we have a motion and and I'd like to re-understand what the motion is. Absolutely. Um, so just because I thought it was really important and for our conversation around homelessness and emphasizing the importance of um, the homeless garden project, I wanted to read this letter for the record since uh, Paul didn't have the time to do it. Uh, to the Santa Cruz City Council, this is dated um, April 23rd, so today, 2019. My name is Shad Stevens, and I've spent the last seven years experiencing homelessness and battling drug addiction here in Santa Cruz County. I've been in and out of jail and found myself to be stuck in the revolving door between the courts and homelessness. This last time I was incarcerated, Derry Ganshorn, our executive director, came in to share about the Homeless Garden Project and all of the opportunities they had to offer someone like me. I was released to new life drug treatment and came to work at Homeless Garden Project. I'm grateful to be a part of this organization where I can grow as a person alongside this beautiful organic farm with a crew of people who have gone through the same misfortunes I have. Working together in a clean and sober atmosphere is an essential part of my recovery. Lunch is a very important part of our program. We get to taste all of our hard work and eat healthy, organic produce we grow ourselves. Lunchtime is also when we get to break bread with one another and bond as a community, not only with our crew, but with the volunteers who donate time to help our cause. Anybody else who is hungry is welcome to join as well. I've lived in Santa Cruz County my whole life and I'm grateful for the opportunity to become a better member in our society. Please consider the importance to this community of our kitchen at Pogan at Farm. Thank you for your time. So I think that in itself uh, speaks to the importance of the Homeless Garden Project and the sheer, I mean, just if we look at the numbers, the amount of people that it touches and the ability to destigmatize homelessness and bring people into an effective uh, work living situation. And then also, I'm not gonna read it, but you all, we all received uh, copies of a letter from an individual named Tiffany Bravo talking about her daughter's participation in the spring break camp at the Ocean Scholars Program through New Wave of Vista. As per the presentation from Mr. Cancino, uh, the program impacts uh, 750 families annually, and I did appreciate that he brought up the issue of ICE and the impact on our community and the need to invest and not divest from low-income neighbors, or neighborhoods, especially those that are of black and brown uh, constituents. So I think it is important that we maintain uh, the highest level of possible funding while still offering some support to the other programs that were identified through the recommendations of the community programs budget. And then just to reiterate, and it's up here on the screen also, Councilmember Matthews, I'm not sure if you can, if it is kind of hard to see, um, but it's the uh, 55,000 for the Central Park, which is enough to cover the drainage. Then looking at Quimby funds, that was the other question I wanted to ask after I'm done with this, if the Parks and Rec could give us a balance of what's available in the Quimby funds, if you know. If not, I totally understand because it's a pretty specific question. Um, for Nueva Vista, 100,000. For CRLA, maintaining the 19.5. For the Homeless Garden Project, increasing it to 100,000. The Boys and Girls Club, maintaining it at 40,000. And then reducing code enforcement to 45,000. Boys and Girls Club is shown at 50. Is it? No, it's shown at 40. There it's, it's, there's a typo. There's a typo in the report. In the report, right. It's 40 though, right? 40. 40. Oh, okay. well, thank mine you. says 50 here. Mine does too. Okay. It does say 50 on the chart in the report. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Okay. I'm not taking money away from the kids. Okay. Council Member Crum. Yeah, just um, quick question. Why the spike in 2018? In the CDBG. It was a, it, I'll, I'll go back to, I have a slide for that. No, I think he's, uh, just the total. Just the total funding, not specific for anyone in particular. Right. Uh, there was a spike just because CDBG had more funds than prior years. So every year the federal government establishes how much they're gonna fund these programs and it can vary from year to year. But you didn't get any other information, like that was kind of weird, like what was the inside baseball kind of stuff going on? No. No. Um, I had a question for Alex. If you could talk a little bit, you know, I've been on here now almost three years. Could you talk about the relationship of code enforcement and rental inspection? Because I'm, I'm not clear on that. 
And are, do, do the people participating in code enforcement also participate in, in rental inspection or it's totally, totally different? Talk about the staffing? Yeah. There is some cross training between the two, but um, the rental inspectors mainly do the inspection based on the checklist that the council has uh, approved to do rental inspection inspections in our rental units. The code enforcement people other than in the target areas are re reactive, so they're responding to complaints normally from people all around town. So th that's usually the difference. Okay, thank you. Um, and I wanted to know about the Quimby funds too, if uh, that, that was available. I'm sorry, I don't have those numbers with me tonight, but we can share those with you um, at a, later this week. Thank you. Thank you. And so my understanding is tonight you're interested in having a draft uh, kind of proposal to move forward for um, uh, alignment with the regulations of this process. Yes. Right? Okay. Um, and then also, I, you know, I think I mentioned this during our community programs meeting. I'm not sure how any of the um, uh, accountability metrics are in place. Like in terms of the funding resources, what do they report back on in terms of being able to accomplish with those dollars? Is there any kind of report back for the money? From which types of programs? Just any, I mean, I mean, some of them have, I mean, I would naturally assume that the capital investments would, you would see if the capital investments were made, but if it was programming support, um, what do you anticipate sort of monitoring with outcomes and objectives and numbers or impact, which often grant uh, proposals require, funding allocations require some? Yeah, part of the application process and also part of what they have to report on in order to receive the funds as we go out through the year is they report on the number of people they serve in certain target groups, and then we report that back to HUD. Um, comparing it between the application and what they, the, who they actually provided services for throughout the year when it's a program. And when it's a project, it's much more in depth. There are things such as um, making sure everyone gets the state prevailing wage and that certain um, jobs are posted to low income individuals and there's a, a, a large um, amount of regulations they must follow for the project based portion. Okay. And then I just had a question in regards to um, the funding proposal um, being proposed by Councilmember Glover in regards to does the actual amount equal? No, it's a little bit. It's a little bit over the amount right now. Um, the proposal is at five hundred and one thousand, and we have four hundred and ninety-three. So we would need, to, if if that were to move forward, we would need to adjust it some. Okay. Just Councilmember, I think Councilmember Matthews had a question. Then Councilmember Glover. So again, I'm just going to run down them. The uh, under CDBG, um, the first bar admin by formula stays at 98.6. The ongoing city programs, you had code enforcement at what level? At 95 um, from the original recommendation and 45, 45 with the new recommendation. Okay. And then Nueva Vista at 100, so that's up by 50. Um, Parks and Rec for the Teen Center and CRLA, and then the Boys and Girls Clubs, these are out in a different order uh, at 40. That stays the same. Homeless Garden at 100 is up by 60. At 50? Well, it's Where is Homeless Garden? Oh, no. Yeah, yeah right. it's up by 50. So, so, yeah, the, in the, in the, uh, I apologize. In the staff report, this page in the staff report, those um, were transposed. Oh, so that's why. That's why. Yeah, yeah. Okay. so the okay. uh, up, Boys and Girls was 40 and the recommendation for Poganip was 50. Okay, so that goes up by. I guess clarify though. 50. Bridge while she's calculating. Pardon? I was going to say I can just clarify there. The 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 Councilmember Glover. The above total is off because I originally had forty six thousand for uh, the park, but when I heard that the drainage was fifty five, I want to make sure that we get the park for the drainage because that was the number one thing concerned by the community. So we can remove the additional nine from code enforcement. 
And if you drop that, it should take us back down to, if my- To bring it down to the to 493. 49.3. So oh. there'd be seven, eighty-eight one six. Okay. I'll just say personally, uh, I um, understand the beauty of round numbers, but um, I would like to fund the Central Park renovation at a level that gets some serious improvements there. Notice that there, and this was in the city's unfunded <laughs> list, and it's a little neighborhood park that's a pond in the winter and is not ADA accessible. So, and they said, you know, they want to do a whole park renovation and new equipment and all, And but you know, we could do the basics for 96. and. I think to do the basics, which is drainage, ADA, and maybe a new play equipment or something, um, I would like to fund that. And maybe um, 15,000 less at the homeless garden. I mean, let, let's play around with it. That's still more money than was originally recommended for the homeless garden project. And they were honestly in the hearing, very happy with that as a contribution to their project. Vice Mayor Cummings. I was just gonna give clarification on the numbers because um, I just it's, it seemed like it's not some, adding up. Yeah, so <laughs> it would be in capital improvements. It would be fifty-five thousand for the Central Park renovation, um, thirty-one thousand four hundred for the um, downtown uh, the Boys and Girls Club. So that would be reduced, oh. and then a hundred thousand for the homeless garden project. No reduction to the Boys and Girls Club. And the math doesn't work out. The reduction would be to code enforcement. Yeah, he suggested reducing the amount um, allocated to code enforcement is what okay. he suggested. So all the reductions out of code enforcement. Out of code enforcement, the Central Park Parks. and uh, something else. But the reason for that, and especially this is what I was trying to <coughs> say, is that the uh, reason why I am prioritizing the drainage at Central Park and none of the other projects is because the project itself was just spurred by the Parks and Rec Department. As they say, they just came up with it because they saw a grant and they wanted to go for it. So those things there are a wish list for the park, but I went and thank you to Noah for and his team for holding a community brainstorming conversation in the park, which I attended, which was good. There were probably about 15, maybe 20, correct me if I'm wrong, people that showed up throughout the day. Uh, 25, thank you. Um, so, and everyone was happy that we were out there, but they really were not concerned about anything in my opinion, and besides the drainage and keeping the merry-go-round, they wanted to see a baby swing and there was some potential landscaping and stuff that wanted to be put in there. But as far as the demand from the community, there was no outcry or specific request for anything outside of the specific drainage. So if we can um, uh, accomplish the drainage needs and then use other funding and maybe do some fundraising through Friends of Our Parks and so, uh, Recreation to not only do the park, uh, the, the lights thing that was mentioned before, but but then if they are really interested in doing ADA accessible stuff, that's great. But in reality, the Central Park is a block and a half away, two blocks away from San Lorenzo Park, which is completely ADA accessible to my knowledge. So uh, it's not like there's a lack of green space in the area. There's not a demand for it from the community. And if we can use those funds to better impact people that are actually in need and coming and saying that it's impacting their lives, that's the logic. Okay, Vice Mayor Cummings. I'm just trying to see, so, because I'm just doing all the math, okay. and, and code is there. I can't really see that far. Um, <laughs> a little bit, please. It's, it's code enforcement at 45, or 40, 45,000. With uh, Councilman Glover's recommendation, it's at 36,000. Okay. Yeah. 400. Okay. okay. So I'll just say um, before, I think we can sort of play with the numbers to, um, to, try to get it to work out as best we can and it's hard because this is my second time now coming through this process and there's so much need, so many great programs and just not enough resources. Um, I am hopeful that we can get to a place where we can move forward with the recommendation knowing that this is just a draft approval at this time, which is um, again, coming back to us is my assumption for finalization. I felt I felt comfortable with the proposal that the community programs uh, originally brought forward, particularly highlighting that if the additional money came in, we would increase the um, Nueva Vista Resource Center at that time. Um, so I'm, I'm 
comfortable with how it's presented, um, but we do have a motion to change it and um, a few modifications at a certain point. I think we just have to uh, make that decision and see where the majority of the council is on that. Um, so I don't know if you want to read your final motion, Councilmember Glover, and we'll go ahead and see where, where folks are. Absolutely. I'd love if you make it purple. That would be great. Yes. <laughs> it's the little things. Uh, so I associate blue with Councilmember Crown. Um, so uh, the motion is to revise the recommendations of the community program's budget as follows. So we would have the... Um, 36.4 for the code enforcement, 100,000 for Nueva Vista, $35,000 for the teen center, 19.5 for the California Rural Legal Assistance, 40,000 for the downtown Boys and Girls Club improvements, 100,000 for the Poganip Farm Capital Campaign Kitchen with the Homeless Garden Project, and $55,000 to cover the drainage of the Central Park renovations and development. Okay, so that was the motion by Councilmember Glover, and I believe was seconded by Councilmember Brown. Um, I'm sorry, Brown. I'm sorry, Councilmember Crone. Pardon me. Okay, That's great. so. Uh, at this point, we have a motion to make the modifi modify changes. Um, Council Member Matthews. I think there is a clause in here if there are additional funds that they get allocated. Can we say that if there are additional funds they get uh, allocated to the Central Park renovation so we can do the ADA? Okay, would you accept make that as that a friendly? Is that part of your proposal? As a point of clarification, um, any additional funding to Central Park, and um, this is, we're talking right now about Councilmember Glover's mm -hmm. proposal, and so the CDBG would remain at 36,400. CDBG. The code enforcement, code enforcement would remain at. Yeah, yeah, sorry, code enforcement <laughs> would be at 36,400. I guess we could say that any additional funds would go to the, to the code enforcement. That's the other. Possibility. I split between the two or? Yeah. I would uh, accept the amendment from Councilmember Matthews that, uh, well, it, with the stipulation that it would co ideally come back, because if we get like $100,000, well, I know it's not probably not going to happen, but if we come back and get a huge sum of money more, I want to make sure that we can reallocate that and potentially equitably distribute it if we can do that. So um, I'd like to, I mean, if there's a language that you'd like that would represent that council no, we, we don't know whether it's going to be a trivial amount or significant so um i i think maybe just say that to the extent there are additional funds that um the central park renovation and the um, code enforcement be considered priorities for restoration Mm. That's a friendly amendment to Council Member Glover. And just a question to clarify from the Parks Department is that you said it was an extra 30K for the ADA access? Yeah, I mean, um, <clears throat> we'll, we'll design it to um, you know, accommodate whatever funds we get. The, the original plan was, was 30,000. Okay, so then I would be happy to say that to up to $30,000 of additional funds can be allocated to Central Park's ADA development uh, and anything over 30,000 in addition would come back to the city council for redistribution. Uh, just a point of clarification, um, it's gonna come back at the second public hearing. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so we'll, we'll use that for our guidance and it, the, all the numbers will come back to you again. Okay, um, we could also split it if you'd like between 15 code enforcement, 15 park renovations, but I think the ADA. I don't know ADA. what it's gonna be and it's it's all draft anyway. Okay, so. so cool, we'll stick so with that 30. We'll have another ch chance to roll up our sleeves on this one. Uh, City Manager Bernal and then... Uh, I just wanted to highlight that with respect to the, uh, I don't think it's up there yet, the um, CDBG funding, which you've reduced, where is that? For, for which program? You're the talking CDBG? about code enforcement? Yeah, code enforcement. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, code enforcement. That that would, just to be clear, that would result in the elimination the program. of the position. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so um, go ahead, Councilmember. Yeah, Councilmember Myers, please. Yeah, that was my question: was will we lose the program altogether? And if we, if that is the case, speaking towards the target area for this, the age of homes in that area, the economic status of a lot of people who live in that area, I think it's a huge mistake to lose an important program that keeps people safe in their homes 
and uh, it's exactly counter to actually what a lot is being said tonight. So I, I think that would be, um, I just think that's a huge mistake. <laughs> and I'll just say, um, just to reiterate that, I think the original proposal that was outlined really did allow for a reprioritization to restore the Nueva Vista funding. And um, we had a long discussion at our community programs meeting to get us to this place. So I'm supportive of the plan as presented. We'll have another chance at it. Um, we can go ahead and take the vote. Council Member Glover, if you have any I just want to just make a, just with regards to the statement from the city manager, I appreciate your analysis and um, projection of what that might be. I do feel that that is a little bit of a binary perspective. Either we fund it with the money that could go to support critical community programs or we have to lose a staff member. Uh, I am, as you know, very much in uh, interested in reallocating money in the budget. We spent $600,000 from the general fund to rebuild a golf course restaurant for a select group of people that use the golf course in Santa Cruz. So to say that we're going to have to completely close down code enforcement because we're taking money and putting it in a program that's proven to help low-income families when we have money in a general fund that is being used, in my opinion, very inappropriately and irresponsibly, I would appreciate it if we could frame it in that we'd have to pull money from other places and not just we're going to lose code enforcement because I think that's an um, inaccurate representation of the re realities that we face with money allocations. Okay, all right. That's okay. Okay, so we have. If I could, it, um, no. we we have. And let, I mean, I think there's a time and place for debate. We will have another chance, as I, I remember. I don't. I don't want to go that. Let that. Council, okay, Councilmember Matthews. Go unanswered. Councilmember Matthews, we'll go ahead and 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 take the vote after that. That is an expenditure that will be repaid within an estimated four years and will be revenue generating from that point on. Okay. That's all I want to say. Thank you for that. Okay. All right. So we have a motion by Councilmember Glover, seconded by Councilmember Crone. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? No. No. So that passes with Councilmember Brown, Vice Mayor Cummings, Crone, and Glover in support. Thank you very much. Thank you all. We'll go ahead and take a, a 10 minute break and then we'll reconvene oh for God. our um, evening session, which is two um, presentations. And I will um, ask that we sort of set about an hour per presentation and um, manage the time within that context. So we have, um, we're, we're now on to our evening session of tonight's agenda. And this is uh, two presentations from our department heads in regards to um, preparation for our upcoming budget hearings. So we have our first presentation from economic development, and that's a department presentation uh, to be led by uh, Director of Economic Development, uh, Bonnie Lipscomb. And, and other staff, I guess, will weigh in as needed. And then we'll move on to our Planning and Community Development Department presentation as well. It does uh, appear that we may have um, a couple of council members who have decided to leave. Is that correct? I know uh, Council Member Crone did inform me that he was uh, leaving, uh, but I'm not sure. I didn't hear from Council Member Glover, though. Okay. Okay. I mean, okay. Okay, so, so we can keep so going. So do we um, essentially, okay, well, I believe Matthews is returning with her stuff. So we'll have uh, five council members. Um, what the process is, is to uh, hear uh, sort of an overview and uh, as I said, in preparation for the upcoming um, budget hearing and um, we will have the presentation and then allow uh, time for questions um, and one of the um, components would be sort of trying to have a set amount of time per presentation, looking at about an hour tops per each presentation. Um, but given that uh, we may have a couple council members who are not here at this time, um, 
we will have uh, potentially less or more time for questions from other council members. So we'll go ahead and turn it over and council member Myers. I'd like to see if I have the potential to, um, I'd like to make a motion to see, uh, well, I'd like to make a motion to fix the time to adjourn if we could this evening to 10 p.m. Uh, just knowing it's been a long day and it uh, looks like we've lost a lot of people in the audience. So I'm assuming that's probably gonna fit the schedule. It's 8.30 now. I don't know if that's possible or if we could go can to 10.30. Can we just 30. agree on it? We can agree on it, certainly. Yeah. I agree. I don't think it'll be an issue given the, who was here. <laughs> okay, great. So it looks like we'll have a approximately 10.15, F, or, I'm sorry, 10 o'clock fixed time to adjourn this, this I, evening. And just clarification, do we know, is Mr. Glover gone? No he was headed out that way. So, um, okay, well, I will just encourage maybe our city manager to have him reach out to the department heads directly for um, any preparation materials or information they'd like to have in advance of our upcoming budget hearings. <coughs> thank you for being here this evening and uh, recognizing we're starting an hour after time. I wanna thank you for your patience and feel free to take it away. Okay. Great, thank you, Mayor. Bonnie Lipscomb, Director of Economic Development. Woo. <laughs> and uh, we have a presentation, it's roughly about 30 minutes, um, and then there's time for questions. Maybe we won't need quite as many of those today. I will say that it's a very broad brushstroke of a presentation. We're not going into depth on a lot of the things that we do within the department, um, just given the time frame that we have. Um, so I'm happy to sit down with any of you or with Councilmember Crone or Glover afterwards to go into any of the detail and the presentations will be available for you as well. Um, so first I just actually want to thank our team for spending a considerable time putting this presentation together. So Amanda Rotella is our principal management analyst that uh, really is, has the ownership for this presentation. Um, but we, and so she did a really good job on it, which you will see. Um, but uh, we also had a lot of people from across our department, pretty much everyone had a hand in pulling together and providing information on the work that we do at the city every day. Uh, we have a few here in the audience um, today um, and then presenting today will be myself, um, Rebecca Unit um, to talk about business services, Beth Toby to talk about city arts, and then to answer any specific questions about property asset management is David McCormick, um, who's also in the audience today. So I just wanted to start off by, by acknowledging that. Okay, um, so what we do and what we value, um, we are roughly five divisions, and so this is focused on sort of how we deliver those core services, which are housing and community development, asset and property management, infrastructure development, also the work of the successor agency and our funding arm, business support, and city arts. Um, our values are providing high quality customer service as we do the things in our five divisions, finding and implementing solutions and positively impacting our community. Our expenditures for fiscal year 2020 is roughly a little over six million. Um, the majority of that is broken down to with housing and community development, asset property uh, and property management, community and business support, um, our largest percentage is personnel, a little over a third, and then admin and other, which includes um, consultant crunch contracts and outside uh, uh, legal for our affordable housing projects and programs. Um, our resources is roughly a third of that. These are outside general fund resources and um, not to confuse you, the general fund are revenues that we actually receive into the general fund where we are ask, act as a fiscal agent on behalf of the city. And so where it says general fund 19%, that's actually funding we receive through our downtown PBID, a property-based improvement district that we receive that funding. Um, the co-op retail management is another entity that we um, act as and administer that program on behalf of that property-based improvement district. So these are resources coming in um, to administer the work that we do. Um, additionally, we have Affordable Housing Trust Fund. I'll go into a little more of that this evening um, and CDBG funding, which we just talked about. Our overall percentage of the general fund as a department is roughly 4%. 
And one of our governing documents that we use to really help guide the work that we do is our ED um, work plan. And this is just a snapshot. This is available on our website and to anyone who is interested in finding out a little bit more about you know, sort of the things we focus on and some of the metrics. I will say this is heavily focused on the ED strategic side, but it crosses over, as you can see here, into housing development, affordable housing, and all the other divisions that we do because they all are under the umbrella of economic development. We are in the final sort of, uh, you know, six months of our ED work plan. We will be gearing up a new one and we'll tie that into the council goals and objectives for the next two year period. We'll be wrapped into our, our strategic work that we do. This is an overview of our team. We have 14 um, positions, and then we additionally have two part-time temporary positions. Um, one is part-time half position in the downtown as a downtown liaison, and another one is um, part-time uh, property management on the tannery and doing right-of-way acquisition for the city. Um, this goes across the four divisions, five divisions that we just talked about. Um, so next I'll talk briefly about, um, actually this will probably be a little bit larger portion of the presentation about housing and community development. This is just a photo of our completed project a couple years ago on the Riverwalk. Um, remember you know this, the 21 units on Lindbergh Street. This is a housing team overview. This is largely the work um, that we do on the housing side, and I'm not expecting you to see all the details of this, but again, this is available for you. Um, if you're interested to know about the different things we focus on in the housing department, and this includes HUD and state, um, HCD, grants and grant reporting, um, policy development and, and updates, including ordinances, we, which we work on those in conjunction with the planning and community development, city program administration, um, housing development, and preservation and, and monitoring, and we'll, I'll talk a little bit more about monitoring coming up. This is just an overview of our affordable units citywide, and um, we have roughly 700, 1,745 affordable units citywide. The city helped create, largely some of those with our uh, redevelopment housing set-aside funds, roughly 1,200 of those 17 145 units. Um, we monitor about 1,550 units citywide, a little over 1,000 of those are affordable. We additionally monitor uh, about 500 ADU non-affordable units through the ADU program. This is an interactive um, map on our housing webpage. So if you go there, you can look at the major projects, affordable housing projects in the city um, that are 10 units or larger. We're not showing all of the projects out of respect for privacy, um, but some of the larger projects that also have uh, various funding sources in it. You can interact and look at the breakdown of some of those funding sources and a little project information on our site. So just a couple com uh, community program highlights from fiscal year 2019. Um, we had in fiscal year 2019, 100,000 CDBG and Red Cross funds for Nueva Vista and community resources, 82,000 funds for the Teen Center through Parks and Rec, and 73,000 in CDBG Home and Red Cross funds for our security deposit program. And so these are just a few of the programs that we funded um, in the last year and administered all of the reporting for these programs and administration. Um, project project highlights. Um, roughly this year, um, in fiscal year 2019, we provided additional funding to the Water Street Project, and I'll go briefly over the total funding in a few minutes, but this year from home funds for Water Street Project, 268,000, 150,000 for the homeless service facility, this is for the sewer line replacement, um, and then 72,000 um, CDBG funds for the bike park revitalization and parks and rec, and you can see a little rendering of that above. Uh, Water Street Housing Project. It's a 41 unit uh, affordable project on Water Street. And you can actually see this is in, in construction as we speak. Um, photograph. It looks very true, actually, to the, the rendering. Um, we have 4.6 million in city investment, and this is across all of our various funding sources, and that's really the takeaway about a project that the city's involved in, is just how many funding sources we need to leverage to be able to support affordable housing development in our community. So that 4.6 million, we have home funds, federal home funds, we have our CDBG block grant funds, we have our affordable housing trust fund, about 1.3 million, and another roughly 1.3 million of our RDA bonds. This is from our housing successor agency in this project 
in order to make this work. And how that equates to a cost per unit, because that's something that comes up frequently, is how much money are you putting into the project as the overall project funding and how much is per unit. That roughly equates to, from the city investment, to about 115,000 per unit, which is really good leveraging. That's a beautiful project. It is. It is, and this project is through a considerable community input. The original rendering was a very different design, and so there's a lot of community input and engagement, and this is the final product, and I think everyone's really pleased with it. Um, so just as an example, how much work actually goes into an affordable housing project, and just framing this slightly, it's important to note that for the Water Street project, we've partnered and put in considerable money with an affordable housing developer um, and really helped pull that project together. So we're, that was one that was more intensely involved at the city level. This is one that actually was it came to us as a private development initially, and in 2000, and actually since 2009, um, but in progress since 2010. And the city has been involved in that point, since that point. The, the numbers in the boxes you see up there is just our involvement in 2019. And this isn't a city-led project, but this does give you an example of the various um, layers and levels that we get involved in affordable housing projects at the city. Um, so legal counsel just in 2019. We've had over 200 hours in staff time working on this. We have four city agreements, two lender agreements. We can go into the details of what those agreements are, but this is just what it takes to actually make sure that the units going forward will be affordable, how we get those layering agreements, how we get the affordability in place going forward. Um, affordable housing 2019 highlights. Um, we have either directly funded or helped create 160 units created or awarded, awarded funding in 2019. That includes uh, 41 units at Water Street that we just showed you, 27 units at Jesse Street with home funds, and the 64 units I just mentioned at 350 Ocean. Um, this in, in also includes roughly 1.5 million of ED infused into the into the housing and community programs and projects throughout this this year. I just want to take a mention a, a moment and mention AB 411, which is uh, the bill um, that Assemblymember Stone introduced um, into the state this this year into the legislature, and um, we actually council. Councilmember Brown has been instrumental in championing this initially, and I think probably um, persuading uh, Assemblymember Stone to introduce this bill on our behalf. So thank you for your, for your support on that. What this will do for us is take our frozen capital bonds, it's over 16 million in frozen former redevelopment bonds, and allow us to repurpose those for the, for the purposes of creating affordable housing in our community. So this will uh, fund an, a number of important projects in our community, and as you saw, the breakdown of the of the funding from the previous slide, 16 million will go a long way and can and has the potential to create a lot of affordable housing in our community. So we're we're pretty excited about that. It made it unanimously through the first two committees, uh, the Housing and Community Development Committee, um, unanimously at the Local Government Committee um, through uh, after testimony, and now tomorrow it's being heard in the Appropriations Committee. The consultant really likes the bill, um, which is great. So we we are really um, uh, uh, cautiously optimistic that it's going to go forward, that it's the right time um, for this bill to have support at the state level. Um, we've also, as a highlight, had 40 households receive security deposit support this year. You heard Tiffany earlier talk a little bit about the success of that program and how they actually needed additional funding, which is one of the recommendations um, that we had to increase that um, on the home side. And then we're also in support right now, um, and we fund this through our affordable housing trust fund. We're in the third My, home, my House, My Home um, project right now, so that's pretty exciting for us. Um, and that leads us to a little spotlight on My House, My Home. And this, this program, it's important to mention, um, we're going to show briefly just a portion of a video um, of the first My, My House, My Home project, um, the Whitleys, and that this is a project that's a partnership that I think everyone knows is with Habitat for Humanity and the Senior Network Services. But what you may not realize that our own, it's just recently retired, Carol Berg, was really instrumental in helping design and define this program, working directly with um, Habitat for Humanity. So we're really proud of this program. We're really proud of the leveraging and um, 
what it creates for community um, and really aging in place in our community. Um, so with that, um, we will, we had a little bit of technical audio difficulty earlier, so hopefully this will be fine. So sorry. <laughs> Brenda and I will be living back home with my parents. It's part of the My House, My Home project. Where you're at now is in my dwelling. It's where I basically can be right next door to my parents in case they need me or need any help. My House, My Home is letting the seniors age in their house instead of having to go to assisted living or something like that. Well, they're making it accessible where a family member can live in a dwelling like this and also be able to take care of them when they get older and are unable to take care of themselves. This program is unique. It's a partnership between Habitat for Humanity and senior homeowners to build them an accessory dwelling unit, sometimes called a granny unit. And that allows them to either downsize into a smaller unit and then they can rent out their main house. That allows them to stay in their neighborhood, keep their garden, keep all of their neighbors and their friends and their support network. One that's it. So that's just a... My audio keeps going out. That's just a, a, a little taste of, of the video, um, but we're really proud of the program and the impact that it has on the community. And some of you may have recognized Brenda, um, <laughs> which is, is great too. Um, and some of these are nodding at me and from our public works department. So it's great to have, have that right here at home as well. Um, so the next, I've had a, a lot of questions and feedback on our affordable housing trust fund. So I wanted to take just a minute to highlight this. And again, I, I have a lot of detail here. We don't need to go into all of them now unless there are questions, but I'm available to go um, into detail on this later with any council members requests. So where do these funds come from in our affordable housing trust fund? And it's actually a variety of sources. Um, the main sources and some of the larger infusions have been through loans or grants from the former RDA. Um, um, we've had two major state grants over the years. One was in uh, 2008, um, where there's a state uh, grant matching program that's an affordable housing trust fund at the state level program, and you have to have funding as a match to be able to receive it, which we did in 2008. Um, and there's another round recently with SB3 that was just passed last November. And so we do want to be able to apply for those grant funds, and we need the match in order to, to get, the, get the funding. So we are projecting that for next year and I'll show you in a second. Um, the other source of revenue that we have in 2014, you'll see um, that green area, that's actually when we sold 2030 North Pacific. And um, we actually owned those units um, originally as a, a negotiation for their inclusionary. Um, so we actually took two units in lieu of the inclusionary and we've um, since sold them. We initially rented them out um, to, for, as affordable units and then we sold them and um, put the money into the affordable affordable housing trust fund. So that's the spike you see in 2014. Um, in this current year, um, the funding that you see in blue um, on the far right hand side of your screen is actually the inclusionary fees, the in lieu fees paid by uh, 555 Pacific. So those are the major sources. It's, it's sometimes it's hard to predict. We have sort of a moving target of when development goes through and if they are paying in lieu fees, which is under our muni code as a legal alternative to providing units in site. Um, then those funds go into this um, into this fund, and I'll go into a little bit of how how we budget those and how we how we do spend those. Um, looking out ahead for the next few years, um, this 2021, the, th the bar you see in pink is an anticipation of being able to apply for the state funding that is coming up. Um, we do need to have a minimum balance of a, of a million in grant funds if we want to secure a million. This, there's the potential for it to go up to two million, which would mean that we would need to have two million in funds, um, which we don't currently have in reserve right now, so it's something for us to discuss later once the uh, notice of funding ability comes 
comes out, we can come back to you and have a, a discussion about how we want to, to move forward on that. Um, in regular annual avenue, um, revenue that we have coming in, it's roughly a, a little under 200,000, 150,000 of that is uh, rent revenue uh, from one unit that we have on River Street, which is actually a unit that we purchased to maintain affordability. And we have rental revenue coming in that and it goes in this fund. And then the area in green um, is roughly uh, some uh, development fees estimated that we've been giving annual annually. And it's related specifically to what we know we will be getting is about 46,000 a year, um, which is part of the agreement for 555 Pacific. So at a minimum, we'll have roughly 200,000 coming in in the Affordable Housing Trust Fund each year until 2032. Meanwhile, there'll be other projects that will come forward that likely may opt to pay in lieu fees, and then that will be reflected here as well. Um, so how are funds used? Um, we do have current affordable housing trust fund commitments. Um, this is just for this fiscal year. I went over earlier overall from the affordable housing trust fund. We've actually funded 1.3 million out of the affordable housing trust fund for Water Street. But this year we have um, the remaining funding of roughly just under 36,000. Um, we also have a estimate of a gap financing that was requested that uh, we've previously committed roughly of 325,000 for 350. Ocean Street, um, a placeholder for Pacific Station of 150,000, and uh, the two ADUs um, currently for my house, my my um, my home, which is roughly totals about 662,000. Um, additionally, we have program commitments um, that we fund out of the Affordable Housing Trust Fund. We have the Landlord Incentive Program, um, which you know, we recently came to council to do a, a, a slight amendment to that a program to allow it to uh, be open to more landlords within the program. That's a commitment roughly of about 22,000 a year. We have the Inclusionary Housing Affordability Preservation Program um, of 24,000 um, commitment. And that program largely, we've um, purchased one unit through that program, which is to preserve an inclusionary unit, inclusionary housing units, which are at risk of losing affordability, is that we then have the opportunity to go in and try to maintain affordability. And um, that's similar to the Riverfront Apartment Fund, um, which is we've um, made an agreement with them a number of years ago for them to maintain their affordability on those units beyond their initial commitment in exchange for doing ADA improvements at roughly 10,000 a year. So it's a pretty good deal for or the units that are in that project. Um, and then additionally, um, we have some small amount of funds for administration for the projects and the programs that go forward, and that is roughly uh, proportionate to the projects that actually go forward each year. And then we ha do have some debt, and we're holding this debt. We're not paying it right now, but it is um, debt that at some point we'll, we will need to address, and that's the former RDA debt of half a million, um, and the which we actually used a seed funding for the Affordable Housing Trust Fund at a point in order to get the state grant match, and the Red Cross Earthquake Fund of 250000 So. Altogether, when you look at the overall balance of 2.7 million, we have existing commitments of 1.5. Remaining uncommitted funds uh, is 1.2 million. Um, we would like to recommend reserving that a minimum 1 million so that we could apply for the state grant funds to match, which gives us an available balance right now of 229, which could fluctuate depending on the NOFA from the state of how much is actually available to apply for state grant funds. Um, with that, I will quickly go to asset development and property management. This is just a highlight. Um, we, um, through the, over the 100 sites that we manage across the city, that includes 22 cafe extensions and parklets, we bring in 2.5 million in general fund annual revenues. That's not reflected in the beginning of our slides. We don't include that um, for our department, but it's just important to, to recognize the amount of funding that does come into the general fund from the leases um, that we manage in the, as part of this department. Um, overall responsibilities of this division are lease management, project management, leveraged investment, um, real estate transactions, and tenant marketing. Um, we do work also on behalf of some of the other departments, right-of-way acquisition, for example, Highway 19, some of the, the process um, that we go through that, um, and just you know property disposition um, of city assets as well. Sky Park would be another example of that. 
uh, spotlight on the municipal wharf. Um, this is a project that we collaborate um, with both Parks and Rec and our public works across the area, but we do manage um, the leases on the wharf and manage the overall property. The majority of the property is owned by the city. There's a couple long-term leases where the property reverts to the city at the end of their lease term, um, but we do manage those and it's it's something we, we take a lot of pride in. Um, and highlights on the wharf, to roughly two million visitors each year, 30 million in annual sales, 25 businesses, two million in city revenues are returned from the leases on the wharf and over 400 jobs are employed at the wharf. Briefly on infrastructure and development, I'll just highlight um, a few slides on, on a couple of these. I'll just mention the Tannery Arts Center here. I don't have another slide for there, but that is a major project, and you can see from the previous one, here's another picture of it, um, that is a project that the city, former um, redevelopment agency, the city owns the eight-acre campus. Um, we contract with a long-term ground lease with Art Space to manage the housing on the site, and additionally, we subcontract currently the management of the 27 commercial commercial tenants, although we're in the process, and that's something that will likely be back to you before the end of the year, of working with ArtSpace um, on possibly having the city manage those commercial leases locally. Um, we also have direct leases with the Arts Council for, and the Crone House and with the Jewel Theater Company for the Culligan Theater at the Tannery. So those are some of the things that are coming up next year as we're in the process of doing a sculpture garden with our arts pro through our arts program, and um, we need to determine the final phase of the project development with ArtSpace as a part of our original disposition and development agreement. Uh, wayfinding, um, fabrication ins installation is coming. Um, we have the plans and specs engineering done and it's going out to bid and we anticipate you know, working around sort of the main tourist season and starting uh, installation in fall of 2019, which is really exciting. This is a citywide wayfinding program. Uh, downtown Refresh, um, as you can see on the slide, this is a plan and development. This is looking at the downtown, um, the infrastructure, the improvements that are needed, looking to see where we can have some efficiencies. Um, we have some funding set aside from the former RDA bonds as well to do some overall beautification, um, streetscape improvements, streets, uh, street furniture, street trees, things like of that nature. But we're doing an overall assessment currently of the downtown conditions, and then we're gonna come forward for council consideration of a recommended program to move forward. Uh, Wharf Master Plan, I just want to show of an old rendering. Um, and we'll just mention what's important about the Wharf Master Plan. We've been on hold for some time just with other priorities at the city, but we do need to move the plan forward and finish the EIR in, in order to do a number of projects, whether it's the full master plan as envisioned um, originally through the master plan. Um, in order to secure state grants and other federal funding, we do need to have a master plan in place. Um, Coastal, Coastal Commission has requested that we finalize the master plan. Um, we have a public works plan as well, and some of these are contingent upon us having an approved program going forward, so that is an important element for us. And then the trolley, um, all electric by the 2020 trolley season. We're showing this nostalgic photo of our much loved trolley because it's on its last legs. Um, you will see it this season. Um, we, as some of you may recall, we had two trolleys. We're now using the parts from one a historic trolley to keep the other one going. We do love it. People enjoy riding it, but we are going all electric. We received a grant um, this past year from uh, the Monterey Bay Unified Air Pollution Control um, District Board. Um, to purchase um, the additional trolleys for two electric trolleys. So you'll see those next season, not this coming season. Um, we're in the process of finalizing that. So you will see this trolley um, this season um, on uh, major weekends, all weekends and major holidays this summer from noon to eight. Uh, briefly, Pacific Station. Um, this is 100, give or take, um, maybe um, more, uh, affordable housing units in our downtown. And this is a project in conjunction with the Metro. Um, but we do have a plan A and a plan B, and I'll just briefly mention that. The vision for Pacific Station is that we're creating critically needed affordable housing for our region. This is a partnership with Santa Cruz Community Health Center and Dentists, And so we'll be providing high quality health and dental care for underserved children and adults in our community as part of this 
project, as well as some improvements to a safe, efficient, attractive um, public transit hub with amenities and modern technology. The idea is to completely renovate the streetscape and make it very pedestrian friendly and vibrant on Lower Pacific Avenue while creating affordable housing units and a, and a new Paseo that connects um, to the riverfront in downtown. This is a layout of the current metro site and what you see in sort of that orange hatched is the area that is our plan A of where we could develop and, and really activate the street front with a mixed use housing project. Oh, and that got off. Um, so site A is that lower. Site B is where you see the blue city-owned site, uh, the potential acquisition in green, and the yellow area that's recently was dedicated to the city. So if we're unable to work um, out the details um, on the site relocation um, with uh, Metro, we do have a site B assemblage that we're working on as well. Um, just to make sure as we're looking um, with Metro and how this would work, this is just a massing study so you can see uh, the project and this is a layout um, for the corridor to make sure that it would work for the double loaded for the affordable housing. And with that, I will turn it over to Rebecca Unit, who's going to talk about business support and then we'll conclude with an arts program uh, presentation by Beth Toby. Good evening, uh, Rebecca Unit, I'm business liaison for the city. Um, we do business support in a variety of ways, um, and my team is an economic development coordinator and our temporary uh, downtown liaison. Um, just to provide some highlights of our activities over the past few years, uh, we had 600 contacts with businesses in FY 2018, um, and that comes through walk-ins, phone calls, emails, and the business visits and outreach that we do. Um, we were able to provide uh, $50,000 in facade and commercial signage grants in uh, fiscal year 2018, um, and that helped five uh, businesses beautify their storefront. Uh, we also facilitated $300,000 in our Grow Santa Cruz Loan Fund in 2016 to be able to support Santa Cruz Millworks expansion in Harvey West and uh, Cafe Campesino owner uh, Dina, who's pictured here, um, who was able to open her full-scale uh, restaurant, Jaguar, on Socal Avenue. Um, and then we also welcomed 228 new businesses to the city through a welcome packet and letter signed by the mayor and uh, Bonnie with information about resources to grow their business. Um, so one of our major programs is the facade improvement program. I um, mean, it's definitely more than just a fresh coat of paint. Uh, one of our success stories is Alejandro from De La Hacienda Taqueria. We did this project in, uh, it was completed in 2016. Uh, Amanda actually managed this program, uh, this project and uh, he was able to report to us that his sales uh, dramatically increased after the success of this project, and we gave him a $12,000 grant um, to make a huge transformation. Um, so this, uh, we uh, have found huge success with this program, um, and we also added our commercial signage grant program in 2015 to create a little bit lower barrier to entry um, and another impact. Um, and then this year we did uh, significant outreach. We switched, we switched to a call to applications and worked with Peter Bichier, our community liaison, to do some targeted outreach to our Spanish-speaking community and really try to get those grants into the folks' hands who need it the most. Um, so just to cover uh, one of our other core services, a business liaison, so that is uh, myself, and this position was created last year, um, and I was grateful to be promoted into this uh, role. <laughs> and so I like to characterize my services in four major areas. Um, I provide one-on-one -on -one support to businesses. I do collaboration, marketing and promotion, and celebration. Uh, in fiscal year 2018, I was able to assist over 120 businesses. Um, and I also like to point out that 84% of our businesses in the city of Santa Cruz have nine uh, or fewer employees. So I'm really working with small businesses, local businesses, um, and able to make a big impact and see their successes in the community. Um, an example of, our, of the efforts that I do, um, we do one-on-one -on -su one support or four-on-one -on -one support, like uh, last Friday when we helped David Torres of La Montaña Taqueria uh, get his ABC licensing notification out. Um, we really pulled the team together to help him. Um, and I do that also, uh, I, I, you know, I, I handle one-on-one -on -one with people to help them understand the process. Um, I coordinate with the different departments, largely with planning and sort of work on creating a checklist for people because oftentimes they'll come in and they will have never been to City Hall or never started a business and so they really need that friendly face and someone who can translate the technical aspects to them and help them through um, what can be sort of a scary process. 
uh, collaboration. Um, I really work on uh, being the person who knows all the resources that are out there and can connect the dots for people. Uh, we coordinate events, we partner with the Small Business Development Center and other technical assistance providers um, to make sure that our business community has the tools that they need to be successful. And then marketing and promotion, we do that through a variety of things, um, but we like to tell the stories of our local businesses uh, to the community, and we like to support um, our business community through specific events, um, such as last year's Alliance of uh, Women Entrepreneurs launch event that happened in the downtown that we were able to support. Um, and then celebration, which is really the best part of the job, um, being able to celebrate either getting a building permit to start construction or a ribbon cutting, like all hands workshop that happened last Friday as well, um, and the kind people's grand opening that Bonnie attended on Saturday. Um, this is really the fun part of being able to share in the success and knowing that we we're able to help them and that they're gonna be able to contribute to our community. Um, and then just a brief overview, uh, our downtown liaison position that we added, uh, Candace Elliott is filling that role for us and she's really focused on being a point of contact in the downtown to connect stakeholders and work on uh, some of the initiatives that we're really focused on in uh, keeping our downtown vibrant. Right, I'll hand it over to Beth. Good evening, I'm Mayor and City Council. I'm Beth Topi, I'm the City Arts Manager. Um, and this is a photo of uh, our third round of scrap, the Santa Cruz Recycled Art Program that was held at Radius Gallery. Um, and our next round is coming up in December. It's going to be at the Blitzer Gallery. Um, so we have five ongoing programs in City Arts. SCRAP, the Santa Cruz Recycled Art Program, which is a great collaboration with Public Works. Our Sculpt Tour Program, which is our downtown, downtown rotating collection of sculptures. Graphic Traffic, which is our signal box, ugh, signal box art. Our mural slash mural matching grant. And uh, just completed last year is a Real Trail Arts Master Plan, which we'll be implementing over the coming years. We have currently 79 public artworks in our collection. Um, between fiscal year 17 and 19, um, we created 16 new artworks. Um, we had three conservation projects. Uh, we gave out four mural matching grants um, and we gave out nine cultural festival sponsorships. Um, our major ongoing initiatives are centered around equity, inclusivity, and environmental justice. This is something we've been working on for the last two years. We brought in a cultural equity expert. We've had two retreats with the Arts Commission. We're working on a policy statement. We're working on a resource guide and focusing just that lens on how do we make all of our um, projects and programs equitable, inclusive, and environmentally sustainable. Um, and then the Rail Trail Arts Master Plan um, will be implemented as funding allows uh, for art along the rail trail. Um, and uh, again, the scrap. And then another initiative started up this year uh, is the artist meetups. And these have really been a collaboration between the city, um, Art League, uh, and uh, Arts Council Santa Cruz County. And they're focused on giving artists um, ability to network, but also professional development skills. So training, how do you get your art in a gallery? How do you do social media? Things like that. And we've had a great uh, turnout at those. Um, and in the, in the vein of equity and inclusivity, uh, we really love this project that we worked on with the Diversity Center. Um, they came to us with this idea and then we ended up funding them um, for, and, and they, they wanted a wall, they needed a wall. So we um, let them do this mural at the Loudon Nelson Center and they made a great video that um, I'd like to show. Helping create this mural my community. This project has personally been so important to me. By being a part of this mural project, it helped me feel unashamed to be gay. I think that the mural has had an impact on me personally. I feel so connected to the people that I painted it with. In the Santa Cruz area, I didn't feel accepted as much, but with the people's great spirits about the mural, made me feel more of a part of this town. As a queer Latinx young adult who grew up in this community, I have experienced lots of injustice in spaces that the youth have the power to change. And just the fact that we now have a mural at the Lone Nelson Center that kind of represents who we are is an amazing step forward. 
I like that it projects our optimistic vision while not letting go of the parts of our history that maybe aren't so beautiful or easy to talk about. The bridge to intersectionality resembles the healing we must do to create a coexisting, interwoven, genderless world. I really feel like it made a difference, not only for just the people that are going to see it in their everyday life, passing by and seeing the underlying messages. I hope that every time someone sees this mural, they can smile and remember that together we can make change. The visibility of this artwork is such an important part of starting a dialogue with young people People about how they believe they can improve and influence our community. But as much as we have changed for the better, our society still needs to continue working towards our goal of equal rights for all. Many people pass by this mural every day, which reminds us that we have come a long way, but that we still need to continue fighting for equality. I am hopeful that I will be able to grow up seeing this piece of art inspiring the minds of my generation to move forward and stay strong in our march towards a more perfect world. We as a community are finally uh, coming together and supporting queer youth and art is a way to do that. Now more than ever, it's easy to say we have a bleak future, but I've seen the kind of people, especially the youth, who are dedicated to driving us towards the future we painted. And I really hope that everyone can benefit and find joy and find peace in this story. This is just such a beautiful gift for the community. That's it. Thank you. What a lovely note to end on. Thank you very much for your presentation. Um, if you have another mural project, let us know. I love, I love, baby, keep us posted on the mural project. I want to go out and paint. <laughs> um, well, actually, if you didn't see the email about the GoFundMe for the project that Taylor Reinhold is doing in collaboration with Bayview Elementary, I'll send it out again. Um, but they are still fundraising for it. But that whole wall along Mission Street, that's Huge. Huge. Kind of ugly, right. is going to have a gorgeous ocean conservation theme mural on it. Well, mm -hmm. I'll look forward to <laughs> when the dates are set to participate. And please do feel free to re resend that. Thank you for your presentation and the time and thought you went into putting this uh, PowerPoint together. Um, I'll go ahead and ask the council if there are any questions of our economic development team doing a whole bunch of work in our community at this time. Councilmember Brown. No, I don't really have any questions at the moment, um, but I just did want to take the opportunity to send a, you know, a big uh, note of kudos and, and gratitude for all the work you do. It's it's kind of amazing uh, to see um, all of the amazing things that can be done with uh, limited resources and the way that you all leverage um, outside resources and, and kind of make these things happen and put it all together is it continues to astound me. Um, I just really appreciate it all particularly as we know with the end of redevelopment. Um, and so just want to take this opportunity to say thank you and, and thanks for um, the presentation. Thank you. Thank you, um, Councilmember Brown. And I know uh, Councilmember Myers had some questions and then uh, Vice Mayor come Quick come comment just, too. Yeah. I just also want to uh, double um, exclamation mark on um, Bonnie's comment in regards to the legislation moving forward at the state level. And thank you also Councilmember Brown for moving that forward. Really, staff. team, team, <laughs> team, team effort. But very important, and hopefully, fingers crossed. Okay, Councilmember Myers. Yeah, I just wanted to thank you for the uh, presentation. Um, one thing I would love to kind of understand more is we see the sales tax numbers from our businesses, but it's hard to know is that all Costco or is it? you know, the 300, 400 plus small businesses with nine, you know. So, I mean, putting your work in the context of how important your department is to actually creating a budget for the general fund um, and the things that um, we're gonna get into in the next couple weeks. Um, I think it's really important for, for all of us uh, as council members, but also for our community to understand that um, you're key to that success. And so I don't know how we translate that into a number, um, but I think um, you're instrumental in that and I'd love to see you um, kind of promote that part of, of your outcomes as well. 
Um, my family started a business downtown about two years ago. I think they're coming up on their third anniversary this summer. Uh, I know that they've really enjoyed advice from your department, and so I really think, you know, I know from personal experience that um, I think my sister-in-law would probably have hair my color if it wasn't for you guys. So um, I know that what you do to help people start businesses is very, very important. So. Um, uh, I just want to thank you for that. And then I had a question for Beth, actually. Um, way back in the day, um, 20 plus years ago now, when we wrote the San Lorenzo Urban River Plan, we hired a very famous public art person named Buster Simpson to also write a public art master plan for the Riverwalk. Yes. And I'm just curious if that has sort of uh, still stays on the shelf and sort of, you know, if, if we can look at that as a public space, um, maybe in our planning coming up and just curious where, where we're at with that. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I was given the like hard copy version of that when I started because it wasn't even an electronic version at that point. <laughs> um, actually, tomorrow we're having a cross a department meeting to talk about some state grants that we can apply for, and one would be for amenities along the Riverwalk, which would include um, public art. So, you know, fingers crossed that we'll have funding to be able to do something to enhance the Riverwalk in, in that regard. And yes, I have seen the plan, and there were a few good ideas in there. So we'll, we might we might resurrect a few. I have a giant steelhead that Buster made for me hanging in my backyard, I, I have <laughs> signed met, by him. And I, so. and I have also met Buster. He is very famous, yes. He's a character. <laughs> um, okay, great. Yeah, I'd love to see, hear more about that maybe, uh, you know, in the future. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Uh, Vice Mayor Cummings. Thank you for the presentation. And um, just a couple questions. Uh, one was, could you explain the Landlord Incentive Program a little bit further? Sure. So it's a... It's a program that is run by the Housing Authority, and um, I can actually forward to you the staff report that we brought forward, I think it was like probably a month, month and a half ago, about the amendment that we did to it. But basically, it's funding that's available. Um, we leverage um, the 22000 into the program so that they can provide an incentive. It's basically like an extra security deposit. It reduces the risk for landlords to really in incentivize them to accept Section 8 vouchers into the program. So um, it's just sort of like a, a risk mitigation fund in effect. And so it, it's, it's been really helpful. I have stats um, that I had when um, I came to council last time of how impactful the program is and what the success of the program is was just a little bit of, of leveraging and being able to influence positively landlords to both start in the program and accept Section 8 vouchers, but as well as, as to stay in the program because if they've had a bad experience, sometimes they leave the program. But this with this extra sort of fund that's available for security deposits and risk mitigation, they often will stay in even with one experience. Thank you. And then the other question um, with regards to business support, um, so if somebody was interested in starting their own small business, could they just come in and what, can you just like clarify what are some of the resources, like are there financial resources in addition to staff time? Sure. Uh, yeah, so um, businesses are welcome to contact me directly um, and I can walk them through all the steps of the process that might relate to their specific business. Um, I'll usually refer people to the planning department for their business license and zoning clearance. Um, if they need a building permit, I refer them there as well. Um, and then in terms of financing resources, we have a Grow Santa Cruz micro loan program that uh, we facilitate with a group called National Development Council. Um, and then the Small Business Development Center provides one-on-one uh, -on -one confidential uh, mentoring for uh, business structure, financing resources, marketing plans, um, and a variety of other things. So I've, I'd be happy to meet with them and just uh, compile a whole list together of the resources we have and get them pointed in the right direction. Great, thank you. All right, I don't, any further questions? Oh, just, um, so many small successes. I mean, there's the great big things, and then there's just the, the little small business things. And just uh, a point, and Donna asked about ta taxes, and some of what you do is tax generating, and some of it is job generating, and they're not always the same thing, but they're all important. Absolutely, <laughs> yeah. absolutely. And Rebecca, if someone just has a snag, can you be kind of a, a hand holder for them? Absolutely. I mean, 
Okay. I have yeah. someone. <laughs> I have a couple. Yeah. with the planning department. And I, <laughs> so uh, the planning department and I work really closely together. Um, I see my role as really being able to translate for people um, and I can spend a bit more time. Our planning staff is fully loaded and so I like to be able to provide um, extra time to be able to explain things to them. Um, sometimes it's just a miscommunication about what's happening um, and so I'm able to sort of clarify those two things and, yeah. and try to. Yeah, get them going forward. <laughs> and just a, a comment. I know you do the little, um, oh, the videos on the website, but I mean, just hearing your comments, the little, the few stories, it seems like there's so many opportunities for, for nice little case stories, letters to the editors, newspaper, this, that, and the other. Again, you know, broken record, but we don't tell our own story well enough, so. Something we're always working on. <laughs> I know, <laughs> but it's so rich with, <coughs> with material. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, before we conclude completely, I um, want to remember that this is also an opportunity for public comment. Was there any member of the community that wanted to speak to us on this presentation item of economic development? Okay. Seeing them, we'll go ahead and return it, and then we have one last question by Councilmember Meyer. I just think it's important for our community. Just, um, I just want to ask you. I know we talked about the downtown um, area and your work there, but uh, I'm assuming that you also provide support to sort of the outer west side manufacturing slash growing biotech slash crazy food and all kinds of cool things, as well as the Soquel uh, corridor as well. Yeah, the entire city. Okay. <laughs> Great, thank you very much. Okay, have a good night. And we'll go ahead and invite up our um, second presentation from planning. And we have Lee Butler here, our planning director, to present, and his colleague. Good evening, Mayor and Council Members. I am Lee Butler, I'm the Director of Planning and Community Development, and I'm very pleased to present our department update for you this evening. We've got a number of folks um, here with us that I'd like to introduce for you. You know, Alex Corey is our Assistant Director, and we have here Sarah Fleming, uh, manages our Advanced Planning Division, Laura Landry, manages our code enforcement and rental inspection. Sarah De Leon oversees our administration and Eric Marlat oversees our current planning. And I believe Mark Ellis is also gonna join us shortly. He oversees our building division and is our chief building official. So our department exists because we all want and deserve a safe built environment. We want buildings that stand up in earthquakes. We want electrical work that doesn't uh, shock people or start fires. We want a healthy indoor air quality. Um, we want concerns that we express about safety or hazards to be addressed. We all want and deserve an aesthetically pleasing um, built environment and um, a clean, healthy, natural environment. Uh, we all want and deserve access to the coast and to our parks and recreation areas. And we all want a bright future for our children and for all of the future generation um, here in Santa Cruz. And our department's job is to help make these things happen in coordination with many others here in the city. Our mission is to enhance the quality of life, safety, and civic pride for our community by providing land use and development guidance through responsive, respectful, and efficient public service. So this is something that really captures all of the five divisions in our department and the work that they do. We represent about 7% of the overall general fund, and um, most of our expenses go towards personnel. You can see that uh, we do have various other expenses, um, uh, typically consultants, but also uh, materials. We have a fair amount of publishing um, costs and um, printing costs with all the notices that we do for public hearings and so forth. Um, 
we have um, a, oops, in the, uh, there's a little bit of overlap there, sorry. Our fiscal year 2020 request is um, about 7.6 million. And uh, the majority of that is coming from building and safety with um, roughly equivalent um, components for the other divisions um, with um, the combined code and rental um, slightly less. Um, and then revenue, when you look at the overview there, um, that matches up. Most of our revenue comes in through building, but we also get um, revenue from current planning and advanced planning as well. Um, also through our rental inspection, and we've got a, a special green building fund, um, as well as some other smaller um, revenue sources. The revenue that we get from development supports not only planning and building as you would expect, um, but also other departments. So um, parks and recreation, public works, um, water. Um, these are actual breakdowns of fees and they're for the entire development process that these um, specific projects went through. So you can see that um, in residential projects, for example, there are significant um, percentages that go to parks and recreation to fund uh, new parks facilities. We serve a wide variety of customers, current and future residents, um, homeowners, renters, um, the development industry, architects, engineers, contractors, um, visitors, um, the able-bodied and those with um, disabilities. Um, we really have uh, everyone in mind when we are implementing policies or creating policies. We try to take a, a broad scope that um, looks at our entire community. Here is our organizational chart. We've got uh, the five divisions outlined um, or identified along the top there. And you can see the distribution of staff within each of those. And I'm gonna, uh, you can see 37 and a half full-time employees uh, throughout the department. And I'm gonna jump into what each of the, uh, the divisions does now. So in administration, they are typically the first point of contact for a customer. They get our customers to the right people. Um, if they don't know where they're going, they usually call our main line and then our, our, our administration staff helps them. They also um, support four hearing bodies, the zoning administrator, the planning commission, the historic preservation commission, and our uh, building Board of Appeals, and they do cashiering, not only for planning and building and code as you would expect, but also uh, they take in business license revenue and um, various other uh, taxes that we have um, in the city, um, such as, uh, and, and rental payments as well for city-owned facilities. They also help um, and really oversee a lot of our record management work. Um, so some of the stats for them, um, we implemented at the beginning of this calendar year, so from January 1st to um, through March of this year, our admin team answered almost 4,000 calls in those three months. Um, since the beginning of this fiscal year, they've digitized nearly 9,000 uh, files and responded to 323 pub public records requests. Um, those public records requests sometimes are very time consuming and we are, they're not cost recovery. So we oftentimes, I spent more hours than I would have liked to just recently on a public records request. And it wasn't just me when those requests come in, you know, our entire team ends up digging through emails, sorting through files, getting that information um, ready to, to go out. Um, and um, our team's mailed over 6,000 postcards um, just this uh, fiscal year. And um, they've staffed 96 public hearing items at the various commissions. Couple of things here, some before and after. Um, when, we're, uh, when we're imaging those records, they make them more accessible for us and for the public so we can cut down on some of those Public Records Act requests. It also builds in capacity in terms of space in our offices. So um, it is really important that we've got a, a dedicated team working at clearing out all those file cabinets and boxes that can readily pile up. 
Um, our admin team also helps to um, improve our website. And a couple of things that I wanted to point out for the council, um, the, in the uh, left image at the bottom right, we now have the ability for um, people to sign up for any community meetings that the planning department is holding. So um, previously, you, you may not even be notified by uh, about a community meeting, depending on where you're located. And if you wanna know about all of them, you can just easily sign up for eNotify and get on that uh, email list, as well as planning commission or zoning administrator and, and so forth. Um, we've also implemented on the right side um, substantial amounts of additional information on our website about projects that we have going on. So each of those significant projects up top, you can click on those and see the actual plan sets that we have that we're reviewing. So all of that information is available for the public. You can also comment right there on the website. So we are really facilitating public participation by someone going on there, they can check out the plans and they can add a comment in right there that'll get emailed to the project manager, making it really easy. There's also additional information for um, some of the other projects as you can see starting at the bottom there. Um, we're just really trying to expand the information that we have online. Um, code has done that as well with a flow chart that explains the process and um, various timelines associated with the different um, categories of, um, of complaints that come in. Um, so moving on to code. Um, code really protects the public health, safety, and quality of life of our residents, and they maintain and help to enhance the housing stock that we have in our community. When we're talking about the social equity efforts of our department. Code is really huge in protecting the most vulnerable members of our community. Um, the folks that can't necessarily speak up to their landlords because they are, are fearful about the um, potential repercussions. Um, our code team and rental inspection team goes into these places and make sure that they have the same quality of uh, health and safety standards being met in their housing. And I'd like to share just something, uh, some excerpts from a letter that we got just earlier this month and something that's not unique, but this individual thanked us for the professional handling and said that they were beside themselves with the concern for the living conditions with hot water heaters and um, heaters working off and on, mostly off, they say, during the last 10 years, yet the tenants were paying $2,000 a month to live there. And the person was afraid that the families would be turned out of the home. It's something that we've heard in many of the conversations we've had with the community. And they, they said, I'm so impressed with the fact that everyone's still there and that their privacy was respected. You respectfully inspected the units and interacted with tenants in a meaningful manner to secure their own safety in the home. You demonstrate a caring attitude, perseverance, at the same time managed to give tenants a personal dignity we all crave. And so that's really what our code team is out there doing, what our rental inspectors are out there doing is they're protecting our tenants and providing safe, habitable living environments for them. We did redact some information to protect identities here. Um, moving on to um, some of the stats for code compliance. Um, for these statistics, we are talking about um, eight months, so July 1st through the end of February, so two thirds of the year. They've uh, completed um, over 3,300 inspections, um, opened 411 code cases and closed 488. There are 126 accessory dwelling units um, either in process um, or complete for the legalization efforts. Um, there have uh, been six citations that have been issued. We have had to issue 16 orders to vacate and I want to specify that we, we don't take this lightly at all. This is only when there are very significant life safety issues that um, need to be addressed. There are gas leaks, for example, or very significant um, issues that uh, structural stability that are imminent threats. Um, 
So of those 16, um, 13 were either already vacant um, or they were owner occupied or the tenant was able to move to another place. So perhaps there was an illegal addition onto the back that was unsafe for occupancy. They could move into the main house, for example. There were three orders to vacate where the tenants actually had to relocate and it wasn't an owner occupant. Um, and, um, We've also completed four neighborhood cleanups. Um, those are the um, CDBG funded cleanups from the Lower Ocean and the um, uh, Beach Flats neighborhoods that um, we conduct and, and literally collect um, tons and tons of debris at each of those. Um, they're always welcome events in the community. Um, Again, with statistics from July 1st through the end of February, so eight months, um, uh, some of these are, are citywide, so uh, over 5,500 rental uh, parcels, over 1,100 rental units, and during that eight months um, for the rental inspection, we've conducted um, over 2,600 inspections. Um, during the course since 2011, there have been 300 units that have been identified that are unpermitted. We have about um, 450 units in the queue. I talked about the, um, the 20, 100 and, uh, 26 or so that we've got that we're working on, um, which I'll get to in a second. Um, but we have 30 that were legalized before the um, April 2017 implementation of a formal legalization program. And um, we have 126 of the units, um, of the 450 units. So roughly 27% are in process. Um, and you can see here that, that some of those those units, sometimes that does result in removal of those units from the market. Oftentimes, you know, there are costs associated with that. Sometimes there are, are zoning or general plan barriers to that. Um, and so um, a big chunk of those 15 units removed are um, either the costs associated with it or there are regulatory barriers. Um, and one of the directions that we have from the council is to evaluate those regulatory barriers and see how we can help to get more of those units online. Um, you can see we've legalized 18. Um, we've issued permits for 12 and plans submitted for 27. So a big chunk of those are making substantial progress towards the legalization. And we really seek to, to hold people's hands in this. Oftentimes, um, they're, um, they, maybe they purchased the property and it was existing there and they haven't done development before. So they, they haven't been through this process. So it is something that we really try to work closely with those. Um, homeowners on to try and legalize as many units as we possibly can. That is the objective. One, keep people in the units um, if they're not legal, as long as they're safe. And two, to then move them towards the legalization process. You can see here that we've got rental properties, registered rental properties spread throughout the city. And we have our 719 code cases spread throughout the city. And then um, some of the community-based code compliance, we mentioned the uh, community cleanups and the UCSC housing, UCSC housing fair here had uh, 500 plus students and um, we're out at neighborhood association meetings and uh, various other outreach efforts to get the word out. Moving on to current planning. Um, our current planning team reviews permits and projects to um, ensure consistency with the plans that the council has adopted, the general plan, the zoning ordinance, subdivision ordinances, as well as with uh, state requirements, the Coastal Act, um, federal laws and state laws and so forth. They administer the historic preservation program and they're often in front of either the planning commission or the council in presenting projects and consistency with those. Again, wide variety of customers for 
the current planning division. And these stats are projected for the current fiscal year based on the numbers that we have to date. We're expecting to serve 3,400 customers at the counter um, to complete 420 plan checks, 400 zoning clearances, 318 short-term rental applications. That I believe is the number that we have currently. Um, and so there may be some more that come in, but um, of course, when that program was implemented earlier this year, there was a, a, a big push. Um, and then uh, 200 discretionary applications and 22 projects reviewed under a new interdepartmental review meeting. And this has been a really nice improvement that everyone has seen a lot of value in. And that um, we're, when we have some more of the, when we have fairly significant projects, we bring all of the different reviewing parties into a, a a single discussion, and the applicants are sometimes present, they're welcome to attend. Um, what this does is it helps um, to iron out any um, discrepancies between different departments. So water department might say one thing, fire department might say another, and police might say another thing. And understanding those different perspectives and being able to, to deliver one voice of like, all right, well, let's figure out what the direction is from the city instead of from each department. That's part of the benefit of having these uh, interdepartmental meetings and um, the value has, has really been recognized um, both with the development community and with the um, uh, individual departments. Public outreach is a big part of the current planning division's work. Um, since the uh, recently adopted community outreach policy was put in place, there have been um, seven projects reviewed. Um, there are a few of them up here on the screen. Um, seven projects reviewed at um, community meetings held under that community outreach policy. So expanded notification ranges and um, information available on the website and invitations to people through throughout the community. Um, another big component of the um, current planning division is um, reviewing projects to increase the housing stock. Uh, you can see here, uh, all of these have significant housing components. And um, over the last fiscal year, there have been 250 multifamily units um, entitled through the current planning division. Um, and um, of course, a lot of others of single family and ADUs and so forth. Um, the current planning division also works um, closely with our advanced planning division um, and through their project review to uh, promote natural and cultural resource management. Um, one of the things that they put together in coordination with the Sierra Club and the Audubon um, uh, uh, constituents here is bird-friendly design measures, and you can see that in the fritting on the glass here. So new developments that come forward now, if they're adjacent to open spaces, will have conditions on them to to help protect birds. Um, there have been a number of projects with repair and restoration. Nearly all of our projects have some elements of greenhouse gas reduction and then through site design and the California Environmental Quality Act review. There's also natural and cultural resource management um, that occurs through our current planning team. Moving on to building and safety. <laughs> um, the building and safety division um, really um, seeks to ensure that we have a safe built environment for our, uh, for our residents and for our visitors. Um, when you look at the codes here, um, our, our building uh, official often says it's, it's legislation by disaster. And so um, every time there's an earthquake, every time there's a fire, um, they say, hey, let's do things better. Let's put into protection, let put, let's put in protections so that the next time there isn't so much property loss, so there isn't so much loss of life. And you can see that now going from, you know, a skinny book back in 1926 to a few volumes in 85 and now uh, several thousand pages of 
uh, codes that our building division implements. And so um, they review plans and inspect, inspect construction to ensure the minimum requirements of these codes are in place to safeguard public health, safety, and general welfare. Um, they look at structural strength, uh, means, of in, means of egress, stability, sanitation, light and ventilation, energy conservation, safety to life and property from fire and other hazards, and also um, safety for fire hazard for uh, first responders in emergencies, so that when they're going into buildings that uh, they are safe as well. Some of the uh, examples, um, obviously ADUs are a big one, making sure that ADUs are safe in the top left there and the bottom left, um, the electrical safety is a big one, earthquake resistant construction. Um, we've got the, in the middle top there are the shot creek panels. Those are actually test panels that were put in and we recently had two different construction projects uh, propose shot creek and they went out and um, put in these test panels and we did some special testing on that and for one of them, they were allowed to proceed. And the other one, they actually didn't pass the, uh, the correct strength uh, provisions. And so um, they didn't meet the requirements and they had to go back to pour it in place concrete. And so that's part of what we're doing out there in the field is we've got our inspectors out making sure that not only do the plans specify what needs to be done, but there are tests that are being done to ensure that the standards and the plans are being translated it out into the field. On the bottom there, we have underpinning that's that's shown. Um, also, shoring will occur when um, we're looking at protecting adjacent buildings during construction. This is at 1547 Pacific. Um, and then we, our building division reviews accessibility requirements. They also do emergency response. So you can see on the top, or the middle, the middle picture on the right there, a car uh, um, hit this structure and um, they come out and evaluate what portions of the structure are safe to occupy and which portions are not. And then when fires or other disasters occur, they come out and make sure that the structure that is remaining is safe or they say, all right, certain portions need to be taken down. There's uh, uh, direct um, inspections that occur to evaluate the structural stability and safety in those instances. Some of the numbers, um, these are um, the 2018 calendar year. So this is a full year, um, but it's the 2018 calendar year. So about 6,500 customers that we served at the counter, 10 and a half minute average wait time, and 90% served under 30 minutes. They completed 3,400 building permit and plan reviews, 1,900 permit applications, accepted 1,600 issued, 190 housing units permitted, and nearly 9,000 inspections. So it's a busy group out there. Uh, also, as part of our, um, our building division, we have our green building group, and um, you can see Kurt Hurley in the picture there invest, uh, inspecting some cooling units that's um, on the top of Costco. And um, this, uh, we, we have really strong green building standards in the state of California, uh, perhaps the strongest, definitely one of the strongest set of green building standards in the nation. And our green building code goes above and beyond that. And so um, we have, have always been leaders in this. Uh, we had green building standards in place before the state did, and it, it brings a wide variety of benefits, reduced um, energy and water use, um, and improved human health for occupants of buildings. And so we're really proud of the work that um, we do with our green building program. Moving on to advanced planning, um, they have brought um, so far this fiscal year seven significant ordinance or policy updates um, forward. Um, I'm sure you'll recall most, if not all of these, um, accessory dwelling units, relocation assistance for displaced tenants, the community outreach policy. Um, they put together the short-term rental licensing process um, following the short-term rentals to, to get those uh, permits together. Uh, two cannabis ordinance updates and then others that came to you earlier today. Um, parking standards have been updated. So lots of different updates from our, um, 
our advanced planning team. And I wanted to provide some um, snapshots of the um, the work plan so that you all understand you know, sort of the, um, the, the approach that we use. Um, this is a portion of the work plan for things that we've completed this fiscal year. And um, we keep track of all the pending items and completed items, and you can see um, some of them have, that have been just complete here. Some of the things like accessory dwelling units you won't see on here. We got through part of those, but we've also, um, it's still in the queue because we've got direction from council to come back and do some additional evaluations. Um, but we also have a number of things you can see down here with EFGHI, council direction. So every time we take council direction and every time there's uh, a uh, recommendation, it, it does, um, it, it competes with the other things that we have on our list. Um, so let's talk about that list a little bit. Um, in our general plan, there are 420 action items that um, are um, planning related and most of those, um, uh, the advanced planning team. And some of those are um, cross-referenced and they complement one another, but still, you know, if you're talking 300 or 350, um, that's still a lot of different recommendations. And you can see some of the, there's there's some really big ones. There are 10 plan updates, the Seabright Area Plan, the LCP updates. We've been working on updating our local coastal plan, uh, our local coastal program. We still have, um, we're using the local coastal program from our old general plan. And so we've been looking at updating that and we've been working for about about two years, two plus years with um, consultants to get that done. Um, and we're really trying to, to um, uh, to get that over the finish line, but there are competing priorities. And so um, that's something that we're, we're really trying to prioritize and get over the hump, particularly because um, as we keep reviewing it, new things come along and and so uh, we're having to go back. <laughs> as you can imagine, things that were done two years ago, even in the realm of sea level rise and climate change, we need to continue updating those things. Um, and then the beach south of Laurel plan is another. We've got 10 new plans called for in the general plan and um, 16 zoning ordinance updates called for in the general plan, plus nine additional ones that we've identified um, that are on our list. So a lot of different things just in the general plan. We also have um, about 70% of the recommendations from the Housing Blueprint Subcommittee that came from council, about 70% of those or 28 or so are in our advanced planning division. And um, many, of those are uh, um, things that are uh, that have been done or that are underway, but there are also some really significant ones that we still need to work on that can really make a difference in producing housing or protecting housing in our community. So some of those uh, are listed here, the Ocean Street rezoning, the Enhanced State Density Bonus Ordinance, which is something that could really promote additional affordable housing, something that the county's done and something that we would like to implement to promote additional affordable housing. Um, parking ordinance updates, um, legalization of unpermitted dwelling units, which dovetails with the legalization program, um, additional ADU direction that we've gotten from the council, um, and then encouraging a variety of housing types. Um, so all of those things are still in the pipeline and still direction um, and some of the priority items that we still need to uh, continue to work on. Um, these, this is just a sample of the um, things that we have for this fiscal year and how we track those. Um, and um, so all of these things are um, things that we have intended to work on, but we're, we don't always get to work on those because other priorities do come up. And so it's, it's constantly shifting. Um, another set of things, and you can see the prior was sort of fiscal year 19 and then fiscal year 20, and some of those things will be shifting to fiscal year 2020. Um, moving on to um, sort of department-wide, those are, those are many of the things, the future efforts from the advanced planning division. Moving on to department-wide, um, we continually, uh, customer service is a real focus of our department, and you can see the picture here is the work in progress for our new customer service, our new um, public counter, and that'll allow us to um, help more customers. It's gonna provide a substantial amount of additional um, counter space. And so that 
that'll be a, a great enhancement for the customer experience and um, help us um, bring people out and not bring them back into our offices to help them, which we, we sometimes do now when we've got uh, backups. Um, automation and website capabilities, we're trying to continue to expand. Online and electronic plan submittal we're gonna be working on and we have been working on and then the early communication with the community consistent with the council's outreach policy. Um, we wanna maintain our established turnaround times. We've got a whole series of, um, of metrics that we look at. So in planning, we've got state mandated 30 day response times. In building, we have for certain projects, a, a 10 working day response time or a 15 day working day response time. And so we've got all these standards to provide consistency and to provide a, um, a clear understanding with the development community and the general public of when we'll have responses to things. Um, yeah, I'm just going to interrupt you for one sure. second. I um, apologize because I don't think maybe you were in the room, but there was a, a kind of a, a interest in having our uh, keep going. Okay, I just want to double check. Yeah. We yeah. talked about having uh, this sort of at ten o'clock. Ten yes. o'clock. But we're, as we're approaching it, I and this don't is the cut the short. last slide. Oh, you're kidding! I'm so <laughs> no. <laughs> so almost there. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> uh, turnaround times, uh, we want to make sure we're, we're still meeting providing that service for our customers. And then um, code updates, you talked about, we talked about the advanced planning. We also, this year, every three years, there's a new building code cycle. And so the 2019 code adoptions will be coming to you later this year. And so um, with that, um, I am happy to entertain any questions. And I would just like to say that I am really, really proud of the great work that our team does. I mean, the folks in the audience here work tirelessly and really have um, worked not just this year, but every year in trying to promote the best interests of the overall community. So I wanna thank them for the efforts that they put in day in, day out. Yeah, thank, thank you for that. And I apologize for cutting you off That's right okay. before your last slide. <laughs> I just wanted to ensure that I was following the council consensus. I appreciate your passion, and that's one of the best things I think about these presentations. We have really the right people in the positions who know the work, really care deeply about the work. I know that is also the sentiment of your team. Um, I appreciate your whole team being here to um, uh, help us understand what you all do every day. And I know a lot ends up in your um, department in terms of the direction that the council Council has and just a lot of big issues. So thank you um, for all the work that you do for our city and for our council. We'll go ahead and see if there's council member questions. Council member Brown. I know we said 10 o'clock, no, but if yeah, we could indulge for just to give okay. an opportunity yeah. while staff is here and you, you came and you waited and you stayed, um, you know, I just want to um, say thank you for uh, the presentation. Thanks for all the work you do um, on the slide uh, where you mentioned the seven as an accomplishment, seven policy updates. I would just add, uh, you could add exhibited su supreme, as an accomplishment, exhibited supreme patience with respect to um, delayed consideration of agenda items <laughs> um, due to time constraints and um, also some mixed messages from the council with respect to um, policy direction and priorities. So um, thank you for bearing with us. We really do appreciate it. Um, and I do have a question which can be answered later, but I just, um, it, came, it occurred to me earlier in this morning in a, a meeting with constituents. Um, I would like to get a, a sense, and it doesn't have to be now, but an understanding of the, with respect to like those 300 um, uh, unpermitted units that were discovered, how that happens. I mean, I'm sure it happens in many different ways, but you know, if maybe like, we can email with each other, I can call you. And I'd, I'd like to understand that better and not take up too much time tonight. No, it's fine. I think we, we're, yeah. folks are fine with it. If you if you feel comfortable, I'll answer the question. Sure. I, so so it happens in a variety of ways. And um, I can I can invite up our, our um, code compliance uh, manager to, to speak to it in more detail. But essentially, um, you know, we'll go out and sometimes there are complaints. Um, sometimes um, there, uh, you know, we, had, we had several units recently recently a uh uh, individual complained because there was a, a leak in their roof and the landlord wouldn't fix it and the ceiling actually collapsed and we went out there and there's an extension cord running to a shed and there was somebody living in the shed with no power other than the extension cord and a, a portable toilet that had been put outside. Uh, or excuse me, it was a, a compost toilet that had been put outside. Um, and so we found several units through that, um, through the complaint process. Other times it's, 
we go out for an inspection and um, there are areas of the property that have been converted and we look at it and we say, all right, you know, this meets health and safety standards, you can stay here, but we aren't, we're only showing one unit here and you've got three. And so um, we put them into the queue and, and like I said, uh, the 300 units was just from the rental inspection. So there are 300 from the rental inspection. So that means there are about 160 that have been identified um, through complaints or um, through other code efforts. Anything you'd like to add, Laura? All right. <laughs> Any other questions from council members at this time? Councilmember Matthews. I, Sarah, the current schedule for the counter, I'll invite, Sarah, Sarah's helping coordinate the efforts with Public Works and um, our buildings team, so. I've Sarah. ignored a slew of emails from them today about the update, be preparing for this, but we've been looking at hopefully July, August, basically next fiscal year to open the counter. I have a lot of moving parts with staff moving and making sure they're set up properly before we start taking payments and plans in. So fingers crossed for next fiscal year early. Yeah. It's a big customer service improvement though. Absolutely, it will be a big enhancement um, to the cramped quarters that we currently have. That's great. Vice Mayor Cummings. Sorry to mentioning that you all are shifting over to like automated form submissions. How, like where are you, where are you all at with that process? I mean like in terms of the amount of um, paperwork that people usually have to do for different planning purposes and submissions, like I guess just, just out of curiosity, if that's like in the initial stages or are you kind of farther along? We are, I would say, um, in the middle stages of that. Um, we um, are testing a, a program that we've purchased called Bluebeam, and really we need to um, integrate that into our procedure flow. Um, it obviously has lots of benefits. It saves money because you're not having to print plans and obviously is greener because um, you're not printing all that stuff, but also it's more convenient. You know, People can submit those at any time and they don't have to bring plans down when the counter's open um, and they don't have the GH associated with driving all those down. So um, there are many benefits. Um, right now we're looking at rolling out some of the smaller ones. So looking at sort of the simple ones and testing those for uh, to learn um, with the bigger projects. So whether that's um, solar installations or water heaters, um, some of the easy things, let's test it with those. And so we've got uh, some procedures outlined and our next step will be rolling out those tests um, um, with the small project so that we can learn from that and then um, incorporate those changes and those learning experiences before we start bringing in you know, the, some of the plan sets that our building division has, hundreds of sheets and require, you know, five different departments to review and eight different divisions. And so like, let's start small and work out the kinks. So that's where we're at with that right now. And um, we hopefully in, um, you know, within a short time frame, months, um, we'll have those first uh, sets rolled out. Yeah, I just wanted to thank you for the, and for everybody to be here so late tonight, so thank you. Um, I think uh, it was great to, I'm glad you gave us such a kind of global look at the department. I think sometimes we think of the planning department as the, the department that's all about just development and debating the merits of, of development. And I think um, your comment at the opening, which is, you know, really about health, you know, health, public health and safety in, in, in both homes as well as public, you know, facilities, offices, all of that is such an um, kind of underappreciated thing that planners do. So I appreciated that. And I think also just, uh, you know, your view in terms of the green, pushing people to think about green building and looking at those kinds of opportunities. So I think um, just the global look at the department that you gave us was very helpful to me. And um, you guys do a lot of work with a small amount of money and not very many people. And so just want to appreciate uh, the way that you presented it. I learned a lot. Thanks. I just have one um, quick question and then a, an acknowledgement. Um, one is in regards to, and you referenced it in your presentation, around the um, Housing Blueprint Subcommittee recommendations and a lot of work to be done. But if I heard you correctly, a lot of that is sort of on pause. Does that seem accurate? Some of that is on pause. Um, 
we're trying to move forward with those uh, as expeditiously as possible. Um, we have certainly had um, things come up that have pushed things back. So I don't necessarily want to say everything's on pause, but um, we have pushed back the timelines. You know, for some of those things, um, the ADU, uh, the additional ADU things um, uh, that the council's directed, the um, rezoning of Ocean Street was one of the things that we had hoped to get done early this year. And, and as we were um, addressing some of the priorities of the um, council as they um, as, as the new council was seated you know some of those things got pushed back because some of those work items um, came to our advanced planning division and so um, we have um, pushed some of those back and um, we'll we'll also be adjusting you know as the council sets their um, priorities we will be responding to that accordingly and adjusting our work plan so we're looking forward to that we, we've got tons that we can be doing, but we also want to make sure that we're aligning with the vision that the council has and the priorities that the council has. And uh, So it's it's a balancing act because some of those things like the LCP updates we've had underway for several years. And so you know, we really want to keep pushing on those. Um, but others, um, we haven't started. We're, we're planning to start, but if the council provides direction on those priorities, then it, it may slide some of those things further back. Thank you. I think it would be beneficial for us or the new council to understand some of the work around the housing blueprint subcommittee and the three sort of pillars of that being um, housing production, protection, and community vitality. Um, I will just add that I also appreciated the preface. I definitely sensed uh, health and all policies in there, and, and Lee and I had a chance to actually present um, together at a class at UCSC recently in terms of his role and then the role of health and all policies as they intersect. But then also just quickly want to give a uh, shout out to your team for the recognition you've been receiving. I know it was in the city manager's report in regards to your innovative work around the housing blueprint subcommittee, and you can say a little bit about what that has been um, and how you've been recognized and sure. the presentation that you just did. Thank you for raising that. Um, and I, I can't say that that is, is just our team because that was really a citywide effort and a council-led um, effort that really prioritized housing in the community. And so a couple of things. Um, one, um, two weekends ago, we presented at the National American Planning Association Conference on the um, work that we did around um, homelessness and around, um, that was the, uh, the 20 point um, work program that was developed for homelessness as well as the housing voices report that developed 99 recommendations and then the prioritization exercise that um, that uh, came out of the housing blueprint subcommittee um, so we presented it on the national stage there we also just were informed within the last week that we received a um, northern section of the American Planning Association um, award of excellence for the um, the Housing Blueprint Subcommittee and Housing Voices Outreach Effort. And so um, that was uh, that was really an uh, effort that our entire city undertook, you know, with people from various departments and um, with the mayor at the time, Cynthia Chase, uh, went out and did, you know, many, many hours of outreach, and that culminated in uh, the set of 99 different recommendations. And I mentioned that in the presentation that, you know, there are still a lot of really good ideas in that housing blueprint, uh, or excuse me, in the housing voices report um, that we still haven't implemented, not because they're not great ideas, but because there were so many great ideas that when we went through the prioritization and Councilmember Brown and, and Mayor Watkins, you were a part of that effort. And so thank you, you know, you're both to be committed for. Um, the, the work and uh, for the awards that we got, you're a big part of that as well. And we still have a lot, not only from the Housing Blueprint Subcommittee recommendations, but great ideas from the Housing Voices Report as well that just didn't rise to the top because there were so many suggestions that our community, that was entirely community generated. And that was one of the things that was um, stressed as part of our presentation and um, one of the things that helped us achieve that recent award. So we'll be, uh, hopefully, um, we'll be applying for and uh, may get recognition at the state level as well um, for that effort. Thank you. And um, any, unless there's not any well, for the- Just yeah. um, when we go into our priority session soon, mm -hmm. do we have a date for it? Um, I'm looking to Martine Bernal. We're working well, on the contract. In any event, it'll happen. I, I don't know but exactly. I, I think for all, it's true for all our departments, but keep reminding us of 
the demands on staff to achieve something. I mean, um, just going to um, more digitized processes. It's one thing because I've, you know, I've been around this block a few times. I, Ten years ago, we got to we got to digitize our, our processes. You know, it should all be online. That's really easy to say and really hard to actually do. And so we do have all these great ideas, and we tend to get latch on to the <coughs> latest shiny objects. So when we come to our strategy sessions, bring us down to earth. I mean, my intuition is that an uh, uh, update of the local coastal plan is probably really important. I don't know. I'm just guessing. But um, they're <laughs> yes, <laughs> and, um, you know, to a certain extent, I would welcome some professional advice on which things are really really important that we tackle. And I'll just sort of remind the council that there's sort of going to be two paths f moving forward. One sort of just the upcoming council work plan for the next several months, but also a larger sort of um, process to ensue that is engaging with the community, is engaging um, for a, a three-year strategic plan work plan. So there'll be two opportunities to kind of have um, some outlines for strategy moving forward. Okay. Okay, so um, that concludes the presentation. Uh, we do have, sorry, I almost forgot, public comment. Was there any member of the community that wanted to comment? Please, okay, you have up to two minutes. Yes, please. Um, as a member, oh, by the way, uh, I was a building inspector with the county for 18 years, so I kind of have a feel for what all you all do and appreciation for it, so thank you very much. Um, I live in, a, uh, in the Circles neighborhood. We've got a, a, a project uh, proposed there um, that was significant enough that there was an outreach, um, public outreach meeting, and it was generally considered to be of not very successful. And um, and so uh, I'm, get a, I'm organizing in the neighborhood. I'm getting a lot of uh, questions about where's the process, where are we in the process? And even though with my experience, I'm finding it's very difficult to get answers for my people. And um, I go online and it's represented, um, but it's only a plot plan. This is a project that we feel is going to have significant visual impacts and density impacts and all kinds of impacts. So can you tell me how to get that information so that I can relay it to the people in my neighborhood? It's my understanding that this is uh, supposed to be, um, you know, public, available to the public for that. So in one, 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 error at circle. Just down. We'll go ahead and pause the time really quick. We'll go ahead and have you finish your comments for it, and then we'll that, we'll that take that is, in, and that then we, have, we have one more. We have yeah. one more. I mean, before we close and respond, we'll have one more public comment, I believe. Okay, we can. Did you have additional comments? You, you still I, had the time. No, that uh, that was it. I um, it was really a question about how can I access inf this information bef because I find the stuff that's online is just a plot plan that's been up for two months, I think now or a month and a half anyway, and I need more information from my people. Thank you. Um, we'll go ahead and have uh, our next member of the community uh, um, up to two minutes, and then we'll return back, and if our staff wants to respond, we can do that. Um, we had the discussion of cannabis earlier this evening. I just uh, <clears throat> had some more thoughts of just stuff. Go ahead and pause this. This is um, if you had any comments related On to this, this item. Yes. Oh, um, I was like, public comment again? Okay. My mistake. No problem. <laughs> okay, so we'll go ahead and close public comment at this point. I saw that you, uh, Lee, was interested in sharing some of the online tools in response to uh, the member of the community who's here tonight. Do you want to do you want to briefly address those or sure. potentially reach out also after? I would just say, uh, you know, reach out to the project manager. But I'm happy to talk with you after the project manager is listed here, and we can also our uh, our current planning manager is um, present as well, so we can um, give you the latest on that. And it seems that you have this online tool for community members who might also be tracking projects that you found on our website. Is that correct? 
That's correct. So this um, this has some basic information, and we're always looking to update that. Um, sounds like you know we uh, have a desire from the community to uh, provide some additional information. We can look at getting uh, this particular project with uh, additional info online. Just use that, not the arid circle. That one, the Ocean Street one. It's incredible. That's a yeah. great tool. Yeah, so this is a way for us to track all kinds of uh, big projects that are underway at this time. So it's a good idea for, no, we actually closed public comment, but if you have interest in speaking with our staff, it looks like they're available after. Yeah, this is a great tool. Yes, so plan sets uh, for certain projects, and then this is the online uh, comment submittal. Okay. Great. Thank you. Thank you. So unless there's any additional questions. Not on this item. Not on this item. Okay, we'll go ahead and adjourn this. No, we're going ahead and closing this item, okay. but we're not adjourning the meeting. No, so in the cluster of the afternoon, we skipped right over the calendar. Okay. Um, is there any calendar updates at this time? Possibly. Okay. The closed session that was for April 30th. Which we um, haven't, ha have you heard back from council members in availability? I'm not sure if I'm available that day. I think if I hear I can call in. I'm driving back from Sacramento. Okay. Yeah. Okay. okay. We'll talk about that <laughs> okay. okay. We'll have to, we'll have to schedule that too. And we're scheduling the uh, priority setting session too. Oh, good. In okay. May. In Great. As well. Okay. It looks like we'll have some additional meeting time then. Woohoo. My 22 point program. <laughs> and on that note, we're going to go ahead and adjourn the meeting. Thank you. I'm going to give that one a...